Giuliani. You want to reset, though, as to exactly where we are right now. We're starting this morning. It's 7 o'clock, and normally we'd be signing on the air with Good Morning America, but ABC News has not left the air for the past 22 hours now since the occurrences began yesterday morning at the World Trade Center towers. There are still fires burning at the Pentagon. John McCarthy talking about the fact those fire is so difficult because that is an old building with a wooden structure in, in, in many areas. And this is the scene in downtown New York, the site of the two dropped World Trade Center towers, number seven World Trade Center, also down. And you get some sense, this is at a distance, but you get some sense of just what an incredible pile of rubble it is, five stories high. And you still see policemen standing there at the intersections with masks over their face. This is the scene overnight as equipment was brought in, fires still burning on that site overnight. And we will hope to hear from the mayor how many people were retrieved, how many bodies, and what about all these reports that there were people phoning out through the night. Mayor Rudolph Giuliani of New York is joining us this morning. Mr. Mayor, I, I know this has been an unbelievable past 22 hours for you, and I appreciate Thank you. Uh, your being with us. What, First of all, what can you tell us about what's going on down at the scene right now? I can tell you that all through the night, uh, there were over a thousand people, at some points two thousand people, working on the rescue effort, trying to move a lot of the large uh, parts of buildings and other debris that are there out of the way, trying to rescue people. Uh, we were successful in rescuing uh, two, two people, and there's a third one that uh, we're in contact with. Hopefully there are others that... It, uh, near him that we're, that we're trying to get out, but at least one person that we're in contact with. And uh, we, we now have, uh, we have 41 fatalities at this point that we, that we know of. Uh, and the, re the reality is that we have, looks like about 202 firefighters that are still missing. And uh, police officers, both New York City and Port Authority police officers of the uh, uniform personnel, we probably have about 260 people that, we're, that, that are unaccounted for, that, that, uh, that we're searching for. And of course, we don't know what the death toll will be uh, with regard to the actual, uh, the actual building. Uh, but 200, could, 202 firefighters, you say, and 200, I mean, those numbers just two, two, kill two, your heart. 259 uniform service members, which would be made up of the New York City Fire wow. Department, the New York City Police Department, and the Port Authority Police Department. The uh, two people that we rescued uh, late last night or early in the morning were, um, with, were two um, Port Authority police officers. So I, I just want to get that straight. You say 259 uniformed people overall, 202 firefighters, did you say? Correct. That would leave 57 uh, police, police or police, Port Authority? Police officers and Port Authority police officers. Oh, and, then, and, the, and then, of course, we're, um, we're talking about uh, the possibility of... Uh, you know, thousands of people. We don't know. We don't know the numbers yet, with, with regard to whoever was unlucky enough, uh, unfortunate enough to have been left in the building when, when the two buildings collapsed. Can you give me some sense of just the magnanimity of this task? No, uh, the magnanimity of the task is uh, uh, weeks and weeks of uh, of cleanup, which we have to take a day at a time, and we will. You've got you've got a, essentially a, a five or story or higher pile of rubble where each of those buildings were, right? Correct, and then, and then uh, smaller ones uh, for the other buildings and the other damage that was done. Other, other buildings came down, other buildings were hit and, da and damaged. So uh, we, we're going to have to take this a day, a day at a time. And I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll work our way out of this. And the city is going to come out of this stronger and more determined than it ever was before. But you know, we have to understand that we're all going to have very difficult emotions about this and very difficult feelings about it. Uh, we worked late into the night organizing the effort for today and tomorrow, and we have tremendous amount of assistance. We actually have more volunteers than we need right now, which is really wonderful. I, I, when I was there... Mr. Mayor, it's Diane Sawyer. Yeah, Diane. I just wanted to ask, you mentioned that two had been rescued. You were in contact with a third. Can you tell us how you're in contact with that third person? Uh, we're in voice contact with him. The uh, fire and police... Uh, rescue team is able to talk to him. He's uh, trapped right now. And uh, they're you know, trying to rescue him, trying to get him out. They're, they're, ab they're able to, to talk to him. You had mentioned before that there had been calls, some cell phone calls. Uh, any other calls? There are, there, yes, there are others. Uh, 
there, 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 there are other reports of calls, and part of, part of the uh, part of the difficulty is making sure you put them all together, and you're not talking about the same ones. So they're in, you know, they're in different parts of the area, uh, hoping that they're they're in contact with people. There's, there's, there's only one that I know of that's an actual ongoing uh, rescue effort right now. I'm curious as to how that person could have survived. Any sense of me? Is he in some sort of pocket or? or yeah. That, the. the uh, Yesterday, I, I visited this firefighter at uh, St. Vincent's Hospital, whose entire company was saved because they were in a void. And they were in the void for five hours, and uh, their colleagues are missing, and they believe their colleagues may be dead. But uh, this group of uh, six or seven firefighters were in a void, and therefore they were protected. And when they finally were extricated, they were shocked to find that the whole building had come down because they had been in this protected void. They heard the explosion, they heard everything else, but everything just fell around them. So we're hopeful that there are going to be other situations like this in this mass uh, building, coll building collapses, that there'll be areas where there were protected pockets. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you mentioned the 41 fatalities that you know about at this point, and we know this is, this is just the beginning, but yep. I wonder if you can give us any sense of how many people were reported missing overnight, any sense of that magnitude. Uh, no, I don't, I don't have the civilian numbers in terms of reported missing. I don't know, I don't know how many. I, I would just be guessing at that number. We, I know we had uh, 1,700 injuries that we know of, of people that we took to the hospital or people that we, where, we ha where we accounted for their injuries, anywhere from very serious to, uh, to minor injuries. So that I means 1,700 injuries. A couple of other from reports. One incident is, is horrendous, obviously. Sure. sure. Uh, a couple of other reports I wanted to ask you about. One report that ferries were ferrying bodies across the river and across the Hudson River as often as 10 minutes into the night. Uh, you, you mean, you mean de uh, are you talking about dead bodies? That's no. right. Uh, I don't know of that report. The, the, de the dead are being taken to the medical examiner's office? Yes. They're all, they're, right now, the procedure is that they're all being taken to the medical examiner's office. Uh, uh, medical examiner Hirsch is... Um, uh, confident that he can handle uh, at least the original numbers. We have, a, we have another site in the Bronx and then another site in Manhattan, but uh, right now, uh, as I said, there's, there's only 41 that, we've, that we can account, account for. Mr. Mayor, let me ask you about the conditions of the city of New York. Uh, last night we heard that, that everything essentially is south of 14th Street, and for those people around the country who don't know New York very well. That's an enormous amount of, uh, of real estate territory. A lot of neighborhoods. Sure, that, that, that area is the um, that area is the third largest business district uh, in the country. Uh, Midtown Manhattan is the largest. Chicago and then the Lower Manhattan is the third largest business district in the United States. So that gives you a sense of the the scope of it. The scope of it is uh, it's a very very big area and probably the financial capital of the world. And that is, that is going to be closed down to all but emergency vehicles for how long? That's going to be closed down all day today. I, we're not going to make a decision until uh, probably this afternoon, about tomorrow. Uh, again, because we want to take this a day at a time. But the core area where the cleanup is being done, I mean, y you're talking in terms of days and weeks that it's going to take to, uh, to clean that up. Right. And we want to do it carefully. There's also the consideration that it's a crime scene. So we want, we want to work under the direction of the police and the FBI to make sure that we retain the evidence that they're going to need to figure out uh, you know, what happened and uh, hopefully be able to bring people to justice for this. And the question about the heightened security in New York, Mr. Mayor, we have reports this morning that the aircraft carrier USS George Washington is now in position off the coast of the city. We also have reports that NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command, has gone on alert and activated F-15, F-16 fighter planes flying combat air patrol over New York. And AWACS planes are now currently up in the air. Just asking you, are there any signs, any warnings that there could be more, that there might be something today? Uh, I checked as of 15 minutes ago and there are no specific threats of any kind. There is general concern, as there should be, and I uh, appreciate very, very much the personal uh, concern of the President of the United States, the United States Navy, all of whom called us yesterday and talked to us. And they're taking special precautions because of what happened yesterday. But there is no specific piece of information. Uh, but I, the people of the city of New York very much appreciate that. Obviously, 
as they wake up this morning, uh, they're going to be confronting uh, an attack on New York and on the United States in dimensions that we've never experienced before in our history. And uh, the assistance and the help and the security that that offers to the people of the city, I, I think, are very important, if for no other reason uh, but psychological. Mr. Mayor, I, I know that you get focused on what do I have to do next and each incremental step and what decision needs to <laughs> right. be made. But, but to talk to you a little bit about the macro of all of this, the overall situation, there is no more visible symbol of New York than the World Trade Center. It has dominated the skyline of this city for more than 30 years. And you plan for these things, and there's all sorts of horrible scenarios that you have to think about. But, but what was your gut yesterday? Oh, my, uh, the, the feelings that I had yesterday, I think I'll, uh, I'll be thinking about for the rest of my life. Uh, I lost some very, very good friends, people that I know very, very well, personal friends, and talked to some of them just a few minutes before they died. Uh, so you've got to put those feelings as much in the background as possible and focus on the, the effort that we, have, that we have ahead of us. And, uh, and I agree with you, the World Trade Center is, was one of the great visible symbols of New York, but the real, real symbol of New York is the spirit of its people. These are the, uh, we're the most diverse people in the world. Uh, we're, we're very, very strong people. We are very proud Americans, and uh, New Yorkers are going to give an example to the people who attacked us of how uh, people who love democracy react to something like this. We're going to be stronger as a result of having gone through this. But you were, you were talking to some friends in that building who I suspect knew they were going to No, die. no, I talk, I, uh, right before the collapse, I talked to several of the, of the high command of the fire department. Fire department sure. That, uh, and and a, uh, a Roman Catholic pri priest, Father Michael Judge, who's a chaplain for the fire department, who I've known for many years. And uh, we, we were moving our command center to uh, 75 Barclay Street, and they were remaining at, at, uh, mm. at West Street in order to have a view of the uh, rescue effort. So I said goodbye to them. I wished them luck and mm. uh, asked Father Judge to pray for us, which I often did. And then a few minutes later, we're notified that uh, that the that part of the building collapse had had fallen in their area. So I mean, we've lost. We all, I think all New Yorkers are going to experience what uh, I and the fire commissioner and the police commissioner experienced yesterday. That we've lost people that are close friends. Uh, the, the numbers here are so great. We have to feel that. We have to understand we're going to feel it, and then we have to focus on how we clean up this this. Uh, horrible debris, which we're going to do. We're, and we're going to, hopefully, I'm very hopeful we're going to find more people. We're going to rescue some more people, and we're going to keep at it until, until we're sure of that. Mr. Mayor, I can't thank you enough for joining us. Thank morning. you very much, and, th and thank you for the coverage. It was enormously helpful yesterday. A lot of people used the television coverage as a way of figuring out how to get out of there, and you were enormously helpful to many of our citizens, and I thank you very much. Well, we thank you for being with us. I appreciate it. Thanks. Let us turn right now because we have with us live Secretary of State Colin Powell. And Mr. Secretary, we're so grateful to you for joining us this morning. I'm going to start right in on a news report if I can. There is a report that American embassies around the world are being asked to shut down. Is this true? We have uh, given discretion to all of our ambassadors to uh, close down or temporarily suspend operations based on their judgment of the threat level. 25% of our embassies uh, overseas are currently shut down or have suspended operations, but there are no direct threats yet to any of those embassies. It's precautionary in nature, and I expect they will all be resuming operations as soon as possible. Let me also uh, express my deepest sadness and my condolences to the families of those who lost their lives, and once again reinforce the determination of the United States government to respond with all the forces at its disposal, as the President said last night. And we're hard at work at that already on the diplomatic front here in the State Department this morning. Do you have signals that there is more to come today? I have no signals that there is more to come today, but one never knows. But so far, nothing to suggest that uh, there is something waiting to happen today, and let's hope that is the case. Mr. Secretary, did we miss any signals in the last couple of weeks, or were there simply no signals? In the first uh, you know, 24 hours of analysis, uh, I have not seen any evidence that there was a specific signal that we missed. 
there is always a general level of concern about terrorist activity, and there are always warnings that are out there, but uh, they are seldom specific enough to be actionable. Uh, many times they, uh, they, they do happen to be actionable, and a lot of terrorist incidents have been stopped because we did get intelligence. In this case, uh, we did not have intelligence of anything of this scope or magnitude. And so America has uh, suffered a terrible loss, but what has not been lost is our spirit, our resiliency as a society. They have failed in that. You as the president said last night, we will go after them, and what we will especially do is go after those nations, those states, those organizations that provide haven for this kind of activity. And we will not let up. And we'll make sure that all of our friends and allies and those who would be our friends who have anything to do with harboring this kind of activity will discover that they cannot have a friendly relationship with the United States if they continue to do so. But Mr. Secretary, do you share the sense that so many do that this was so sophisticated, so well planned, that it had to have taken years? I wouldn't say it had to take years, but it certainly took an extended period of time. It was a very sophisticated, well-planned, well-coordinated attack, uh, showing that it just wasn't done by uh, your average uh, a car bomber, but a very sophisticated organization. And the evidence will accumulate in the course of the next several days, which will, I think, uh, point us in the right direction as to who is responsible responsible for it. But we know there is so much anger welling up in the country right now. I've got the Daily News here, the New York Daily News, which has a headline, It's War. First of all, is it war as you see it? And if it's Osama bin Laden, what is going to work against him? Well, American people uh, have a clear understanding that this is a war. That's the way they see it. You can't see it any other way, whether legally that is correct or not. You do too. And we, yes, I do. And we've got to respond as if it is a war. And we've got to respond uh, in the sense that it isn't going to be solved with a single counterattack against one individual. It's going to be a long-term conflict, and it's going to be fought on many fronts. The military front, the intelligence front, the law enforcement front, the diplomatic front. And it's a war not just against the United States. It's a war against civilization. It's a war against all nations that believe in democracy. But democracy can't be defeated. But now it's going to require all nations who believe in democracy to come out and condemn this kind of activity, to work together to go after those who perpetrate such activity. And it requires that kind of coordinated, complete response on behalf of the civilized communities of the world. But, Mr. Mr. Secretary, so many equations have been made to Pearl Harbor in all of this. It may well be, could well be, that we wind up with a death toll from this higher even than occurred at Pearl Harbor. These were civilians, unsuspecting civilians, uh, that were hit in, uh, in what they thought would be a secure place. And you wonder, you're very judicious about the commitment of American forces, but you, you wonder just in terms of planning what's going on and in terms of thinking what's going on and what is when we find out who did this, a kind of appropriate military response? Well, first we have to find out who did it. And the response may have many dimensions. It may be military, and I certainly hope we can find people that are targetable and we can take action directly against them. Uh, but we shouldn't just wait for a single target and then go after it militarily. There are many other things we can be doing to root out these networks, to pull up these places of haven, to destroy training camps, and it's going to take a concerted, long-term effort. Mr. Secretary, there are reports, this is George Stephanopoulos, reports from Afghanistan this morning that UN officials are being evacuated and also diplomats from Australia, the United States, and Germany. Has the United States recommended that evacuation? Uh, George, I need to check on that. I hadn't received those reports at the time I came down here, but that would seem to be a uh, prudent action. One other thing, Mr. Secretary, do we have any idea what happened in Kabul last night? Uh, not entirely, but does not appear to be related to uh, what happened in uh, New York and Washington. It seems to be a separate, a separate incident that relates to other activities not uh, directly related to this attack. That may have been occasioned by what happened in New York? Was it some sort of a rebel group uh, going after the Taliban? Do we know anything? That, that seems to be the case, but I do not have any reason to believe it is related to what happened in New York. And I just want to follow up on what I thought I heard you say earlier. If it came to U.S. ground troops in Afghanistan in order to go after Osama bin Laden, would you back that? As uh, the president said, we will do whatever is necessary to deal with this. And I would not remove any of the options available to the president.
As you said, I'm judicious in the use of force. And I also believe that when it is time to use force, you use it in a decisive way. But we're far from selecting any particular military targets or have to how to go after those targets at this time. But we've but, got to build a case first. But talk to me a little bit about very specific language in the president's speech. It, it, it was the sentence that struck all of us that we will not only move against those who perpetrated this, but those who harbored them. Yeah, the reality is that there are nations, <clears throat> there are organizations out there that give support to these kinds of terrorist activities. They provide facilities, they provide homes, they provide uh, support for them, they provide money for them, and we're going to go after all of them. We're going to make it clear to them that you cannot have any kind of decent relationship with the United States if you do this, and we will go after the support that allows terrorists to perform these kinds of acts. But that gives them havens. That could be many states. That could yes, be not could. just Afghanistan. It could be other states. And, and, sure. and do you contemplate contemplate the possibility of military action against? No, not necessarily. We're contemplating a full court press, whether it's diplomatic, legal, intelligence sharing. And for those nations that uh, we believe can do a better job of policing their borders, of going after this kind of activity, we're going to work with them. We're going to make it clear to them that this will be a standard against which they're measured with respect to their relationship with the United States. Mr. Secretary, the response you're talking about could take a long time and could be quite controversial in the Middle East. Have you been in contact with um, Jordan and Egypt, and do you have any indication that they'll support this kind of effort? Uh, I have calls in to all of the leaders in the region. So far this morning, I've, uh, I have spoken to the Secretary General of the United Nations, the uh, Lord Robertson in NATO, and Javier Solana of the European Union. And as soon as these interviews are over, I will be on the phone to leaders in the Middle East as well. All right, Mr. Secretary, we'll let you get to work then. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Secretary of State Colin Powell, and we appreciate his uh, joining us this morning. We want to go to the law of the White House. Terry Moran he is there. Terry, some new information? Well, Charlie, let me just bring you up to date on what we know of the president's uh, doings today. He showed up in the Oval Office a little after 7 a.m. That is typical for him. His national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice, already on the scene here in the White House. Uh, one, uh, one detail is that uh, the president, as George mentioned earlier, will be meeting with the congressional leadership, the joint congressional leadership who will be here in the cabinet room, and he will be meeting with them at 11.30 this morning. There's also going to be a blood drive set up on the White House grounds, in the White House complex at the old executive office building, and the president and the first lady intend to drop by that blood drive here. The uh, officials here are encouraging uh, all of us who work at the White House to donate blood, and the President and the First Lady uh, will be doing the same. It is going to be a day, uh, as you can imagine, that is going to be absolutely packed for the President with meetings and decisions uh, about what is the next step to take. In that National Security Council meeting that he chaired last night before retiring for the evening, uh, we were told that he was given a full briefing on the status of the investigation at that point, Things have advanced since then, and that is undoubtedly what he is hearing about now. All, All right. right. Terry Moran, thank you. Terry, we do thank you. And as we said, we're going to keep you up to date on everything that is new this morning. And these may be new pictures for you if you weren't up very, very late into the wee hours of the morning. Because we received some home video now, and you're going to see it, a picture of the first plane that hit the first World Trade this Center is American, Tower. American Airlines Flight 11 that was out of Boston, a Boeing 767. This is the plane hitting the first World Trade Center Tower, the explosion of plane. No one had any idea it was coming. It was a total surprise. By the time we took air, which was a few minutes later, and we had the first pictures of that building, we didn't know if it was an explosion, if it was a bomb, if it was a missile, or if it was an airplane that had mistakenly flied into the World Trade Center tower. But there it is, hitting the tower. American Airlines Flight 11, there were a total of 92 people aboard. And we'll just repeat again for those of you who certainly saw it yesterday, but none of us will ever forget it. The scene of that second plane coming in, and this is a scene taken by Evan Fairbanks, who is a photographer, a freelance photographer. It's United Airlines Flight 175. You know, this is not the Fairbanks uh, pictures, but this is a picture of the plane 
Oh. I don't care how many times you see it. It is just... Just awful. Go ahead. Well, that's the 767. That's the United Flight 175 that flew in just 18 minutes later into the uh, into the second World Trade Center tower. We showed you the New York Daily News, the tabloid. The New York, did we show the New York Times headline on the uh, on the paper? Uh, the the Times, which is always very judicious in its use of headlines, uh, has a banner headline this morning: U.S. attack. And then the sub headline that says hijacked. Jets destroy Twin Towers and hit Pentagon in day of terror. And now the New York Post, uh, we've just gotten our copy of the New York Post, uh, where it says an act of war on the, uh, I can't get this position very well, act of war on the cover of the plane there, poised in the picture we just saw about to hit the second World Trade Center tower, and then inside the day that terror hit home uh, in the United States. At terror. US, I'm sorry. USA Today, John Miller's just holding up USA Today, uh, which is now out, uh, Act of War. And the pictures, uh, again, just as grisly as they are in every other newspaper. I want to go to ABC's Cynthia McFadden, who has been covering uh, the casualty situation at the hospitals in New York. And Cynthia, I don't know if you heard of the mayor when he was with us, uh, but he gave us some numbers on fatalities, 41 fatalities, civilian fatalities that they have found so far. And that number, obviously, yeah. is very premature. 202 firefighters missing and you have to worry or presume that they may be dead and 57 other uh uniformed uh, officers that's new york policemen and port authority police but i know you've been covering uh those who were injured at the hospital well and, and charlie of course what no one wants to say is the fact that the hospitals are not treating more victims this morning is very bad news indeed uh, they have been working all night trying to excavate people but this morning st vincent's at the trauma center at chelsea piers uh, there just are not people being brought here uh, for treatment. The doctors are ready, but they are not available. I have Governor Pataki here with me. Uh, he was come down to, uh, to, to, to visit the hospital as well as he's toured the uh, entire Ground Zero site last night and this morning. Governor, thanks for joining us this morning. What can you tell us from being at Ground Zero? Well, it is incredible to see the, the devastation. You can, uh, uh, you can imagine it, but when you actually see block after block of uh, concrete that's been turned to dust and rubble all over the place, it's, a, it's an incredible scene. But amidst that devastation, you see firefighters and police officers and National Guard troops down there with tremendous courage, risking their lives, going through the search and rescue operation, cleaning the debris, and hoping that we can recover more people alive. Governor, we understand that until very late last night, they weren't really even able to begin the digging effort. When I was down there last night, they actually had people at the site of the towers themselves, and it was incredibly courageous to see because right next door, uh, there was still another high-rise on, uh, on fire in flames that uh, uh, had a risk of collapsing, but uh, uh, they're just uh, incredibly courageous heroes down there, risking their lives in the hopes that we can save some additional lives. Governor, tell us what, I mean, your reaction to the sites you saw last night. Uh, it's just uh, incredible to see, you know, that, that but uh, we've also seen sites that are inspirational. New Yorkers coming together, lining up for blocks to give blood, volunteering here at the hospitals. And, you know, you'd see, you'd look in the eyes of the firefighters down there last night, covered with uh, dust and debris, uh, and you could sense the sorrow as they tried to uh, recover some of their colleagues who are buried in that rubble, but you could also sense the, 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 the inspiration and, and the courage and, and the strength that they are showing. And it's that uh, courage and strength that's going to get us through this and that's going to allow us to come back stronger and not have our freedom, freedom taken from us by this horrible terrorist act. Governor, of course, the fact that so few victims are being brought to the hospitals this morning is a very bad sign. What are the emergency services personnel telling you? What, what's the briefing this morning? We just don't know. There are st we do believe that that there are still people alive in the rubble. There, there have been some indications of cell phone communications. Uh, late last night, two Port Authority police officers were taken from the rubble alive and were saved. So the focus now is on search and rescue. We have 18 search and rescue teams down there, more coming from as, 
as far away as Puerto Rico. We're not going to give up hope, and uh, uh, we're just uh, going to do everything we can to try to save every life possible. Are you persuaded that at this point the state has all the resources it needs to be able to continue the search and rescue? Uh, the cooperation and support has been enormous. The city has the best professional firefighters and police officers in the world. The state support, the National Guard and emergency services has been uh, uh, tremendous in their help. And uh, the federal officials have given us everything we've wanted. And of those 18 search and rescue teams, we have them from Connecticut. We have them from surrounding states and from all across America. And we're very grateful for that outpouring of support. Thank you, Governor. Fataki for joining us this morning. Charlie, Diane, back to you. All right, thanks very much, Cynthia McFadden and Governor Pataki. Appreciate your uh, stopping and talking to Cynthia. And, and as the mayor, uh, Mayor Giuliani, said to us just a few moments ago, this, this process of untangling this massive amount of material that is there in the World Trade Center uh, area is going to take weeks, if not months. And they have to treat it as a crime scene, not only as a, um, as a search scene, but a crime scene. And that makes it take even longer. That's right. As we promised, we're going to bring you up to date on everything new this morning about those who did it and how they did it. And we're going to start because we've got investigative reporter Brian Ross here, and he's been talking to the FBI. Well, Diane, in the last uh, 25 minutes or so, uh, FBI agents have entered the home of a man by the name of Muhammad Atta in Venice, Florida. He is one of two people um, who they had a, a APV all points bulletin out for overnight looking for a car registered to him and, and another car registered to a uh, rental uh, service in uh, Boca Raton, Florida. Who is he? Uh, what do we know about him? We don't know anything about him. Uh, there's been quite a bit of activity in Florida overnight. Um, agents also are uh, following up leads of a car found, as we had reported earlier, at the Daytona Beach Airport, where there was a, a picture of uh, Omar bin Laden found in the car. And the owner of the car reportedly was a... Uh, student at a flight school in Daytona Beach, Florida, who had been kicked out of the school. Uh, one uh, highly placed source in Washington said that, uh, told us uh, overnight that the executive branch uh, has concluded that the list of suspects will be small because there must be highly trained pilots who have been involved, and they are looking through the various flight schools and connections that way. Uh, what led them to Florida, do we know, Brian? And what, do we have any idea what led them to this individual? Because obviously the planes were not hijacked from there. It was the far north of there. Right. The best leads have come from the flight manifest uh, by uh, 2 o'clock yesterday afternoon. They were running names off the uh, list of passengers uh, on the plane, uh, and that uh, seems to have been one of the ways they got to uh, both South Florida to Daytona Beach, and then, of course, in the Boston area, there are a number of people they're looking for as well. Brian, I ask you to stick around because we're going to turn now to crime and justice specialist John Miller who's with us this morning. There are other details emerging this morning about who and how? They've been going over the tapes of the 911 calls made from the plane and analyzing the accounts of different passengers and um, in more than one flight uh, the FBI is coming to a theory that that there was uh, uh, a plan here to on takeoff while the seatbelt lights were still on to attack the flight attendants with knives and box cutters in the cabin as a diversion to lure the pilot or the co-pilot out, out of the cockpit to investigate the commotion in the cabin as soon as that door was open, um, then storming inside to take control of the plane. And um, that's the operating theory on at least two of these flights from what they've been able to analyze. So they attacked the flight attendants. Right. Lured the pilots out and then went into the cockpit. On most domestic flights, certainly with American carriers, that the procedure is that the cockpit door is locked. So they had to come up with some kind of ruse to gain entry into the cockpit. And it seems to be uh, attacking the flight attendants was designed to draw somebody from the cockpit out. Just, just one more uh, time to, uh, to go over a report that we talked about earlier in the morning, and people are joining us as the morning goes on. But uh, Brian was talking about uh, uh, these activities by federal agents in the state of Florida. And we've also had reports this morning that in Boston, uh, they have seized a car, which apparently was used by hijackers that went into the Boston airport. They had apparently come down from Canada through Portland, Maine, rented a car there, and driven to Boston uh, to carry out the hijackings. That's one of the reports in this morning we're being told, again, to focus on the fact that that is a very, as they say, a soft border. That's an easy access point back and forth. And if you recall, at the time of the millennium, where they had a number of arrests of, uh, or searches of people in the Boston area, 
uh, connected with a, a possible terror suspect at that point. And flight manuals also, John, found in that car? That's right. Uh, flight uh, manuals uh, in Arabic were found in a national rent-a-car um, that was at the central parking area at Logan Airport. Uh, the car had been rented uh, by two, uh, by one man, um, and by going through the manifest, they've identified five names. Two of them are brothers. One of them is a pilot um, that they're focusing on, uh, and it appears to be a different pilot from the man in Florida. So it looks like there were a number of people, uh, two or more, who had uh, in-flight experience and who may have trained others. And does it surprise you they left this kind of evidence behind? Uh, in a suicide mission, um, I'm sure being traced or caught was probably not their concern. <laughs> you know, there's an ironic detail that they got to the Logan Airport so late that their luggage didn't make the plane. I can't imagine that's as much concern. Well, it's interesting uh, because in most carriers, uh, there's a system of passenger claiming where, um, uh, if the, where the opposite is true. If your luggage makes the plane and you don't, it, it doesn't take off. Uh, the opposite doesn't apply, though. Yeah. All right, John Miller, Brian Ross, uh, thanks very much. Senator John McCain, a Republican of Arizona, is joining us this morning. Senator McCain, can you hear me? Good morning. Hey, good morning. Charlie Gibson and, and Diane Sawyer here, and I appreciate um, your joining us. We were just uh, talking to the Secretary of State, uh, Colin Powell, and uh, about what really is appropriate response in this instance, and the fact that this country is angry right now, really angry. Your sense of that? Well, I, I agree, Charlie. This country is very angry, and uh, uh, controlled fury, I guess, is, uh, is as good a description. And uh, there's no doubt that uh, Americans have every right to demand uh, a complete and thorough uh, response. Uh, the question is, obviously, uh, who did it? And uh, I thought the president last night uh, made a very important point in his excellent speech to the nation where he said that uh, we not only do those organizations have to be punished, but those nations that shelter uh, them as well. And that's going to be uh, something which I think may be a long-term project. Well, and, and we've made the point a number of times this morning, Senator, and it, it, but it's a very difficult one, and it will uh, present a great conundrum for this administration and for the military establishment, for the Congress, that, that indeed this could be, if it turns out to be bin Laden or bin Laden connected, that this could be not just one nation, but it could be a number that have harbored people involved in this organization. I agree, uh, but I think the, uh, the, unless we get out at the fundamental problem, and that is that there is a network, a veritable network in that part of the world. Uh, we know uh, there was allegations uh, concerning Iranian participation in the Kobar Towers bombing in Saudi Arabia. There's been uh, allegations about Iraq, uh, Libya, even North Korea. So. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that there's a system out there or a network, and that network is going to have to be attacked, and this may be a very long-term proposition, but I'm convinced that the American people will stay the course, as we have uh, in other times of crisis. There's patience, you think, in this country about this? I, I, I think there's an understandable impatience, but I believe the president will explain to the American people that this has to be done in a measured and methodical fashion. Just launching a bunch of cruise missiles, uh, the so-called pinprick responses that we employed before are not going to do it, and everybody knows that. So it's going to take a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of American treasure, and perhaps some American blood. Senator McCain, we thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. And, uh, and as we know, there are going to be congressional meetings throughout the day, congressional briefings. Hope to hear more from you later. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go now to Don Dela, who is on the scene. And we like to stay in touch and see exactly what's happening down with the firefighters, down with the policemen. Uh, we have seen that smoke, that wall, that towering wall of smoke now subside. But as we know, they're still dealing with very, very tricky terrain down there. And... We are also receiving some reports of perhaps additional survivors. We're not sure of those. Don, what are you hearing? Ah, sorry. Don Dale is apparently having technical trouble down there, and no wonder. It's a very, it's a very but, complicated but area. Just to recap what Diane's talking about, maybe we'll get the connection with Don, who is down right at the site where the um, recovery efforts are going on, such as they are right now. But the, but the mayor earlier told us that they had recovered had found two people alive and that they were in contact with a third and were trying to find that person. And he said there were a number of other 
calls, cell phone calls that had come out of the rubble, but they were, they couldn't tell uh, exactly how reliable some of those uh, reports were of calls that had come out. He said there's really only one person that we know is in there and uh, alive, and we're trying to find him. So we will try to get to Don Daler uh, in just a few moments. Also joining us this morning, former director of the CIA, Admiral Jim Woolsey, who is with us. Admiral Woolsey, can you hear me? Those Army captains, Charlie. Uh, just Mr. is fine. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Mr. then. Uh, your sense. I, I, I've asked a number of people, and I, I would ask you the same thing. Your sense of where we're going to be a week from now, what, what kinds of things we're going to learn over the next few days? Well, I hope very much we're going to start pursuing looking hard at who might have been behind this, and I don't mean just bin Laden. Uh, this operation looks quite sophisticated and rather broad-based, the sort of operation that uh, uh, might well uh, have an intelligence service of a country behind it. And uh, the uh, Clinton administration uh, at first pursued in 93 and 94, and the FBI did, the possibility that Iraq was behind the World Trade Center bombing in 93. And then it abandoned uh, that uh, theory and moved off to believing that most of these terrorist operations were loose associations of people who just sort of came together, or later on, uh, bin Laden. But it didn't go back to looking uh, for a possibility of state sponsorship uh, behind them. It's time now to uh, resuscitate that. Uh, look, there is, um, uh, I think, a fair amount of opinion growing uh, that uh, uh, the Iraqi government could conceivably have been behind the World Trade Center bombing of 1993. And the difference between this act of war against the United States and December 7th, 1941, is in 1941 we saw those red rising suns on the wings of the attacking aircraft and we knew who had attacked us. Uh, now it's fine for us to be angry. It's fine for us to want to respond. It's fine for us to say it's an act of war. I think all of those things are true. But we need to get quite clear uh, exactly who may have been responsible for this. The president talked last night about harboring terrorists. Uh, Afghanistan harbors bin Laden, and he may well have been involved, but there may have been more involved here than harboring. Could have been somebody else behind that. How could, given the sophistication of this operation, the question that's going to be asked a lot in coming months, how did U.S. intelligence miss it? Well, I think there's several things to be said. Uh, one is they may, well, uh, we've heard, really heard from the Secretary this morning, have picked up uh, generally that something was going to happen, but not that this particularly was. Uh, uh, secondly, they have stopped a number of other terrorist incidents, including a number right around the time of Y2K, but this is a business in which you have to stop uh, uh, everything, and this was a terrible tragedy. Uh, a third thing is that the CIA guidelines issued in 95, I'd hasten to say after I left, uh, make it difficult, not impossible, but difficult to recruit people inside terrorist organizations as spies because they uh, put a deterrent uh, on if you're trying to recruit someone with a violent past. Well, you know, the only people inside terrorist organizations are violent people. Uh, you don't just recruit nice people if you want to uh, learn what's going on in terrorist organizations. And then finally, I think uh, they may have been looking uh, very, very hard at the terrorist organizations themselves but not enough at the possibility of a, a state behind it, whether Iraq, Iran, I think is less likely, uh, or some other. But I think Iraq would have to be the principal candidate. Before we let you go, one other question, though. There were not only restrictions put on the CIA in the period of time that you talk about after you left, but there yeah. were restrictions put on the kind of intelligence that could be uh, uh, gathered, uh, particularly back in the, in the 70s. Uh, when a lot of people feel to some extent the CIA was dismantled. Well, one of the things that may come out of this, will it be, do you think, a, a, a really thorough going over of U.S. intelligence capabilities and in effect to some extent unfetter the CIA? Well, I hope that uh, human intelligence, which is really the main way you're going to get intelligence about terrorist organizations, uh, gets back some of the resources that they had uh, for the Y2K period, and uh, they've been uh, slimmed down, uh, unfortunately, uh, since then. Um, but I think George Tenet, uh, the DCI, uh, takes a real interest in human intelligence, and he's worked very hard to do the best he can with the resources that he's given. I think it's mainly a question of resources and removing uh, some of these uh, constraints that are the result of political events of the past wholly unrelated to terrorism. All right, thanks. Jim Woolsey, I appreciate your being with us Good this morning. Thanks. Job.
thank you very much. All the best to you. All right. I want to check because I believe we have Don Daler up now, and I want to make sure that we do. Can you just tell me in my ear? Yes, Don, we see you there down at the scene. And as we said, we are hearing reports of additional survivors. Can you tell us anything more? That's right. Well, you remember back at Oklahoma City when little bits of good news started to trickle in as time went by. That's the case now. We have the report that there have been six survivors pulled out, one of whom is a Port Authority police officer named Jay McLaughlin. He has been taken to the hospital. The Port Authority police wanted us to announce that so that his family would know that he is okay. That's one individual we know about. In addition to that, there were five firemen recovered from the World Trade Center alive and taken to the hospital. I have with me here Fireman Bill Duty. Now, why is it that do you believe that they were able to survive such a horrendous accident? Well, they were fortunate enough to fall into a void. When the building fell, uh, there must have been a part of the structure that, that kind of surrounded them and protected them from the falling debris. So when the debris fell on the side, they were in an air pocket. And they just stayed there until help arrived. I don't know what company they were from, but uh, there were uh, five firefighters and one officer, so six men. Were they badly injured? I don't know how the injuries were, but I know they got them out. So. Uh, it, does this give you hope that there will be other survivors being pulled out? Oh, absolutely. I, I have a lot of hope, especially for people that were below grade, because there's a lot of voids down there. Uh, the building, the first few floors is kind of still intact. So I'm hoping that most people under grade, will, there might be a lot of voids. But un unfortunately, most people that were above the first few floors, uh, very little hope as far as, as far as I know. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. I just wanted to add one thing, Charlie. As we were walking through this massive debris field a little bit earlier, one of the things that struck me was it is a huge debris field, but for the size of those buildings, it really didn't seem like it, it would be that size. It, it, you would think it was much, much larger than that until you realize that there are parts of the World Trade Center all around us. The building was literally pulverized. There is a fine dust for miles around this area, and that is why that it's not just one big pile there that you would imagine. You can only get an idea of how huge these buildings were if you stood in their shadow before this happened. Yes, and, and, and another point that I think needs to be made, and, and we'll find out more about that, is we learned at the time of the World Trade Center bombing in 1993, there are, you know, those buildings went way down. Actually, they went to 70 feet into bedrock. There were garages below, and the, and obviously there's going to be a lot of sunken debris as well, but the pile of debris five, six stories high. And as Mayor Giuliani said, it is going to be weeks, maybe even months before they've gone through all of it. I think I mentioned last night that when I went down there, you could hear a groan from the still standing parts of the buildings. It's an actual sound, almost like an avalanche about to pour down on you. Well, we want to go to ABC's Lisa Stark, who covers aviation, because we said there is news this morning both about what may have happened on board these flights and also uh, some additional information about air travel today in the U.S. Let me just start and ask you, first of all, what do we know now about airlines resuming operation today? Well, we know that the uh, Federal Aviation Administration, Diane, is still hoping to get planes back in the air starting around noon today. Uh, airline sources tell us they're still waiting for final word from the FAA on the exact security measures that will be taken. Uh, that has not officially come down yet, so they're waiting on that before they figure out what they're going to do today. But the FAA says it hopes to have flights resuming around noon. We expect in about two, two and a half hours to hear officially from the Department of Transportation uh, announcing what exactly will be taking place to try to get flights back in the air. You're putting up uh, some of the things we've learned that they will be implementing. No curbside check-in. They'll be doing random ID checks, both of employees and passengers. Only passengers past the checkpoints and on. Uh, obviously, a, a tightening of security, like the type of security we saw during the Gulf War. You're also expected to see uh, much more uh, visible security at the airports local police, possibly some military police as well, will be at a number of the airports, especially in the Washington, D.C. and the New York City area as well. Uh, it will take the airlines time to ramp up. One airline I spoke with this morning said there's a number of scenarios on the table. Perhaps by you know, late this afternoon, they could be at 20% uh, ramp up. Uh, it will take a number of days for them to get the systems 
back up and running and to get planes going again. It's like, yeah, the, the uh, airports just look like parking lots at the moment. Since there are no planes in the air, they're all on the ground in airports and, uh, and have to be parked. Uh, there are not enough gates to accommodate them. Uh, that, I'm sure that's probably true. The, the airplanes are just sitting there. Uh, they are uh, they are not even where they would normally be at this time in the morning because they uh, didn't go on to whatever their final destin destinations would be. So that's another sort of uh, thing that the airlines and their operations center have to work out what airplane is where and where do they need to get that airplane to. Charlie, I have some new information uh, about uh, the planes that crashed into the World Trade Center that I'd like to tell you about this morning that I've just managed to gather from some government sources of mine. Um, we were talking about earlier about this code that the that the pilot can push a button and send a code it's the code is 7500 by the way to let controllers know that the plane is being hijacked uh, we had some indications that no code was sent uh, i have another government source now that indicates to me that in fact none of the planes sent that particular code out indicating that a hijacking was in progress on top of that i have learned that uh, those hijackers apparently were very, very sophisticated in how these planes worked and what they needed to do. Because what I have learned this morning from government sources is that on the two planes, at least, that went into the World Trade Tower, apparently on the American Airlines Flight 11, the transponder on that plane was turned off entirely. Now, this is the system that sends a signal to air traffic controllers uh, it identifies the plane, the altitude, uh, things like that. And apparently the transponder was turned off on American Flight 11, according to government sources. And what that would mean is that all controllers are seeing is a blip on their screen, no information about the particular plane, uh, no information about its altitude, what plane it is. As they say, they're just getting a skin paint off of the plane. On the United Airlines flight, 175, Someone apparently tr changed the transponder code on that one. And what that does, I'm told, is that the computer then doesn't recognize the plane anymore. So again, they're not getting good information about what plane it is, what altitude it is at, only seeing blips on their screen. So whoever was doing that in the cockpit had that carefully planned so that no one was really could know what was going on and what the intentions were at the time. And yet a couple of other reports out this morning, Lisa, that initially on Flight 11, that first plane to go into the first tower, air traffic controllers could hear someone, that the pilot had pushed a button and allowed them to hear apparently the hijackers talking in English, saying what? I have two conflicting sources on that this morning, Diane. I have a, one government source that says that's not inconsistent with the reports that they have heard that for a time the microphone was keyed open on that American Airlines Flight 11, the first flight to go into the World Trade Tower. That source could not tell me what was being said. I talked to a second government source who indicated that they were not sure that the mic was keyed open on that plane. So I think this is still information that's developing and we just don't know for certain if the pilot had in fact opened the microphone and some conversations were being heard. But I'm fascinated by that information that the transponders were turned off and that they never sent the hijacking signal. I, what that would tell me, and, and you're far more sophisticated in this than I am, what that would tell me is that the hijackers had the controls of those planes very early in the flight. Or clearly were threatening enough to at least direct pilots to do that particular action. Uh, I mean, if control, if the transponders were turned off or changed in some way, as I said, someone was very, very sophisticated in knowing that that's what they needed to do, not to become a stealth aircraft, obviously, they're still being able to be seen on radar, but really there was no communication with these planes, I believe, from controllers. At least one of the planes, all the communication systems were, were shut down. I don't know exactly what plane that was. So these hijackers uh, wanted to be as isolated as they could up there to keep people guessing what was going on as they carried out uh, their attacks. All right. Thanks very much. Lisa Stark is joining us from Seattle, Washington. I want to check now because, as we know, it is a national tragedy. But for so many families, for so many individuals around the country, it is, uh, well, they're just an infinity of human heartbreak out there. And
part of this modern age is that so many people say that they heard cell phone calls coming in, that they heard from loved ones. There's the flight attendant who called to say what was going on board. There is a son who called his father to say he thought they were going to crash. There is the wife of Solicitor General Theodore Olson who called her husband twice saying that there were men on board a plane with knives and the passenger reportedly hiding out in the bathroom of a plane who called 911. Well, I want to bring in, if we can, Alice and Vaughn Hoagland. And Alice Hoagland is the mother of Mark Hoagland. Vaughn is his uncle, and they are joining us from Sarasota, California this morning. And first of all, we can only say to you that we are so grateful in this horrible moment that you, sh you came and are with us this morning, and we thank you. I'm Mrs. Very Hoagland. glad you asked us. Mrs. Hoagland, tell yes. me what happened. What was the call that came in? Well, at 6.45 yesterday morning, uh, the phone rang. A friend of the family, Carol Phipps, answered it, ran to get uh, my sister-in-law, Mark's aunt, Kathy. Uh, he said to her, I want to let you know that, we, that, that I love you. And Kathy told him, well, we love you, Mark. And then she went to get me. I, I ran to the phone. Mark said, Mom, this is Mark Bingham. She gave me, he gave me his last name. He was so rattled. Uh, he, uh, he said, I want to let you know that I love you. I told him that we all love him. He said that he was on United Flight 93 from Newark to San Francisco and that there were three guys who had taken over the aircraft and they say they have a bomb. I asked him, who are these people? And he seemed distracted, didn't hear the question, didn't answer. Uh, then he came back on, said, it's true. Uh, and I said, I believe you. Uh, I told him I love him. Uh, and then it went dead. He was not calling from a cell phone. He was calling from the air phone, probably at his seat. He was seated at the back of first class toward the front of the aircraft. Uh, uh, pretty light load that day. We we're hoping that Mark had a, had a chance to perhaps work with other passengers to thwart the, the intent of, of these uh, hijackers. Yes, you, you point out, this is Charlie Gibson, you point out... Hello, Mr. Gibson. How are you? And, and, Hi. And boy, I mean, you know, everybody, the stories in all of this are so heart-rendering, and yours, obviously, uh, so much so. And, and that, that flight, for people who, who uh, aren't aware and can't keep all these planes uh, uh, straight, this is the plane that was, had left Newark, headed for San Francisco, and that's the plane uh, that crashed uh, in western Pennsylvania, uh, southeast right. of the city of Pittsburgh. That's, and there that's are actually right. reports that perhaps, and I, and I hope it is some consolation to you, there are reports that perhaps uh, the passengers on that plane were able to overwhelm yes, the hijackers. Yes, we hope so. We know that Mark was a, a very active and, and take charge guy. He was a large man. Uh, uh, it's likely, based on things that we've heard, that he was able to participate uh, in at least thwarting the, the efforts of these, of these people that took control of the aircraft. We know that of the four aircraft that were, in, uh, that were made, uh, that were hijacked, uh, his was the only one that didn't reach its target. And we hope that Mark was able to take a, an active stand against these folks when in he any case. When he called you to yes. express his love to you and to his aunt. Did, did you have uh, a sense from him, or did he say explicitly that he thought this plane was going to go down? No, he didn't have a chance to say anything like that. I could tell by his voice that he was quite concerned. He was calm, but I could tell he was frightened. Um, he was telling me his last name, this is Mark Bingham. <laughs> uh, um, he, incidentally, he, he is a, a, a big supporter of Senator John McCain. We were very touched by the eloquence of Senator McCain earlier. Mm. Uh, it's, uh, uh, he, uh, he is a, a very patriotic young man, as is his aunt Kathy. We, and all of us here, we're, we're very touched by the, by the words of our president. We hope that this horrible set of events will help to bring the American people together in, in uh, a, a, a real uh, effort against this kind of terrorism. Yes, uh, I'm a flight attendant for United Airlines, uh, and uh, as is my sister. Mark was 
flying on a companion path from my sister Candace Hoagland. Mm. And did you watch the television reports, Ms. Hoagland, Mr. Hoagland, or was it harder? We, it was watch. difficult to watch all of them. As yeah, soon as so. we got the call from Mark, we, we called the FBI and we turned on the TV and realized that this, this horrible thing that Mark was involved in was uh, part of a national uh, crisis. His flight was actually the last to yeah. meet its final end, so we had hopes that uh, maybe something would happen where he'd be able to, he's an active guy and he's not one to sit on his hands, and I think that if there was anything done to, to thwart the people that uh, he, he was involved in it. I know him, and he, I know the way he thinks, and he would not sit idly by, especially since there's a good chance that I think that he probably knew that it was indeed a suicide mission. He has access to to Palm Pilots and, and the Internet capabilities, a pretty electronic savvy guy. And I think that somehow he found out that uh, they had no intention of landing any of the passengers safely, and he took it upon himself, maybe recruited other people. We have hoped that uh, he played an active role in, in doing whatever he could and in, in keeping that plane from getting to what we now know is, was Camp David. We should tell everyone, uh, and I hope I'm right on this, he was 31 years old, owned his own public relations firm on the East Coast, yeah. and a graduate the Bingham of Berkeley. Group. <laughs> yes. Al Alice, Bowen, our love to you. Thanks very much for joining Thank us. Thank you very much, Thank Charlie, you. Diane. You, you take care. Thank you. you. It's uh, 8 o'clock on the East Coast, and we want to reset, give you some sense of what's going on, the latest information we have. Uh, the good news this morning comes from the rescue site of uh, the World Trade Center Towers in downtown New York. We don't know that there's going to be a whole lot of good news from there, and indeed, I suspect over the next few days, there'll be a lot of bad news. But six people rescued in the last uh, few hours, uh, five firefighters, one policeman. Uh, we don't know if the mayor, when he was with us about an hour ago, was talking about somebody different, but he also said that they were in contact with someone uh, by phone and that perhaps uh, there was one other person to be rescued. I don't know if that person was among these six or not. Let's go back. We are going to see the scenes once again. As of this hour, down at the World Trade Center, there is still fire down there. We could see just a little bit earlier that underneath just before there is still fire just beneath for a some of the soot and some of the flames. The picture there that you're seeing is of the first plane, American Flight 11, hitting the first of the World Trade Center towers at 8.45 yesterday morning, just under 24 hours ago. That is the event which led, or began, this incredible series of circumstances that has brought us to where we are uh, right now. And because some of you may be joining us at this half hour, we want to go back to Don Daler for a minute, who was there for a second, and let him just tell us once again what's happening at this hour. Don? Well, what's been happening for about the past six and a half hours is the slow, agonizing, slow process of sifting through the wreckage, a massive amount of wreckage. They're having to take a slow way cutting away different pieces of metal. What you can see is it looks like another shift change. We've been seeing different National Guardsmen, police, rescue workers coming up Church Street. There's almost a universally consistent look on their face. Weariness, numbness, and they, they have this haunted look in their eye. There was a National Guardsman from the 258 Artillery Unit uh, out of Jamaica, Queens who came by me and I chatted with him for a moment and he said that this was not the kind of war that he had trained for. Charlie? All right, thanks uh, very much, Don Daler. One little uh, new piece of information, uh, and it's an important one. President Bush has declared New York City to be a federal disaster area. Now that disaster ex uh, declaration allows uh, New Yorkers who have been affected by the attack on the World Trade Center to apply for federal aid. Uh, that could be, uh, it could be housing assistance, it could be medical assistance, it could be crisis counseling, uh, it could be unemployment benefits. So there's all kinds of uh, uh, different uh, benefits that that uh, entitles people to who have been affected by a disaster. And this is certainly, albeit man-made, this is certainly a disaster here uh, in New York. And as we reported, uh, the entire city from 14th Street right to the tip of Manhattan Island has been closed down for at least today and as mayor giuliani pointed out that's actually the third largest urban area forget the rest of new york that by itself is the third largest urban area in the united states uh, that entire area shut down for the day and they're going to make this decision on whether to close it down day by day 
But as he pointed out, the area where the World Trade Center was, the World Trade Center complex, and it was a complex of buildings, three of which have now gone down, um, that that will be closed for weeks and months. But, but it, it's really for a New Yorker, and I understand many of you uh, do not live in the city, but for a New Yorker, uh, the fact that that much of the city has now been closed down uh, is really startling. All of the financial centers, for instance, down in that area, and many very prominent neighborhoods. Again, if you missed Mayor Giuliani earlier, he brought us up to date on casualty <laughs> figures. He, he said he didn't know how many people had been reported missing overnight. They simply didn't have a tally on that. He talked about at least a thousand, more than a thousand people whom he knew had been taken to hospitals and who were injured. He talked about 41, 41 fatalities. 41 fatalities, 202 and, firefighters. Right. Uh, who are missing. Uh, now, maybe that number has been brought down since they found uh, uh, five alive, but 202 that were missing and presumed dead at the time he talked to us, which was an hour ago, and 57 uniformed police officers. That's New York City police and uh, Port Authority police. And among the firefighters in New York, and this is a great department here in New York, and, and we have talked a lot about firefighters and how important they are in the last year. 202 is a staggering number, and among that number, some of the top officials of the New York City Fire Department. The first group of firefighters, 400 firefighters who went into the World Trade Center, apparently about half of them perished. The chief. And that takes us right to Cynthia McFadden, who is down at St. Vincent's Hospital. Cynthia? Diane, we're on West 11th Street, south of 14th, of course, the closest trauma center to the actual site of the uh, World Trade Center. I have with me the chief of surgery here at St. Vincent's, Dr. Mark Wallach, uh, has been uh, on duty most of the night, and he has made rounds this morning. Can you give us an update on the condition of those 361 people who have been brought to this hospital, four of whom have died? Dr. Wallach, tell us about the survivors. The survivors right now are stable. Uh, there's about 60, 60, uh, 60 that we consider to be somewhat critical but stable. Uh, right now, that's all that, uh, that I really want to report. We're making rounds on them now. You can imagine that when we come in in the morning uh, and you have to uh, make rounds on, uh, on 360 individuals who have come in, been triaged, some, some most have been admitted, that uh, it's a very difficult task. Uh, the, the, the individuals in this institution uh, from all the paramedical personnel through the medical students from New York Medical College, the residents who work here both in medicine and in surgery, et cetera, done a great job. Now, now many of these people were, tell us where they were in terms of the blast. Well, uh, some of them were in the building. A lot were outside of the building. I think that it's very apparent to everybody, and it's really sad for me to even talk about it, that um, a lot of the people in the building uh, probably uh, did not make it out. There were a few that we have here that, that uh, are telling some tales, but uh, uh, I think that uh, we've treated a lot of uh, personnel who were down there trying to get people out of the building uh, also. Some of the rescue workers who you treated yesterday and today, this morning, have said that as they were coming out of the building, they saw colleagues going in. That's correct. Uh, the, the, uh, the, actually, some of the people that were actually working in the building were coming down the steps to get out uh, as they saw fire uh, individuals and police uh, going up to uh, initially try to fight the fire and rescue people before the buildings collapsed. Dr. Wallach, one of the issues this morning is the fact that your staff here is not busy, which is a terrible sign. You know, quite honestly, uh, we saw 300 and so we took 360 hits yesterday, and that's not busy for this kind of catastrophe. That tells the tale to everybody. This is really very, very sad. Thank you very much, Dr. Wallach. Uh, Diane, Charlie, back to you. Okay, Cynthia, we thank you. And, um, and the fire chief who was killed, one of the chiefs, was Chief Gancy. We have uh, some news coming in from John Miller shortly. He's going to be with us. But I want to tell everybody that we asked Mayor Giuliani this morning about reports coming out that a USS aircraft carrier, the George Washington, has been positioned off the coast of New York City, that the North American Defense Command went on alert yesterday, and that F-15s and F-16s are continuing to fly combat air patrol over New York. We asked him if he was expecting anything more today. He said he'd been asking that question, and he is not. John Miller uh, has just gotten here. There you go. <laughs> Hopefully with some news, some new uh, details. A number of developments, uh, not all of them good. 
Uh, across the street from the World Trade Center, uh, in one of the tallest buildings in Battery Park City, fire has broken out on the roof. A police helicopter reports that uh, it's uh, billowing black smoke and spreading rapidly, apparently uh, from some burning debris that may have fallen there. Um, in addition, uh, there have been some rescues, dramatic rescues from the scene. Also a church in Day Street, they've called for uh, uh, two sergeants and uh, 20 detectives in the crime scene unit, um, which indicates they've uh, found either additional bodies or uh, major evidence. Do we know? Uh, things, are, uh, things are jumping there now. Do we know which building? Uh, in Battery Park City, the, uh, the police helicopter pilot uh, described it in detail uh, as uh, the one with uh, a, uh, a brass roof um, at the corner of Battery Park City, and uh, they've notified the fire department, which is certainly stressed enough right now to respond there and uh, deal with it as a high-rise fire. And presumably they're all evacuated at this point. Uh, from that building, this fire has just broken out minutes ago. Um, so I'm not sure if Battery Park City, those are residential buildings for the most part. Uh, that may not be the case. Uh, All right, let's... Your mic is turned off. I just got a sign saying your mic is turned off. I hope they heard you through my microphone. Okay. But, but okay. just one more. They did hear you through my microphone, so that's good. Let's go back to Don Daylow because you were talking about the rescues down at the site, and I believe he's with some of the men who made those rescues. Don. That's right, Diana. I I'm here with the Nassau County Emergency Services people who are actually in that part of the wreckage. They are the ones who recovered, rescued the police officer who was in there. With me is Mitch Durler. You were actually in the hole with them, correct? Yes. Can you describe what you saw and what kind of condition he's in? Uh, the, well, the person, uh, the aide, was in uh, very good condition. Um, the uh, New York City uh, Emergency Service uh, medic and uh, the doctor uh, kept him in great shape um, all through the night. Uh, with medications and keeping his IV, giving him IV and keeping you know his uh, vitals in good condition. How did you find him? What kind of an area was he in? Uh, it was just a, a long uh, confined area. There were pipes and concrete all around him. And from what I understand, originally he was buried up to his chest area. And uh, New York City Emergency, uh, New York City Fire Department, and we came to also support them and join the operation, and we're able to dig him out. But it was a joint operation with everybody, uh, not solely us, not solely uh, the fire department. New York City uh, Mer Emergency Service uh, was in there, as they always are, and uh, they did a great job, and everybody dug this, this guy out. The, the joint efforts have been amazing to see from, from this end. How did you find him? Was he conscious when, when he you got him? He was conscious. Uh, he was talking to us. He knew his name. Uh, he knew where he lived, uh, how many kids he had, and uh, he was communicating the whole time to us. Great. You know, he was just a little uncomfortable being, uh, at the time when I got to him, he was only pinned by his feet, so we had to dig around his feet. And You dug around. Were there anything like the large metal beams that we've uh, seen over in this area? Well, it was, uh, basically, he was, there was uh, all rock and concrete around him and big metal, uh, uh, pipes and beams, and we had to work our way over them and try to uh, just reach and dig them out. And eventually, uh, myself and then the other two uh, New York City firemen we were able to uh, get webbing around him and uh, pull him out. And it was a great uh, joint operation by everybody. Diane, some of the many, many thousands of heroes who are working down here right now, and I'm sure all your families would be glad to see that you're all well, too. Thank you again very much. We all appreciate you. Diane, back to you. Okay, Don, thanks, and our salute to all of them as well. We're still with John Miller, who says he has some more information, and earlier, just in case you couldn't quite hear perfectly through Charlie's mic, you were telling us that another building is on fire. It's, it is, it's an apartment building? A, uh, a building in Battery Park City, which is high-rise buildings and, uh, and mostly residential. A uh, fire has broken out on the roof. A police helicopter patrolling the area reported uh, black smoke billowing. And then uh, he called in again to say that the fire was spreading rapidly and to have the fire department respond there. Obviously, that's an organization that's very stressed right now. In addition, <clears throat> and depleted. Um, at the scene, uh, they've called for uh, uh, crime scene investigators and 20 detectives to respond to Church and Day, which is on the, on the back side of the World Trade Center um, because they've recovered uh, either bodies or evidence. Um, not far from where, the, where this rescue was made uh, that the uh, Nassau County people were just talking about. And um, developments um, in the operational end of the investigation, before we get to the substance of it, uh, the FBI has left its New York office. Uh, they've split into three uh, quadrants, uh, one uh, team operating out of a garage, 
another uh, operating off of uh, a naval ship in the harbor, um, another team operating out of uh, some borrowed office space with the police department. Same with police headquarters, which at this time when you'd really need command and control from there, uh, they're operating off-site. All their phones are down, uh, their air conditioning because of the condition of lower Manhattan and, uh, and the problems with telephones from this explosion. So logistically, they're facing tremendous problems, although they seem to be getting through it. Uh, recapping the investigative developments in Venice, Florida, the FBI has conducted raids and executed a search warrant and uh, are searching for a man uh, named Mohammed Atta. This information, according to our investigative reporter, Brian Ross, who's been speaking to federal officials in Washington, they say at a, uh, a car rented uh, in Boca Raton, uh, they conducted a search and, uh, and found uh, uh, pictures of Osama bin Laden uh, in Boston. Uh, FBI agents investigating the backgrounds of five men in a rented car uh, found at Logan Airport where some of these flights emanated from, uh, including, uh, we are told from our sources, uh, flight instruction manuals in Arabic. Um, those five men believed to be uh, those who were the hijackers and killed in the explosions. Um, so there, there is, uh, they are picking up a trail now. The five uh, got to Boston, starting in Canada, right? Uh, it appears that they came to Boston from Maine, and the, and the the speculation or the information is, Maine is uh, of course the Canadian border, and um, that is a place uh, that, as Brian Ross said earlier, is a soft border and uh, one that they've had incursions through before uh, that they've documented. So they believe they came from Canada. So it moves that we know of at least in two fronts: one in Venice, Florida. Um, with this fellow Mohammed Atta and the other in Boston, where even we understand they took seats out of the Logan Airport where these fellows may have sat and uh, uh, to check, presumably, I guess, for any DNA that may be there. And, right. and from the rental car. And what's significant about them is uh, of the five, two are brothers and one is supposed to be a pilot. Uh, the inference there is that he could have uh, trained the hijacked team to fly. Sure. Let's get the news now from John McQuethy, who's at the Pentagon. Haven't heard from you in a while. John, what's new there? Uh, they are continuing to try to put out fires after all of this time, nearly 24 hours. There are still fires burning in the Pentagon. The lack of structural integrity in the damaged area has prevented the search and rescue people from being able to get in and look for any possible survivors. There is a makeshift morgue in the center courtyard of the Pentagon where they have laid out uh, uh, a lot of body bags, hundreds and hundreds of body bags uh, that have not yet been filled, but that may be in anticipation of things yet to come. They are compiling a list of the missing, which may eventually become the list of the dead. Uh, they do not know. Uh, they're reluctant to talk about the numbers of all of the people that are missing. Um, uh, operationally, they have uh, taken an aircraft carrier uh, that was heading home from the Persian Gulf and turned it around. They have canceled exercises in the Persian Gulf. All of that tells me that they are making their forces available should a military response be something that they want to uh, think about in the hours and days ahead. Um, just a very busy scene, a very sad scene over at the Pentagon. John. Uh, uh I know they've made a great point of saying the Pentagon will be open today for business. The president trying to emphasize that the city of Washington is operating, that they've not in any way, these terrorists, been able to curtail uh, the activities of government. But a lot of people, we understand, have been told to stay home from the Pentagon today. Uh, I guess those particularly who work in that area. Roughly half of the uh, Pentagon workforce is not going to be able to get in their offices, uh, Charlie. It is shut down because of damage and smoke, uh, but some fraction of them will. The Secretary of Defense's office is operational. The National Military Command Center is definitely operational. Uh, and the area that the press uh, has in the Pentagon will be open today. Uh, we anticipate there will be briefings from the regular Pentagon briefing room, all trying to give the appearance that they are open for business, and it is, but it is certainly not going to be business as usual. Uh, too many people lost too many friends. Uh, there is a pervading sense of anger among uh, military officers that we talk to. Um, they are not only sad, but really, really angry. And John, any sense that they're expecting anything else anywhere in the world today? 
Uh, there is no sense uh, that uh, the terrorist gun is still cocked and loaded, Diane, but uh, obviously with the measures that they have taken, uh, seizing the airspace around Washington uh, and New York, uh, using military aircraft to patrol the skies uh, and to monitor uh, all movement, uh, gives you some sense of, uh, of how nervous and how careful they feel they must be in the aftermath of this multiple attack. All right, John McCluffy at the Pentagon. Jack, thanks very much. Uh, we're going to go to Claire Shipman uh, just across the river in uh, Washington. Claire? Well, Charlie, it's not really business as usual in larger Washington either. Of course, it's not quite the same tragic scenes that we have here that you have in New York, but this nation's capital is recovering from quite a shock. Estimates are that it could be several hundred or more dead from that attack on the Pentagon. The streets around the White House have been reopened, but large numbers of police remain. 30 to 50 members of the National Guard are patrolling. F-16 still uh, flying overhead. We just saw one a few minutes ago. In the meantime, of course, the president is scheduled to meet with congressional leaders today, another show of unity and bipartisanship. Um, you probably heard he's going to set up a blood drive at the White House. We're told that he's very eager to be able to speak to the press in some way today, and he may choose to do that uh, during the blood drive, that he wants to be seen as, as quite active and not hiding behind closed doors. As the investigation unfolds here in Washington, there's another track that's going on. The president's security team and the nation's security team is looking at a number of large events that were scheduled to be held in this country in the coming weeks. The World Bank IMF meeting, which Washington, D.C. police and some of the security detail here in Washington believe should at a, at a minimum be postponed, if not moved to another country. They were expecting, as you know, huge demonstrations there. And also the U.N. General Assembly meeting in New York, we are told from sources that they are going to be discussing that today, that there are a number of people in secu the security team here in Washington who don't believe New York is equipped to handle that right now. They have a, quote, Plan B, which would be suggesting that perhaps be moved to another site either in this country or outside of this country, but ultimately, of course, that decision will be a political one as well and will be up to the president. Charlie? Yeah. All right, thanks very much. Claire Shipman uh, down in Washington. Appreciate it. We want to go to Boston now because, as we said before, there are families everywhere who do not consider this just a political story. This is a deeply personal story. We want to introduce you to Peter Gay to David Gay and to William Gay. Peter, you are the father of a son. Peter, tell me about him. Which flight was he on and what happened? He was on the flight 11 uh, and he was the first plane to hit the tower. Uh, other than that, I, I have no other information other than the verification that he was on that plane. And. You watched it on TV. How did you find out? Well, it was a long process. I uh, was listening to, to the radio, and I heard about the tower. But he always leaves on a Monday to Los Angeles. He works for Raytheon. He's an executive on Raytheon. He's been with them 25 years. And he's vice president, and they've given him an executive position. And he runs to, uh, to uh, California every Monday and comes back Friday night. Uh, this time, I, when I heard that, uh, the, and he always flies American Airline. When I heard that, that uh, about the thing on the radio, I, I just didn't assume that he was. This would be Tuesday, until my son David, who's sitting here, came in the house and said, "I got something to tell you." And said Peter was on that plane that hit the, airport, the hit the tower. David, how did you know? It's Charlie Gibson. How did you know? Uh, Charlie. Uh, we were, I was at my office and we were listening to the news as everybody was and uh, we, I knew because I had talked to my brother yesterday, uh, Monday, you know, uh, and he had stayed an extra day to do some uh, paperwork and to catch up some, on some things locally uh, and to do some work around the yard, so I knew he didn't leave on Monday. Um, I didn't know that he always flew American, but I did know he left early in the morning from Boston and once we realized that the plane had originated in Boston, uh, we surmised that it might have been his. I, I called Raytheon, spoke to his secretary, and she confirmed that that was the flight that he was programmed to be on. And, and knowing my brother, if he was supposed to be on a plane, he was going to be there and be on it. That's the way he was. William, so, William, tell me a little bit more about your bro. 
he doesn't have a mic, so he no, he doesn't. Oh, now. okay. I'm sorry. Well, you then you you, you talk for him, David. Okay. Uh, he was 54. He was uh, an engineer. Worked for Raytheon all his career, over 30 years. Uh, had a family of three children and a wife. Uh, he was a very dedicated uh, person. He was he was an energetic person. He was a precise person. I think most engineers are. Uh, everything that he, that he did, he did precisely and correctly and very efficiently. Uh, he enjoyed sports. Uh, he enjoyed his family. Uh, we obviously are all going to miss him uh, tremendously, uh, but we share with the rest of the country and and what's happened to our to the United States and to thousands and thousands of people, many of whom we still don't even know in those buildings in New York. And Mr. Well, I, I I was listening to you uh, while we we're waiting to come on this program this morning and. And, and when I hear that there were knives used and that they might have got the stewardess first, let me tell you, boy, Peter, Peter would have jumped out of that chair and went for that guy, I'm damn sure. And maybe he was knifed down also because there was some story about someone calling on a cell phone saying that there was some stabbing going on. He was such an efficient man, such a good boy. Mr. Gay and... David and William, I think everybody admires so much your sense of your sense of valor and patriotism in a moment like this. And again, all we can say is our sadness and our gratitude to you for being with us this morning. Thank I'm, you. Thank you very I, just, much. Just before you go, I'm I'm curious, and I, I we need to move on. But but I am curious. I know your thoughts very personally of the family or of your son and your brother. Right. But there's an anger in this country that we've talked a lot about this morning, and and I wonder if you feel how you feel. Yeah, about I that. have it. I have it. I served in World War II. I tell you, if I was a young man today, I'd tell the president I'd be the first one to go over there. Somebody's got to pay for this. I, I, being a lawyer, I, I, I share in that sense, but I also would like to see them brought to justice if that's possible. If that's not possible and it can't be done in our justice system, then something, I agree with my father, something has to be done to stop this type of terrorism. Well, you speak so nicely about your son and about your brother. And well, I, I have seven of them. I have seven. And, and I, they, no son should go before the father. That is for sure. That is for sure. There is nothing more tragic than a parent burying a child. Peter Gay. If we get a if we get a body, Charlie, I don't even know if we'll get a body. Well, that's that's true. That's true. That's okay. true. David, William, yes. Peter, all the best. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. And as I say, they do speak very well. The, the son and the brother. I'm sort of amazed at the ability of these families, not just to think of their own grief, but to be thinking about the country and and. I guess what they want to make sure that everybody still stands for in this country at mm. the same time. Mm. It's hard to do. John Miller uh, is here again. I've been reporting on the investigation uh, through the morning and all day yesterday uh, as well. We've been talking about the fact that the FBI has a lead on five people who came uh, from Canada into Portland, Maine, rented a car there, apparently went down to Boston and uh, may have been involved in the hijackings of the two planes that were taken. Um, out of Boston, the two planes that hit the World Trade Center uh, towers. And you have some lead as to how the FBI got onto these fellas? Um, it was uh, basic detective work. They were able to obtain very quickly the manifest from the airlines, uh, go over the names, and uh, then run names through their databases looking for any connections or intelligence links there. I don't know if they reached any. Uh, they were also able to match information from the flight attendant on one flight who gave uh, the seat number of one of the hijackers, which gave them uh, additional, um, additional information on one individual, and then scanned the airport parking lots for uh, cars after checking with the rental companies to see if there was a vehicle attached to that, and they were able to zero in on this rent-a-car. Um, this story uh, was first reported in the Boston Herald, and uh, we've been able to confirm parts of it uh, through this morning. Yes, and I know ABC's Brian Ross has been checking on this uh, same story about how uh, the FBI got onto the uh, to the five people, um, the five uh, Arabs who were uh, in Boston. And Brian is coming over here, even as we speak. 
And uh, Brian's information, uh, his first in information this morning, centered on uh, a different end of this in Florida, where the FBI uh, is searching for another man and executed additional warrants. What did you learn? Well, in Florida this morning, they went to the home uh, based on the identification of a car and found that the uh, Muhammad Adi uh, did not live there, had never lived there. In Florida. In Florida, Florida. and uh, owned by a man who lived there for 10 years, but who happens to be an employee at the local airport. So they're trying to figure out the leads are on that. As well, in Boston, authorities are telling us this morning that they have now determined that it must have been a very significant cell of these five people in Boston who they have now traced through whatever they found in the car as having been at the airport again and again over the last few months, uh, apparently casing it out, uh, looking for security, looking for weaknesses, and that they had gone back and forth between uh, Boston and Portland, Maine, and sending a large contingent of agents into Portland, Maine. But they consider this a serious cell. Uh, that was operating there for some time. Uh, one of the leads on these men came because the five men got into dispute in the parking garage with someone who, when he saw the developments, called the state police and said, I think this may be a connection. And that led them apparently to the car in the parking garage. In Boston? In Boston. So that, so that, dispute, that dispute would have been yesterday? That dispute would have been yesterday morning, some sort of fight over the uh, parking space. So, the, so in Florida, the person worked at the airport and, and Needless to say, we draw absolutely no conclusion of any kind Not from at all. that. From the beginning, we have wondered whether they went through security in a regular way, or whether they had some sort of special access, but nothing new from your end on that, John? No, and from the type of weapons that passengers are describing them using, um, it's the kind of stuff that you really could get through airline security uh, with very little effort. No, I Knives or um, box cutters and plastic sheaths, uh, w which is the way you can buy uh, many of them. You could even have that on your person and not set off a metal detector. Standing by, we have Joe Alba, who is director of FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and Bernadine Healy. And Bernadine Healy is also with us, head of the Red Cross. But Joe, let me uh, talk to you first. Uh, first of all, what can FEMA do in, uh, in in the present situation? Well, what we're doing right right now, Charlie, is to make sure that uh, uh, all the resources of the federal government are brought to bear. I've, I've spoken with um, Governor Pataki, Governor Gilmore, Mayor Giuliani, and um, we're making sure that all the urban, res re urban search and rescue teams that uh, we need are present in New York City. I activated eight teams to come to New York City last night or this morning, four to the D.C. area. We have 28 teams nationwide that are part of our national system. There are folks that are still alive in the rubble, and we're going to do our best to make sure they have the resources locally to find those folks. Joe, the mayor said that this is going to be a search effort and a, and a, uh, a cleaning effort and a crime scene search that's going to last weeks and perhaps months. Uh, and that's an enormous commitment of resources. These teams are going to be on site for some time, and I can't imagine uh, first of all, the physical effort and the psychological effort that's going to be required over that length of time. It is a tremendous effort, Charlie. Um, what we have to be focused on after about uh, 36, 48 hours for those USAR members as well as uh, law enforcement and, and fire department officials from New York City is that they get the proper rest and they get the proper uh, counseling after being in close quarters finding individuals left and right. We have individuals that will be coming into New York we're leaving those folks, making sure that they get the needed rest. This is a tremendous task, not only here in Washington at the Pentagon, but in New York City especially. I'll be briefing Congress later on this morning as to what specifically we're doing, what we need to do, and then I'll be coming to New York City this afternoon. All right. Thank you a lot, Joe Alba. We're going to turn now, as Charlie said, to Dr. Bernadine Healy, who is director of the Red Cross. Dr. Healy, we hear people are lining up all over the country to give blood. Is the Red Cross ready to receive it? Well, we have been expanding our phlebotomy and, uh, and drawing capability as we speak, uh, bringing in uh, volunteers uh, and training them on the spot, people who have experience in, in drawing blood. Uh, obviously, our role is at the level of making sure we have adequate blood. We've been shipping thousands of units of uh, blood into New York uh, over the course of the past 24 hours. Uh, we also, of course, are responsible for mass care along and under FEMA's direction under the Federal Emergency Response Plan, and that means mainly at this point helping the rescue workers in terms of shelter, food, cots, uh, so that they can keep doing their life-saving work. Uh, we also have activated our air incident team, our air response team for airline crashes. We have never had to deal with four airplane crashes at one time. 
uh, and they are activated in Johnstown, uh, in uh, New York, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, across the country, wherever there are families who have uh, victims who perished in those flights. So is this the biggest disaster that you know the Red Cross has dealt with? This is the biggest disaster that we have ever dealt with. We have been preparing for weapons of mass destruction in coordination with our colleagues in local, state, and federal government over the past several years. We have a weapons of mass destruction plan. This is the first time we have ever had to deal with it, and this is 10 hurricanes and five earthquakes put together in terms of the kind of national mobilization that we will need. Uh, Diane, one of the things we do is mental health counseling, and I think we have to understand that when these, thi these things occur, it is not just the immediate victims. The whole nation is watching and is, is uh, facing depression, the emotional response. The American Red Cross has a major mental health counseling program in all of our chapters, and we are prepared to deal with the aftermath across the country, uh, people who are watching and who are realizing what this means to them and to their families and to their communities. So I just want to go back to the beginning again. What are you saying now to everyone sitting at home who thinks, I want to give blood? Are you saying, go ahead, get in your car, go? What no, what I'm saying is that they need to call and get scheduled. We will be needing blood over a period of time. We also have been building up what we call our disaster, national disaster reserve. Uh, and uh, we both freeze blood as well as keep a liquid inventory, obviously. Uh, and we have to replenish the stocks that are being used as we speak. And what people have to do is call in and get scheduled. We don't need to take everybody in the next hour. Uh, over the next several weeks, we will ask people to come in, call in now, get scheduled, and keep those appointments. All right. Thanks very much, Dr. Healy. I appreciate your being with us um, very much. I, I just want to run down, because so many things were closed yesterday, and, and I want to run down some of the situations in various parts uh, of the country today. Uh, for instance, here in New York, bridges uh, and tunnels from New Jersey to Manhattan remain uh, closed. Uh, New Jersey commuters have to reach New York via train uh, today. Amtrak is running a normal schedule throughout the country. The Port of Los Angeles is reopened. Most New York subways are in service. The stock markets, as you see there, remain closed. There will be limited postal uh, deliveries and a lot of the delivery services, obviously, the FedExes and whatever, haven't been able to operate because uh, the plane system in America has been shut down. Schools in some major cities, including New York, still closed. Uh, Los Angeles schools are going to open, but some other cities are closed. Uh, city, federal, and state courts in New York are going to be closed. The U.S.-Mexican border, uh, the crossings between San Diego and Tijuana are on high alert, but they are now open. Uh, things like the Grand Coulee Dam in Washington, lockdown, tours canceled, visitor center closed. Uh, tourist attractions in New York, like the Empire State Building and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, closed. Most of the amusement parks at Disney World, Disneyland, uh, had closed down yesterday. They'll be reopening. The Universal Studios reopening. The Sears Tower in Chicago. A lot of people concerned about tall buildings in so many cities. The Sears Tower in Chicago are going to reopen. The New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ Stock Market, American Stock Exchange closed uh, today. The entire lower part of New York City uh, closed down. Major League Baseball has again postponed all games. They hadn't postponed games since 1944. Called off yesterday's games. They're calling off today's games as well. The college football commissioners are considering postponing the weeks, the weekend's entire schedule to be played on Thursday, Friday, uh, and Saturday. The National Football League is considering postponing its games. And then things like, uh, you know, what, what does Jay Leno say that could be appropriate? There's nothing really that you, you can't joke about anything these days. Nobody has a feeling really uh, at the moment of levity. Uh, he, he, for instance, has, has suspended the tapings of his show for the entire week. It's just a note of how people feel, I think. Emmy Awards scheduled to be broadcast Sunday uh, have been uh, uh, postponed indefinitely. And uh, obviously people are very concerned because they have relatives or friends who are stranded in various parts around the country. People concerned about commercial air traffic restrictions at airports nationwide. They're in effect at least until noon today, but we don't have solid word as to whether the planes are going to be flying again. John Nance is joining us, our aviation expert out in uh, Washington. And John, I, uh, we're waiting for official word from the FAA, but uh, there's a lot of practical problems to getting the planes back in the air again. Yeah, there really are, Charlie. One of the things is we've got to know precisely, and I mean precisely, how these people did this, because it was replicated four different times. If we don't know exactly what they did and how they did it, which may be fairly simple, then we don't have the way to harden the system up immediately to make sure there is no possibility of a repetition. John, I wanted to ask you about the report from Lisa Stark earlier, because we were, we were stunned at the level of sophistication that might enable hijackers to know exactly how to go about disabling 
this hijack reference call, this coded call that pilots can make. What does that say to you? Well, you see, the, the transponder is what we're talking about there, is in the term I think you all used before, and Lisa did too. Uh, the transponder, we normally put numbers in, uh, in accordance with what air traffic control gives us. It gives us the opportunity, though, to give special codes if we are in an emergency situation or radio failure or hijacking, and the hijacking code is the one she mentioned. The fact that they did not get that in there, uh, but the transponder might still be operating, would simply say that the pilot wasn't able to do that before he or she was incapacitated, or it wasn't safe to do that because somebody was watching. If the transponder was actually turned off, and that's what I believe the situation was here, at least in three of the aircraft situations, maybe in all four, then it was an affirmative act. And that goes right along with what I've been saying all day yesterday, was this had to be pilots trained specifically to fly these airplanes. Maybe not with, with a type rating, maybe not trained to the same level as a professional pilot, but trained enough so that they knew what to do in that cockpit and how to do it. So anything you're hearing this morning, any of the new detail telling you whether or not you think in any case the hijackers had control of the controls or whether they were simply coercing pilots? Oh, I, they, they were no way they were going to coerce a pilot after a certain point, Diane. Uh, basically, they might have coerced at the beginning in terms of fly in this direction, fly in that direction, with no indication to the pilots, to the crew, what their evil intent was going to be. Once that became known, if it became known at all, then uh, that's where you're going to have a fight in the cockpit because none of us would ever do anything like that. You, know, so I, you I, struggle for it. I, everybody was talking about that yesterday, and, and I just, I will never believe that an American pilot, a commercial airline pilot, would ever, ever do that. He would take his plane down before he would fly it into a target with that kind of loss of life that he would know would occur. Charlie, you fight. You just fight to the death. I mean, exactly. because you're going to die anyway if you do what they're telling you to. And we have a great sense in airline piloting of not only keeping the folks on board our aircraft safe, but we're talking about the folks on the ground, too. And we really have a great sense of that. It's instilled in us. You wouldn't want to do that, and, you know, that it would just be a to heck with you, we're going to struggle it out right here situation. Wouldn't want Which, to do that, wouldn't want to do that, and wouldn't do it. I don't, I can't no. believe for a minute that a, that a pilot would. So they had to have controls of those planes. Before we let you go, I want to ask you one other question, though. What kind of expertise or sophistication, John, you're a commercial pilot yourself. Yeah. What kind of, of proficiency, I guess, is what I'm asking, would be required of someone to be able to fly the plane that precisely? that you could hit the World Trade Center the way they did or hit the Pentagon the way they did? Well, Charlie, two things here. Number one, and, and Peter was asking me this yesterday too, and, and really it comes down to this. If you could fly a Cessna 172, Cessna 150, you could manipulate the controls on an aircraft like this and once it was in the air and probably figure out the throttles and, and get someplace close to your target. But if you're a terrorist planning such an evil act as this, not one, two, but three, but four of them, in other words, you want to hit this building twice, you want to hit the Pentagon, you want to hit something else, you don't want to take any chances that the pilots that you put in there are not going to be successful on the first pass. So you're going to train these people. You're going to train them specifically for a 757 and a 767. And there's a great suspicion in my mind that the reason that we see 757s and 767s is because they're the only two planes with what we call a common type rating. If you're trained in one, you're automatically trained in the other and licensed for it. John, last question for you. We heard Lisa say earlier that there are reports this morning, of course, that that the hijackers lured the pilots out of the cockpit by attacking the flight attendants in the back of the plane. I just wonder what the rule is when that happens. I guess I would have thought that immediately the cockpit would seal off, and as terrible as it would be, you wouldn't let the pilots be lured out. We don't have any hard and fast rules, Diane. I don't believe any airline does that says, okay, if this, then that, in regards to somebody holding your flight attendants hostage or hurting your flight attendants or hurting your passengers back there. But one of the problems when we went down from a three-person to a two-person crew was you lost your ability to send a crew member back and still have two up there in the front. And so it's, it's a much more gamey situation to send a pilot back when there's a problem in the back, especially one that might involve uh, hijackers or takeover of the, air, of the airplane. I would say that this is a, a lesser probability than the probability that the hijackers merely burst through the door and killed both pilots in place. But they may have used different techniques. And then certainly it is possible that you could lure one out, so to speak, by threatening the flight attendants in the back. Well, as we say, uh, 
they knew what they were doing because if they were able to turn the transponders oh, yeah. off and able to prevent the pilots from sending what is a very simple uh, signal which alerts air traffic controllers that there's a hijacking in place, if they were able to prevent that, they had a lot of sophistication about how those planes uh, operated. And uh, the scenes that those pilots must have gone through, John, I, I, I know it must sicken oh. you and it, it does everybody Charlie, else. Charlie, it's a matter of perspective. I mean, you know, it's hard for me even to think about the perspective of the fact that you and I, uh, Diane, you and I too, will sit here sometimes and talk about a terrible airline crash. Fortunately, it's been nice and quiet for the last year, but we'll, we'll be talking about one. We had four yesterday, and yet that just absolutely fails in comparison with what was accomplished by using those marvelous machines as flying bombs. Right. Uh, this will forever change our perspective of, uh, of that. Yes, and a point that was made a number of times yesterday, it was eventually not the planes slamming into those two trade center towers, it was the fire that they occasioned that eventually brought the buildings down. I say eventually, within an, uh, just about an hour in each case. Uh, the stress of that kind of fire and the heat that was generated was just too much for the building structurally to to withstand and and when you're talking about the fact that these planes were cross-country planes that had just taken off uh, yeah. from Boston headed for the west coast they had what how many gallons of, uh, of jet fuel on board uh, around uh, close to 10,000 gallons for the 757 close to 14,000 gallons for the 767 that's not precise but it's in that general vicinity burned that down about a thousand for the way the distance they traveled but that too had to be by design Charlie and on top of that uh, you know, I didn't know until yesterday. I'm not, a, I'm not a structural guy for buildings, but I didn't know that the way to bring down a building like this was to fly something in at an upper level and create a heck of a fire like that. I, I would have thought that you'd blow it from the bottom. So these people knew exactly what to do, how to do it, and they set this thing up with incredible precision. Yes. Uh, there wasn't anything casual about this operation. And with that amount of jet fuel, temperatures in those upper floors, 15, 16,000 degrees, they talked about. We're going to go, thanks very much, John Nance, who's out Thank in you. Seattle. We'll talk to you again, John. Uh, let's go to London. ABC's Ted Koppel uh, is there. Ted, can you hear me? I can, Charlie. I, I've been sitting here absolutely riveted for the last couple of hours. I, I made a note before when Dr. Healy from the, from the Red Cross said the whole nation is watching. You need to know, and I, I realize how caught up you sometimes get in the coverage, the whole world is watching. Uh, anyone with access to a television set is, is watching and listening and just riveted to what's going on. Yeah, it, it is amazing. Uh, Peter talked about this a little bit last night, and Ted, you know it well, but I, I got a call last night from a friend who said I was in Peru uh, with Secretary Powell on his trip, and I was watching your show in Lima, and that's how I found out what was going on. And you, you realize what a a tight community this world is when something like this goes on and when we simply gather around to share information with one another. It has become a tight community, Charlie. You're exactly right. Uh, Tony Blair, the British Prime Minister, held a press conference, I guess, about an hour and a half or two hours ago. Uh, and first of all, he announced that he was calling back the, uh, the British Parliament, which has been on recess and was not supposed to come back until the middle of October. Uh, but he used the occasion to make a point that I think is worth making not only from the British perspective but from all countries and that is among those tens of thousands of people who were in those twin towers inevitably there were some British, some French, some German, some Japanese people from all over the world are there uh, so that you, you truly do have a situation in which uh, as Prime Minister Blair put it this was an attack uh, on the entire free and democratic process of the of of every country in the world. Ted, I'm interested in your reaction. I people know you obviously as the host of Nightline, and and you will be forever identified in people's mind as such. But, but before that, you covered the State Department, and we were talking to Secretary of State Powell a little bit earlier in the morning. There's going to be a period of time in which we identify, try to identify who's responsible for this, and then the question of what kind of response is appropriate. And government leaders that we have talked about today have talked about very measured and very moderate response. But this country is angry. It is so angry at what has happened and how symbols to this country have been defiled and so many people obviously dead. So I wonder how you feel the international community will react and, and what, what is really appropriate response and how long the political will will last in this country. 
That is indeed a, a key question, and you're right. I mean, Charlie, when I say I've been listening to you guys all morning, you and Diane, I, I really have. I've been sitting here for hours listening to you, uh, and I must tell you, absolutely fascinated with each new development that you learn. But there was one small thing that Secretary, former Secretary of Defense William Cohen said. You were talking about the, the measured response. And he kind of slipped it in, and I think it got past all of us there for a moment, but I did make a note of it. He was talking about the various responses, and among them he said, potentially even nuclear. And I thought, whoa, uh, you know, if in fact they do discover, and, and remember now what the president was saying last night, uh, that the United States is going to be holding countries which harbor these terrorists as responsible as the terrorists themselves, that a former Secretary of Defense would even breathe that as an alternative, as a possibility, I thought was just stunning. Yes, I must admit it went right by me. I didn't hear him say it. Uh, well, we'd better check the tape. I'd, no, I'd, 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 I'd hate to be wrong on that, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty he sure he said it. it. I, I, I yeah. just say, he, uh, if he did, yes, that is, it, it is stunning that somebody who has held that position would even raise that possibility. Ted, I wanted the, to ask uh, you to, excuse me, but we're, we may have a chance soon to talk to King Abdullah of Jordan, and I just wanted to get a sense from you of the perspective overseas. We all watched those scenes of Palestinians in Nablus and other places cheering, celebrating, and it is a deep-seated, visceral reaction in this country. Give us your vantage point. What does it look like from there? Well, I must say, on the one hand, and, and I hope this is not misunderstood, um, I almost understand what happened with some of those Palestinians, and I hope that that reaction is not is is not just universally broadcast over the entire arab world there has been a feeling of such frustration in the arab world for many years particularly among uh palestinians that this gives them a sense of a greater power perhaps than they have ever known before but is that reflected in the larger arab world i cannot believe that it is and i'm sure if and when you speak to king abdullah that will be the point that he wants to make above any and all others well i think we're going to do that just now and I believe if we have our satellite working, we have with us now His Majesty King Abdullah of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Let me see if we can get the picture up. Your Majesty, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you very much. I want to turn to the question I was just raising with Ted Koppel. We did watch in this country those scenes of celebration by Palestinians in various places in the Middle East. How are Americans to react except with horror and anger? Well, ma'am, I believe that uh, we were equally horrified by uh, what we saw on the television in the past uh, several hours. But again, I, I sincerely believe that uh, those that were demonstrating or celebrating are a very, very uh, select few individuals that uh, are really no reflection on uh, the Palestinian people and the rest of the Arab world. Um, and um, uh, obviously uh, anybody who condones uh, violence or is, uh, is, is, sees joy on, on, on seeing uh, innocent people uh, being hurt uh, and uh, maimed or killed, uh, there must be something terribly wrong with them. But there's definitely not a reflection of uh, the people of the Middle East and uh, it completely defies the principles of the three monotheistic religions, uh, including Islam. Your Majesty, I'd also like to ask you about what Secretary of State Colin Powell said to us this morning, that yes, there will be a brand new kind of response now to what has happened, but he said key to it is the reaction of the moderate Arabic states in the Middle East, and that, of course, means Jordan. If the United States decides to retaliate in Afghanistan on the Taliban, who are the, the harborers of Osama bin Laden, not just Osama bin Laden. Will you support that action? Well, I think uh, that the question is, is that um, for many years now, there's been a call by the international community to work closer together uh, to combat terrorism. And uh, I don't think we've been as efficient as we should have been, uh, as awful as, uh, as the events were yesterday. Uh, I'm sure that after the Americans deliberate and, and look at their uh, um, um, uh, the possibilities that they have ahead of them to, to be able to um, uh, punish those that were responsible for the crimes. 
uh, I think the United States and the international community will come together once and for all to try and rid uh, the world of this menace. But there is a, an angry nation here in the United States, and, and I, I do wonder Absolutely. what is going to happen with the moderate Arab states, your country, uh, your majesty, Egypt, uh, for instance, if there is U.S. military retaliation. Well, again, I think you have to understand, and, and your government can um, explain it better than we can, that um, uh, many of the Arab countries have been working over the past many years uh, together in combating terrorism, uh, Jordan in particular. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a responsibility that uh, we all have. And uh, we will continue to uh, work with our friends, uh, especially the Americans, uh, during this crisis. Uh, to make sure that uh, they get the necessary support. So would you assist in military action? Well, uh, Jordan is a very small country. Um, uh, I, I presume that the Americans are, are far more capable of being able to uh, take their objections themselves, but um, there is an international network uh, of uh, intelligence organizations that work together to combat terrorism, and Jordan has been uh, um, a great provider of being able to work uh, within that system. Your Majesty, just before we let you go, just in a practical note, you were on your way to the United States yesterday, right? When uh, this occurred and your plane had to turn back? Y yes, sir. We were halfway over the Atlantic when we, we heard the terrible news. Uh, part of, uh, of me wanted to, to continue to the United States to uh, send moral support to, 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 to uh, um, the American people, but we understood that obviously the government and the federal agencies would be so busy with the, the sadness of what has uh, taken place. and. Uh, really, this tragic event, just uh, we join the international community in extending the sorrow and grief that uh, we all feel towards the American people, and in particular, uh, the families of the victims uh, of this uh, horrible, horrible uh, travesty that we witnessed yesterday. And understanding that, Your Majesty, when Americans talk about the fact that this is war, when the U.S. government talks about the fact that this is war and a whole new level of terrorism, what would you say to the American people about what they should now expect from terrorists around the world is is it a brand new era that you see beginning yesterday the, the fight between uh, the international community and uh, international terrorism uh, has been going on for for decades uh, and uh, uh, for the most part um, we have to give credit to uh, the international uh, intelligence agencies for the tremendous work they've been doing uh, it's, a, it's an, uh, a battle that goes on every single day. Um, and you have to imagine that sooner or later the laws of averages are going to catch up with you and uh, um, the terrorists are going to win. Um, now you have to pick yourself up, as difficult as that is, dust yourself off and take the fight back to them again. Um, and we all have the, the moral resolve to, to make sure that we can rid uh, our uh, world of this menace. Um, and you just have to be determined. We have to hunker down. Um, and it's going to be a tough struggle because I think now uh, there will be a move by the international community to be a lot more serious about uh, combating this phenomenon. His Majesty, King Abdullah, again, we are so grateful to you for joining us this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we should point out to everyone that, first of all, the Kingdom of Jordan does have a majority Palestinian population, but throughout the years, we want to add that Jordan has been a great friend of the United States and in some very complicated situations, including the Gulf War. But George Stephanopoulos is here because you've got more news. Yeah, there's some various reports coming in on a number of fronts. Number one, ABC's Chris Vlasto has learned that the FBI knows that there were three hijackers on the plane that crashed into the Pentagon, and they actually know the names of the hijackers. Of course, they're not releasing them, but they're saying they have identified who the hijackers are. That was the American Flight 77 that had taken off from Dulles. Uh, a 757 taken off from Dulles that was headed for Los Angeles and apparently circled sometime before, before it came back going into the in, Pentagon. Exactly. Right. They know the names. They That's know the names. Yeah. Secondly, Governor Angus King of Maine has confirmed the two suspects in the attack on the World Trade Center flew to Boston through Portland International Airport in Maine, which helps confirm some of the other information we've been getting overnight. And they were apparently using New Jersey driver's licenses. So we're getting bits and pieces of information from, from lots of different places this morning. Finally, on, on another note, former President Bush yesterday was, was flying to Minnesota, and he was forced to land in Wisconsin, was grounded in Wisconsin after the initial attacks. The FAA did that for security reasons. This was released by Governor Jeb Bush of, of Florida, and they are now not saying 
where President Bush is for security reasons right now. Remember back in 1993, Maybe former... Somebody just heard that quickly, for security reasons, they're not telling you where President Bush is. You're talking about former, former President, President Bush, right. exactly. Father Bush. Bush. Number 41, right, okay. as they say in the White House. And remember, there was an assassination attack against uh, former President Bush back in 1993. So for security reasons, he was grounded yesterday, now is in a secure location. And then finally, in a press conference overseas, the head of the Chancellor Minister of Germany, has said that German intelligence agencies agree with France, Britain, and Israel that Saudi, um, that Osama bin Laden was probably behind these attacks. They caution them. They have no hard evidence, but all of these intelligence agencies have consulted, and they say the signs are pointing towards Osama bin Laden. Which reminds me that we haven't heard directly from Saddam Hussein of Iraq. However, Iraqi newspapers were reported earlier this morning to be saying, and of course they are his mouthpieces, to be saying that the United States simply got what it deserved. Yeah, and we've seen some other indications in, in our worlds of that kind of, of reaction, but as you saw, King Abdullah is trying to tamp that down in his, in his discussions here in the United States. Did you read anything into what he said about whether or not the moderate Arab states would go along well, it was, with support it was, U.S. military action? It was very interesting. Obviously, he, want, he didn't want to answer the question directly, but everything he said was true. Jordan is a very small state and wouldn't be able to contribute too much in, with military forces. On the other hand, they can do a great deal with intelligence sharing. Remember, during the Gulf War, they were in a tricky situation, and they often face a, a, a dilemma of whether or not to really close off their borders or to provide something of a black market to Iraq. And I think that's where he'll see some additional pressure, not only on supporting military action, but will he really go along with tight economic sanctions, the kinds that former Secretary William Cohen was talking about earlier. All right, thanks very much, George Stephanopoulos. It is 9 o'clock here on the East Coast, 6 o'clock for you out in California, just waking up and joining us. And we want to reset to give you some sense of exactly what the situation is this morning at this hour. People joining us as the uh, morning progresses. The rescue effort and uh, is going on here in New York. It's, it, we, how long it'll be a rescue effort, we, we don't know. We hope, obviously, the mayor has said that, uh, that they hope to find more people. They had contact with some people who were in the rubble, and five firemen, one policeman, were rescued uh, today uh, there in New York City. Uh, and the massive amounts of equipment that are going to be necessary to clear this rubble away have been brought in uh, to New York. They have uh, a really about a five to six story high pile of rubble to go through where each of those World Trade Centers were. There is another fire uh, that has been ignited on a uh, building in Battery City Park. That is from debris that apparently was burning that blew onto the roof of a building there. You see smoke on our live pictures here in New York City. The fire department of New York, which is stretched to the limit and is also depleted by the number of people that they lost, having to respond to still another blaze in the downtown uh, area of New York. And that new fire is an apartment building, and our John Miller was saying he could not confirm that everyone had been evacuated from it, but needless to say, they they will be as quickly as possible, well, but it's a, very worrying news. It was a fire that just broke out uh, this morning. We got some fatality numbers uh, from the mayor of New York when he was with us about two hours ago. Uh, they're the latest that we have. He said 41 civilian bodies had been found so far, and as Don Daler reported early in the morning, there's the horrible and macabre sight of semi-tractor trailers uh, sitting outside the search area. Uh, bodies to be loaded on those as they are found, but 41 civilian bodies <clears throat> so far. The mayor also said that 202 firefighters at that time were missing. Now, as we point out, five firefighters have been found in the last couple of hours, and that may reduce that number some, but it's a horrifying number. That would be about half of the first 400 firefighters who responded uh, to the emergency at the World Trade Center towers yesterday, uh, lost in, uh, in the collapse of the buildings, and among those firefighters missing uh, and I would suppose have to be presumed dead, are some of the highest officials of the New York Fire Department. Uh, also, 57 other uniformed officers, he said, uh, that being New York City Police and Port Authority Police also missing. And then there's the 266 dead that we know were on the four planes that had been hijacked. And intermittently, you saw their pictures from overnight of that ghost town, that skeletal ghost town, which is what remains of that one of the World Trade Center towers. I also want to replay for everyone who may be just joining us out on the West Coast the new tape that we have of the actual crash into the buildings. We now have home video of the crash into the first World Trade Center tower. 
This is American the, Flight 11. 11. <coughs> That's the, they're actually, both of the flights are out of Boston, but this is American Flight 11 hitting that first tower. And when we went on the air here, just moments after that had occurred, we didn't know what had hit the building. Don Daler, who had been right nearby, reported that he heard a whine. It sounded like a missile or an airplane going into the building. The damage was so great that it obviously didn't look like some small bomb had hit. And then this is the second airplane. That's United Flight 175, again, a 767, hitting the second tower 18 minutes later at three minutes after nine, just exactly 24 hours ago. That is the second flight hitting the second tower, and the precision with which it came in is really terrifying. Now, the investigation. Uh, John Miller and Brian Ross have been reporting through the morning that the FBI is moving in a number of areas. There have been warrants executed and uh, searches executed in Florida, particularly in the Venice, Florida area, although the particular person they were looking for, apparently they did not have the correct house. And in Boston, there have been a number of people who have been identified uh, as having been at the Logan Airport. Five people specifically having been identified at the Logan Airport. And we're going to go to Ron Claiborne, who is standing by in Boston. Ron Claiborne, are you there? I'm here, Charlie. Uh, some of this information we are getting is, in fact, consistent with what uh, George Stephanopoulos was just telling us, information he had received. Uh, uh, sources are telling ABC News that at least five suspects identified as Arab men uh, have been identified as suspects in the two hijackings that originated here at Logan Field. And these sources are also telling us that uh, the hijackers were armed with box cutters or some kind of makeshift knife with a plastic handle, and that they began attacking and or killing flight attendants as a way to lure the pilots out of the cockpit. And they're not saying how exactly these five or more suspects were distributed over those uh, two flights, United 175 and American 11, which left uh, Logan uh, just about 24 hours ago. But they say suspects, at least five of them, have been identified. Uh, meanwhile, a automobile, a vehicle, a rental car, a Mitsubishi Mirage was found in a Logan Airport parking lot late last night, and it is believed that that vehicle was being driven uh, by at least some of these suspects. And we're getting further information about that. The Boston Herald is reporting that uh, of those suspects, that they believe one of them was a trained pilot. And, again, consistent with what George uh, was saying just a few minutes ago, uh, that some of these suspects flew to Boston early Tuesday morning from Portland and that they had entered this country from Canada. And further, the Boston Globe, the other newspaper here, uh, is reporting today that, uh, that the suspects who were on that flight from Portland to Boston had checked uh, baggage that was supposed to continue on to one of those ill-fated flights, but the luggage did not make it onto those flights, and that authorities have that luggage in their possession, which uh, the Globe is reporting includes uh, a edition of the Koran, in, an instructional video on how to fly a commercial airplane, and a fuel consumption calculator. Charlie? All right. Thanks very much, Ron Claiborne. And, and Brian Ross, uh, just to... Uh, Further, the information that Ron Claiborne mentioned there, Brian Ross reporting that there's some indication that these men had cased the Logan Airport for some period of time, going back and forth uh, between Portland, Maine, uh, and the Boston Airport. And ABC's Lisa Stark has been reporting through her sources, uh, aviation sources from uh, Seattle, she has been reporting this morning, uh, that there was a level of sophistication uh, uh, on the part of these uh, uh, hijackers that was pretty great. Uh, that not only is a very simple signal that can be sent from the planes to indicate uh, that a flight has been hijacked, that uh, signal, she has reported, did not come from either plane, and that indeed the transponders uh, on the plane, the, uh, uh, the equipment on the plane that sends out information about the plane's height and its speed and whatever had been turned off uh, on the plane, and that obviously indicates a lot of sophistication on the part of these pilots, or the part of these hijackers. They knew what they were doing when they got the controls of these planes. Yes, it's a four-digit hijack code, and, uh, and shocking to everybody that they could not place it, so something had been done to the plane ahead of time. So John Miller is here now. More news?
Um, interestingly, uh, as Brian Ross touched on earlier, and we've been able to confirm, it was a, a fellow airline passenger who got in a traffic dispute with these men who were apparently late for their flight, which is why their luggage didn't make it, who um, then made his flight, heard the news about what happened, and called in on his cell phone um, to the Massachusetts State Police. Um, that car was processed last night about 10, 30, 11 o'clock at Logan Airport by the Massachusetts State Police uh, bomb squad that's assigned to the airport. Their dogs, the FBI's evidence response team, and uh, one of their bomb techs. Uh, the dogs did not react for explosives in the car, but that's not really the object here. These, this wasn't a bombing. They were using the plane um, as their projectile, as their explosive. Um, among the ironies uh, from the scene last night... Um, I, and I, I don't want a confusing picture to be on the screen, so let me... We're looking at pictures which are very poignant because the fires are still burning at the Pentagon. But it's irrelevant at the moment to what John is talking about. So if I can take that picture down, please. Thank you. Uh, because the two planes that we're talking about and the hijackers in Boston were on the planes that went into the two World Trade Center towers. Correct. Um, and among, uh, among <coughs> part of the disaster of that scene... Um, the 57 police officers missing there, um, a dozen of them are from the emergency service, one unit, um, a number of officers I know personally, mm. um, still unaccounted for. Rescue One, which is the legendary New York Fire Department rescue unit, um, was in shift change when this happened. So instead of having um, five members on the rig, the other shift said, well, we'll all go down. So a double shift went mm. down. Mm. So many of them unaccounted for. Mm. Um, First Deputy Commissioner uh, Bill uh, Fian also uh, confirmed dead, uh, not unaccounted for, um, an old friend of mine. And a, and a, a strange irony, uh, part of this mystery, John P. O'Neill, special agent in charge for counterterrorism of the, of the FBI, uh, the man who ran the Bin Laden case, um, was just hired by the World Trade Center. Uh, he's been unaccounted for since yesterday. Um, he was in charge of the coal bombing case and mm -hmm. had just returned from Yemen, where um, there was such a threat on his life um, that uh, the FBI agents literally had to, had to move out of the country under guard. And uh, he's been missing, too. Um, his family has actually asked us uh, um, to broadcast that in case some hospital, uh, some someone uh, has information about that. And I'm going to effort to get a picture of him. But the irony uh, of his past, his role, um, in the Bin Laden investigation and in terrorism in general, um, and the fact that he's among those missing right now um, is striking. Good you're just hearing about the names of friends, or you? Yeah. Let me ask you about, I mean, because I don't want to get you in trouble for a minute. Take, take a second. Sure. Let me ask you about uh, the fire. Uh, you mentioned earlier on that some of the debris let me take a second. Let me ask you about the debris uh, that has blown over on the top of that uh, building in Battery Park. Uh, has uh, that... that was a fire right. in uh, uh, a residential building in Battery Park. Uh, black smoke billowing out from behind a, a set of plate glass windows near the top floor, like a, a penthouse apartment. Um, fire units have reached the scene and, um, and are dealing with that. And that seems to be under control for now. Okay. Good. Good. Well, that's, I, I suspect that is uh, responsible for a lot of the smoke that we're seeing on the lower New York uh, skyline. Yeah, that is, that is good news. Let's go to Don Daler. I think he's still down at his post, which, as we know, is just a few blocks away from the World Trade Center Tower devastation. Don? That's right, Diane. We're starting to see the first major deployment of National Guard units that have fanned out in this area. Prior to this, they were specific to the search area itself, but now they're moving outward different streets. Interestingly enough, yesterday, shortly after the event happened, I was escorted into the, the area by a federal agent. One of the things he told me was that there was a jurisdictional debate early on when this happened. This was not federal territory like the Oklahoma City bombing, but as an act of war, there was a, a debate about the federal uh, offices taking over down here. What happened very quickly, according to this federal agent, was immediate cooperation among the different branches, state and federal, and that is what we have witnessed down here. One bit of clarification, there seems to be a conflicting number now, the number of firemen, either five or six, who were brought out. You remember the fireman who talked to us earlier. He told us it was five, but now we're hearing reports that it was six. 
One other little bit of information from down here from a, a high-ranking police officer. He is not talking to us about casualties so far, but he said that the NYPD had ordered to have on standby here 6,000 body bags. Ooh. Ooh. All right, thanks very much, Don Daler. Uh, let's go to Jack McQuethy, who's down at the Pentagon, uh, where there, last time we talked to him, were still fires burning almost 24 hours after that uh, plane had flown into the, uh, into the Pentagon, the flight, American Airlines Flight 77, that had gone into the Pentagon yesterday. Jack? Uh, Charlie, the fires are not only still burning, in some cases they are burning into new parts of the Pentagon, uh, complicating the efforts of trying to keep lar as large a part of the building open as they can. We have been told that uh, at least one chunk of the Pentagon is now having to be evacuated because of smoke uh, and the uncertainty of the fires that continue to burn along the roof line of the various rings of the Pentagon. Um, we also uh, have been told that there is a decision pending uh, on the need, the search and rescue people say, to collapse uh, the remaining leaning portion uh, of the Pentagon uh, that is in the area where the aircraft actually went in. They want to uh, take the floors that are leaning against uh, the side of the Pentagon, collapse them probably using a wrecking ball uh, so they can get in closer uh, and attempt uh, to both find anyone who may still be alive and to begin to identify bodies. Uh, we have been told by uh, some sources that there are chunks of the fuselage of the airplane embedded uh, in the collapsed section of the Pentagon. Uh, they are clearly visible, we are told, by some of the firemen uh, and rescue people who have been operating in there. That is something uh, that the FBI will want to get their hands on. The whole area is still being treated as a major crime scene. Uh, there are pieces of uh, evidence that have been marked out on the highways around the Pentagon and in the parking lots as you approach the area. Of course, this aircraft, when it came slamming into the building, clipped off a number of light poles. Uh, those are all part of the uh, marked exhibits uh, of the way the aircraft came in. Uh, we've just seen convoy full of uh, uh, what appeared to be entirely MPs, military police, pulling into the south parking lot of the Pentagon. Uh, dozens and dozens of trucks and uh, uh, vehicles. Obviously, they're trying to relieve some of the local police and other authorities uh, as they try to monitor and control the traffic. Uh, it's a very busy intersection hub of Northern Virginia around the Pentagon. They're trying to get as much of the traffic back to normal as they can, Charlie. Just, just a quick question, uh, Jack. When you talk about the fact that the fires may be spreading into new parts of the building, and you were talking earlier about the fact that even though we think the Pentagon is a sort of fortress, that there's a lot of wood supports in that building. It's a very old building, a landmark building, and uh, that made the fire uh, more difficult to fight. But, but can you say that they're, to some extent they're losing this fight against the fire, that it's, that it's getting ahead of them? It's not that they're uh, losing it. Well, maybe, they, maybe it is that they're losing it. Um, the fire has been creeping along the roof lines uh, that are all parts of the rings of the Pentagon. Uh, and for reasons that are not exactly clear to me, there, there's uh, all sorts of duct work that can conduct uh, heat. Uh, and smoke along that area and uh, for some reason that fire is continuing to burn and burn into areas of the Pentagon that were not initially affected uh, by the blast itself. All right, John McQuethy at the Pentagon, uh, thanks very much. I don't know why, I just keep thinking about the fact that in that car, as we were just told by John Miller, they found a video on how to fly a commercial plane. I don't know why it strikes me as such a stunning, mm. small detail. Let's go now to Cynthia McFadden. As we know, she has been monitoring the hospitals in New York for us. Cynthia. Diane, uh, these empty stretchers and wheelchairs say it all as far as the medical personnel are concerned in the city at this point. Uh, there have been a couple of firefighters uh, who have made their way here uh, for smoke inhalation and dust inhalation, uh, but none of the severely wounded people have made their way here yet. Uh, but I'm joined by a young woman who has come uh, hunting for her fiance. Uh, this is Jillian Volk, who teaches preschool. Uh, she was 10 blocks from the blast at Church and Thomas Streets, 10 blocks from the World Trade Center. And um, Jillian, uh, 
your fiance worked on the hundred and works on the hundred and fourth floor. The hundred and fourth floor for Sandler O'Neill, a small investment banking firm in um, the South Tower. Now his name is Kevin Michael Williams, and he is 24 years old. And you were on the phone with him. Um, he called me after the first blast um, to tell me that they were being evacuated, but I have not heard from him since. Now you you have you you've been up all night. Yeah. Working, yeah, I mean, Jillian has brought with her a list of all the phone numbers of New York City hospitals. You, you had what you thought was good news at one point last night. At 7 o'clock p.m., I heard that um, they found a Kevin Williams at Bellevue. But when we, were, when we got there, the ethnicity wasn't correct, so it wasn't him. Now, you have a wedding date set for December 1st. Yeah, December 1st. He's going to be okay, though. He's going to return. Today... What are your plans? I'm just going to keep going. I'm not going to lose hope. And I'm going to go as long as I have to until I find it because I, I, know, I know he's going to come back to me. Jillian Volk, thank you for being with us, and good luck today. Oh, Charlie, Cynthia, Diane. Cynthia, just give her a hug. Hold on to her. Oh, we've been doing it, Charlie. Yeah. You know, this so. is a young woman who... 24 years old, and she's you, she's known him since she was in high school. They were high school sweethearts. So many uh, searches. The, going the human on face of this, yeah. oh, the human face oh. of this, is almost more than you can bear. Give her a hug. Thanks. 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 We hear about all the searching going on. Sons looking for fathers, mothers looking for children, and then we know there are some families who did get some news yesterday that was news of relief. We are joined by a couple of fellows. Now, tell me, Bill, if I pronounce this. Bill Heitman? Yes, sir. Okay, I pronounce it correctly. Bill working on the 81st floor of the first tower, the first one that was hit Correct. by the first plane. That plane, because we've seen the pictures of it coming in, had to hit just above you. Just above us. Correct. I, I was fully aware that when something hit us, that, the, that it was just above us by the, the debris that was just off the building. Did you have any idea what had happened? Uh, uh, the initial instinct was that something hit us. First, first, we, you, it was a question of, is this an earthquake? Uh, imagine, if you will, being on top of a telephone pole and just having a truck at, at, at top speed just slam into that telephone pole. That's exactly what it felt like. Was the building, I mean, those are solid buildings. Was it moving? It, it, it shook for, for about a, a second or two. It actually did move substantially. And then what did you do? Uh, we, I had been knocked off my chair at my desk. A few of us had like hit, hit the ground like on our knees and we, in a panic, headed away from the windows towards the center of the floor. And then after that initial panic was over, everybody calmed down. We did a little search for about uh, five minutes out in the hallways, which the, it's strange, the hallways in the center of the floor were devastated, mm -hmm. not so much the outside office areas. Mm -hmm. Of, of the side that I was on. And then we made our way to the stairwell and in a very orderly fashion made, made our way down 81 flights. Was there, was there a check? I mean, was it, you know, Fred, are you here? Uh, Bill, are you here? Mary, are you here? Yes, but it was, uh, it was almost useless to, to, uh, to really account for everybody not knowing what was going on, who could have been in the bathrooms. Luckily, uh, my boss, uh, w um, he was in the bathroom and, uh, and had just appeared in our office and he could couldn't stand up uh he he was uh, hit bad in the in the bathrooms uh which were in the center part of that floor right was, was he able to get down he was able to get down he uh he, he's an asthmatic one of many asthmatics that i that i came across and uh he he recovered and we got him down he, he actually started to experience some distress once we got down to you the talk bottom. very matter of fact they have walking down 81 flights of stairs but obviously you're encountering you said very orderly and, and there's a marvelous way that people respond, that they just, they're sort of in shock, and they just do it right. But on the way down, people hurt? Uh, was everybody okay as you came down? Yes. The, 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 only, the only pandemonium was uh, quite often we would have to call out, like, for everybody to move to the right so that certain injured that were, uh, I believe, to be above us, burns, and, and several asthmatics, as I said before, um, had to get by. The worst of it really came when we were down in like the 30s, um, maybe about uh, 
30 minutes into our trip down was when the fire person, the firemen started coming up and were literally collapsing on the stairs from the combination of their climb plus the load that they were, they were carrying. Uh, I, I and a few of us around the 27th floor had, had to actually assist the firemen bringing uh, oxygen tanks and their hoses up, uh, you know, about two or three flights. That building was hit at 8.45. Correct. I have the time written down somewhere when it actually collapsed. I think it was 9.50 something when it actually collapsed. How, how, I'm sorry, how soon before it went down did you get out? Well, my building, uh, it's strange because my building, tower number one, was the first to be struck. It was the second of the two to, to collapse. Down, right. to collapse. Right. Right. Um, I had been out on the street not even a minute. I had made my way one block over to Broadway. I was out less than a minute when... Uh, when number two when Number two uh, came down, and we w several of us thought that we were being shot at from above. We didn't know what was happening. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, I think it was ten, uh, uh, close to ten o'clock, nine fifty-nine, when that first one collapsed, mm -hmm. and then about twenty-eight minutes passed, or a little bit past, when the second one did. Well, we should say first of all that for Morgan Stanley, this is a. These floors represented, fifty-one floors of friends and colleagues. We're talking about 3,500 people at Morgan Stanley who worked in the two towers. And while you were going through what you were going through, well, next door, in the second building to go down, we had Brad Stewart, 23 years old, worked at Morgan Stanley for one year. Now, you started out and you were on the 73rd floor when you heard something happen in the tower where Bill was, right? What? Yeah. Um, more or less, a big shake, like an earthquake, like you said, uh, occurred, and um, no one knew exactly what happened. Um, maybe some of us thought the air conditioning unit had fallen or something to that effect. Uh, and you get the word and start heading toward the stairs to go we down. We got the word from someone in an outside office that the uh, building had been hit by something, and all of a sudden I turned around and I started debris falling from the sky, and I just ran for the stairwell um, down 73 flights of stairs. But again, it was orderly at the beginning. Very orderly. Uh, you know, people were helping out, you know, the asthmatics, the overweight people that were having trouble down the stairs. Then, the we problem, got to about, what, the 20th, 25? 25, 23, around there, um, you know, the, I guess the second plane hit in my building. And people were just running as fast as they could out of the building. Um, and at this point, you're in the stairwell. You have no idea what's going on. Everyone's just panicking. Uh, you know, trying to be organized and, you know, not get out of, you know, not to be, not be too chaotic, but, um, you know, you get out, actually, you know, we, we finally made it out, got, you know, it was unbelievable. And you get to the plaza level on the second floor and you see that in between the two buildings, ash and debris, uh, blood, I mean, it, it was absolutely awful. And flames, people said it really was like the dark side of the moon. A absolutely. absolutely. And did you immediately see friends? Did you? I was with some colleagues on my floor. Um, I, you know, as we're speaking right now, I'm not sure if half my office even got out alive. Um, hopefully, you know, hopefully, prayers are with them. Um, my initial instinct was once I got out of the building to help, but then, you know, my other instincts were to, you know, contact my family, you know, my loved ones, let them know I was okay. Bill was on 81, yeah. the first building that was hit. You're on 73 of the second building. That second plane, the plane came in just over you on the 81st. Correct. 73rd, that second plane came in lower. Yeah. Did it come in? Do you know? Was it about where your floor is? Um, just looking at all the video footage, it uh, looks like it actually, the wingspan would have hit my building. So it would have hit my floor, I'm saying. Floor. Uh, so I think I maybe the scene that made everybody's heart really stop, well, there were so many, but was looking up and seeing people looking out the windows. The traps. Could you see them? Did you see it? When I first looked up at the building, you can see that the uh, the higher floors, I mean, you couldn't really tell, you know, 80, 90, whatever. I mean, you can just tell the higher floors were, um, you know, just surrounded, engulfed in smoke and flames. And you can see the flames. And you were just, you know, saying, how are these people going to get out alive? Because, you know, the stairwells are probably caving in. And... The, we are the, the real we, pandemonium, I, I don't know if Brad experienced it coming down, but I, we all felt that once we got down into the lobby concourse level that things would be rel relatively normal down there. But then when the sprinkler systems and we were walking through ankle deep water and the real urgency came when the emergency personnel were frantically trying to get us out of the building 
and uh, it, I was, like I said, only a block away when I just got engulfed in dust. They're too hard to watch, and we have decided not to show them. Be but people did jump. They had to jump. And it's horrible to see. Did, were either of you there? Did you see it? I actually was uh, down by Water Street by the FDR Drive when uh, I just actually got the phone with my relatives just telling them I was okay, and uh, I saw the building go down. And it was, it was the most frightening. You'll never forget that image, you know, for the rest of your life. Um, you know, just when I got home, so many phone calls to my relatives and my friends just seeing if I was okay. Um, you know, I wanted to thank them all. Um, but, you know, as we speak, you know, there's some of my friends that are, you know, unaccounted for, people that I went to college with, that worked in the other building. Um, and my, my prayers go out to their families. Sure. So do all ours, I want to point out, by the way, Brad's dad worked downtown during the 1993 bombing. He's now retired. Mm. Thanks to both. And you were in the 93 bombing, right? Yes, I was. You were there when it happened? I swore that if this ever happened again, I would never work in that building again. And I turned out to be quite right. All right, Bill, Brad, thanks very much. Appreciate your being with us. We're going to go to ABC's Lisa Stark, who was out in Seattle, been reporting on the aviation end of all this, has some new information on one of the flights. Lisa? At least, uh, Charlie, the new information that we have is that on the American Airlines Flight 11, the one that went into the World Trade Center first, we had reported earlier that a flight attendant had managed to call out that hijackers were on the plane, that flight attendants had been stabbed, the hijackers had taken the cockpit. We now have a new bit of information. That flight attendant was also able to report to the airline that the hijackers had what she believed to be mace and had maced some of the passengers, those in business class as well as those perhaps in first class. So they were attacking the flight attendants, they were attacking the passengers with mace before they apparently stormed the cockpit. And that's the newest information we have on that particular flight. Charlie? So they had weapons other than the knives, if you can consider mace a weapon, but something that you could get on an airplane. I don't believe that's legally allowed on an airplane. I have to check with the FAA, but I would bet you that you're not legally allowed to bring that well, onto an airplane. I'm sure you're not. It's just right. I'm, I'm just thinking of things that practically uh, you could try to thwart security by using. Yeah. Absolutely. They did apparently get that on the plane. And we've heard reports from Ron Claiborne and others that the, the knives, some of the knives had plastic handles. That's another interesting uh, point because that can go through the... Uh, uh, the metal detector and, and plastic isn't picked up as, as something you would need to be concerned about. Yes, and we've talked about the fact that uh, the wife of the Solicitor General, uh, Barbara Olson, who died uh, in the flight that crashed into the Pentagon, was reporting that the uh, hijackers had box cutters. And again, the box cutters that I know tend to have plastic handles as well, uh, which might be something that you could get through. Uh, security. And I'm, sorry. and I'm also told by one airline this morning that it is not illegal, at least it wasn't before today, to bring a box cutter on an airplane. Uh, the, the blade is less than four inches long. That would have been legal to bring on board an airplane. Ooh. All right. Thanks very much, Lisa. America will never be the same. This is the first time this kind of thing has happened. We'll be more cautious in the future. We will be uh, more alert to terrorism. We were aware of terrorism. It appears to me that we may have been victimized by our own resilience. I remember the day after the bombing saying, I will be back in my office because then the governor had an office on the 57th floor within two or three months. And two or three months later, I returned with all the other tenants. And America went back to its norm. And all of a sudden, the pressure was off. We weren't concerned anymore about terrorists bringing us down because we had overcome it with relative ease. We were back in business, back to normal. And now you hear, overnight, intelligence people saying, yeah, we should have had spies. If you're going to deal with anti-terrorism, if you're going to do it effectively, you need to have people among the terrorists. Well, then why didn't you have spies? Well, there was a regulation that said they are uh, usually treacherous people and people who are not savory. And so you mustn't use them. And Paul Bremer and Jim Wolsey this morning say to you, that's ridiculous. We should have had, but why didn't you? Why are blades allowed? Why do you have all these people who are being disparaged now as the people who are not equipped to look through your luggage? Why weren't we more careful? Because America is not accustomed to needing to be. I think that's all changed now. I think now, finally, 
we will say to ourselves, America has to well, do things, even if it inconveniences us. I, at least I hope so. Governor, 1983, I was covering the Capitol for ABC News, and we went through the bombing of the Capitol. Right. And all of us who love that building were shaken to our core by that. And I remember Tom Foley and others in the leadership in the Congress going through and saying, okay, what does it take to protect this building? And people saying, look, you're right on the street. You can attack this building. It can be done. And the congressional leadership said, we can't do that. We can't shut everybody out. We can't clamp down because if we do, we have changed the very nature of our society. That's correct. And you're going to have to change the very nature of your society, but not essentially. You will never stop being the freest, strongest place in the world. There are still some intelligent uh, in dispositions you can use and, and uh, allowances you can give government without losing your vital freedom. You can be a lot more careful about who you let on a plane. You can be a lot more careful about what kind of blades are allowed. You can be a lot more intelligent about using spies. We know that. We've said it overnight. We know what needs to be done. What was lacking was the will to do it politically because you didn't need to do it. Now you do. There are going to be tens of thousands, perhaps, of people killed or maimed those people will never be forgotten. They'll never be replaced. Something different about this event. If people analogize to Pearl Harbor. Of course, this is not like Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor, you knew the enemy. Pearl Harbor was Japan. Pearl Harbor was relatively easy to deal with because you said, here we go. That's the enemy. Now we're all out to get him. And we did. And Germany, too. Here, we're not sure of the enemy. But we know this. It isn't just a madman or two or three or four. This is much too well organized for that. And so now we have something a little bit closer to Japan. It's not a nation, but it's a thing. It's an organization. Maybe it's Bin, La Bin Laden, who appears to be the favorite. And I I'm sure there's an eagerness to make him still more favorite as a target. And uh, that may be good. But at least we know the enemy. And you're going to have, for the next week and more, a recitation of the names of individuals, not just the well-known celebrities, but the names of those firemen, the names of the cops, the names of the simple people who had nothing to do with politics, who got eaten up by this and destroyed casually and brutally. And that is finally going to tell this nation, look, we have to change. First of all, we have to get them. You know, we say America has been changed forever. I've heard that 15 times, and, and that's probably true. And some of it won't be good. We'll be harder edged. We'll be more nervous. We'll be more suspicious. We'll be more anxious. But we can, there can be some very good changes too. We can finally make an attack on transnational terrorism. That's significant. We can recruit Jordan. We can recruit uh, Egypt. We, the Israelis are there for us. We can finally make the fight. And we think we see the enemy. Now, you'll never be safe from an isolated religious zealot who has gone mad, who decides to pocket a bomb and walk into your church and blow you up while you're at your services. You're never safe from that. You can't protect against that. But you can protect against the kind of organized effort that this required. Because an organized effort has form and depth and dimension, and you can find it and destroy it but and trace it. The so, United States government might say, you know, with, the, with Israel and with a number of other states, we have tried to penetrate. We have uh, tried to do everything we could about Osama bin Laden. No, but we haven't tried. We, we, uh, uh, Diane, very respectfully, they can say that. And then you would say to the United States government, no, you didn't. Ask Warren Rudman. Ask the people who were on this mission that, that issued a report. Ask Gary Hart. We haven't done it. Why? We didn't choose to. Let me ask you this. After every oil crisis, when we waited on line, you know, for the gasoline, etc., and everybody said the same thing, no more big cars, we have to learn to conserve what happened. After six months, we forgot and went back. Why? We're the strongest, richest, luckiest people in world history. And sometimes that becomes a problem for us because we take things for granted. We have to stop taking them for granted. If 10,000 or thousands of lives of innocent people can't teach us to be different, that then we're not as smart as we should be. And I think, I think we will be different. And, and here's one other beautiful thing that could come out of this, beside a significant attack on terrorism. You know, I'm a New Yorker. I've been here all my life. I want to die here, not right away. But, <laughs> and I, in 1993, I said on a television show, I never saw people more beautiful than the people at the World Trade Center. 
helping one another out in the middle of the night, Con Edison workers, cops, firemen, and, and you saw it again last night. This city, maybe because there's so much diversity, maybe because we know we have 180 different the ethnicities, we have every color, we've got to come together when we're challenged because we have so much difference here, we have to organize. And maybe we did after 93, we are now, we were after the Second World War, and maybe the lesson we'll learn is, hey, look, we're at our very best when they challenge us. But there are all kinds of crises. There are these quiet catastrophes like poverty and illness and all these other things, which if we acted this way all the time, we could deal with. If instead of bickering politically and arguing about he's a different color than I am, if we acted all the time the way we act in these crises, we would be so much fantastically stronger than we are and the world would be so much better, it's hard to imagine it. You we haven't learned enough. I hope we learn it this time. And you do see the best of humanity even in some of the worst situations. Thank you so much. Former Good governor, to have you, governor of Thank the you. state of New York, Thank Mario you. Cuomo. Thank you. I'm not sure where we're going next. Maybe you know. There they are. We want to show you uh, some up. pictures uh, from yesterday and these are pictures that uh, amateur photographers have brought us. Uh, these were taken by a young man who really got right up to the... Well, these are, I'm sorry, these are pictures from this... Tell me what I'm looking at. I think I'm looking at pictures from this morning. Yeah, these are pictures from this morning. And that gives you some sense of the scope of what has to be dealt with in terms of rubble that is down in the World Trade Center. Still, there's problem with fire. John Miller was pointing out that some of the debris from the collapsed building, even though uh, it's been almost 22 hours, 23 hours since the building's actually collapsed, uh, some of the debris still blew up this morning under the roof of a building in Battery City Park. That building caught fire. Firemen had to deal with that blaze. Uh, an already overstretched fire department in New York had to deal with it and did so. But that's the scene. Uh, this morning in New York City with this pile of rubble, steel, concrete, a crime scene, but six stories tall, six stories of rubble. We've been saying that almost nothing has happened so far that someone didn't catch on film, on photograph, on tape, and we have with us right now at the desk two of the videographers who were there at critical moments. Kevin Sotofi, who was there and filmed the aftermath, and you met earlier Evan Fairbanks, who shot one of those crucial scenes, one of those searing scenes of the plane going into the second tower. Uh, I'm just gonna play again the footage that you shot, Evan, and let you tell us once again when you looked through your lens and looked up, did you grasp what you were seeing, what the camera was recording? There was no way I could possibly grasp what I was seeing. I just saw a flash come in on the left of the frame. I saw an airplane. I could identify it as an airplane, and I just thought, what is that doing in this area that's got to be controlled space? And before I finished that thought, it disappeared into the into the south side of the tower. You know, that's exactly and the thought that we had. We were sitting here on the air live because the first tower had been hit and we knew something had happened. And we saw that plane come into the frame. We had a little bit more chance to uh, see it before it hit the building than you did. But we saw it come into the frame and, and my thought was, well, it's a big plane, but it must be an observation plane. It must be a fire plane. And I thought of the wildfires out west. Maybe it's bringing in water, you know, to fight the fire exactly. in the building. The concept that it was going to hit the tower is so foreign to all of us that, that you couldn't believe what you were seeing. And, and I still didn't believe it after it happened. Uh, Diane said, oh, my God. And I thought, well, that clears up the question of whether or not the first one was an explosion or accidental or whatever. Uh, this is a concerted attack on the World Trade Center. But you couldn't believe what you were seeing. No, absolutely. I still can't believe it, uh, what I'm seeing. I've seen it played back 15 or 20 times. I played it back in my camera five times. Kevin. After... Oh, excuse me. Kevin was there for the aftermath, a sort of counterpart to what you were doing. As we roll this footage, tell us again, as you wandered into the scene, what were you experiencing? You were right in the middle of all of the soot, the ash, the heat. Uh, basically, what I was experiencing was something I've never seen in my life, basically in person. Um, and I think yes, something that um, people don't really realize what's going on actually right now in the city is like people walking around outside 
sitting at cafes, talking, joking, laughing. It's just disgusting what happened. And uh, I wanted to say about Bin Laden, if uh, I heard that he said that uh, he wanted to thank Allah, that he didn't do it, but nobody should be thanked for what happened there. It's, it's ridiculous. It's not we right. saw in your first scenes, we saw the buildings. We saw the architecture, the skeletons of the buildings. When you first went in, did you see people? No, there's no people anywhere. We were, uh, we were walking around for, uh, f I was there all day yesterday and all, all night, basically, and to find people was very rare. Like, they found three people. It's very rare to find people. There's no traces of people. I saw a shoe and I saw, you know, that's it. There's, there's just too much material. Again. It looks like an unbelievable movie set, uh, what you saw there. You can't believe it until you're, until you're there. On the TV, it's not even the same. It's, of course, you know. I no, think no. He, I think he might have walked there. I'm not sure, but and you boil nice. it down to a to a box that's 21 inches or 24 inches across, and it's not the same. And as we told everybody last night, when you're walking through it, you're up to your way above your ankles, both in the soot and in the paper, the financial documents. And you look down, and they have such a a plaintive irrelevance to anything important in life. As you're making your way through this this complete carpeting of financial documents and that soot. blew out of the window. But, but mixed into that is also all these random personal effects, like a pocketbook or a, a high heel shoe or a glove or something that makes it so human. Well, as we said, it is a modern phenomenon that almost everything is captured on videotape, and we thank you both for coming in. We've got and for bringing us your pictures. Don't yeah. we have John Miller standing by? Did John? No, John. Come John, on we have a piece. From John no. Kenyonis that okay. I think you want to see. Um, well, it's just, it, it's a piece that is a, oh, I'm sorry. A, I was going to say, it's a piece about the search that goes on and um, the terror that accompanies. These are children who go to school right across from the Twin Towers. They were evacuated during the chaos. The faces of innocence, worried and frightened. What did you hear? I a big boom. What happened then? And it sort of shaped. Some kids were crying because their mom and dad were upstairs. Among the people inside the burning towers, this little girl's father. Um, I was scared that my dad was still in there. Well, they're all crazy. You still don't know. Her name is Jane Schoenhout. Her mother, Brenda, and Sister Remy. What went through your mind? Um, a lot of people I know are dying. I just want my dad, I want my animals. Her dad, Steve Schoenhout, runs a restaurant on the concourse level of the Twin Towers. He spoke to his family by phone this morning after the first explosion. Why didn't he evacuate? I do. Because he, he, you know, he thinks he's too tough for those terrorists. But they haven't heard from their father since. So let's go find him. Come on. We follow them for blocks and blocks throughout the disaster zone. Just a few blocks from their home. Everyone back on the sidewalk, please. We're stopped by police. Fortunately, right now, until we know that it's safe, we're asking everyone to move back. Now, the people that were evacuated from the World Trade Center, where would they be right now? Unfortunately, they are all over. Officer, they're looking for their father, who was in the building. I understand. Unfortunately, my wife is in the building, and I still haven't heard from my wife. So... On a cell phone, they call to see if Steve has turned up at one of his other restaurants. Hi, is Steve there? Steve. Yep, okay. Does that mean he's gone or he's still No, she just hasn't heard from him. They continue their desperate no, search, no, no. past the rubble, past the screaming rescue vehicles, and then more barricades. Okay, this is a secure location, you so can't you can step, step aside and walk Oh, how do you feel right now? I'm scared that my dad, like, we might not find him. I know, I feel like he's alive. I just want to find him and make sure. They run into one of their neighbors, who points them toward a police yeah. command center several blocks away. And tell them your situation and that they will escort you to your house. Yes, yes. Right there okay. at Pier 40. Dan, yeah. thank you. Yeah. It's another long walk. And do you know anything about when we'll be able to get in there to get our, no our animal? 
there's nothing here. But then, as Brenda is in the middle of another desperate phone call trying to find her husband. good to do that. We'll do it then. What? One little happy ending on a day with so much anguish and so much heart. Wow. And a lot of stories, you know, don't end as happily. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking one of our producers uh, yesterday was standing at a train station in New Jersey in a town in which I used to live. And it was filled with people just waiting to see who was going to get off the train. We've got Dr. Timothy Johnson with us. And can I tell everyone, Tim, that you were a medical doctor. You were also a minister. And we're so glad to have you. And George Stephanopoulos is here with us as well. You were talking earlier about the fact that this is a, this sends shock waves. This, this hits stress faults all across the country. For parents out there who want to sit down today and talk to their kids, what are they, what, what's the first sentence they should say? That they're safe. That what they're seeing is not what's going to happen to them. I think that is the message you have to get across, no matter what the age. Now, obviously, the further content of the message will vary depending on the age. And teenagers will have some often apparently inappropriate responses. They'll use glib language. They'll make fun of things they're seeing. It's their way of handling it. But whatever the age, children and adolescents long to know that they are safe, that this is not the reality that's going to affect them. Would you let them see the pictures? Uh, as they get older, yes. Always, I would hope, with parents or others around. With small children, I don't think so on a repetitive basis, no. They don't know how to interpret it. My wife heads a school, which includes people all the way from the ages of four to 18, and I said, would you let's see the pictures yesterday? And she said, mm -mm. <laughs> no, mm -hmm. no, no, no. It's, that's up to their parents and whatever, but certainly not for the lower schoolers yes. And, yes. and the middle schoolers. And a as this program's family physician, I plead also for adults uh, who are going to have trauma in their lives as a result of this, for people who are sick, who have heart disease, who are depressed, be alert to changes in them because we need to help them. Yes, I think we underestimate the extent to which people sitting in their homes are absolutely present in the lives of those they see sometimes in these situations. It may have nothing to do with them practically. It has everything to do with them emotionally. Exactly. I did just a couple of, of small notes. Uh, my, we all checked in with people yesterday that we know. And the first thing you do is call your kids. And uh, I've got a daughter who works down in the, in the shadow of those buildings. Um, she walked about 125 blocks to get home yesterday. And she said she saw the most wonderful scenes on the street. Um, a shoe store that was open. And people were out handing out sneakers to women who were in high heels, mm -hmm. giving them shoes, because mm. uh, everybody was walking uptown. Uh, the bridges and tunnels were closed, and there were emergency trucks going through, and emergency truck drivers stopping and loading people on the back of the truck to the point that people were actually standing on the back bumper. She said she saw somebody holding onto a truck with a briefcase in his hand, standing on the back bumper so that somebody could give him a ride uh, out of town. People handing out water, people handing out sandwiches and food. Um, you pull together. And I was downtown or at, at the beginning of the morning down by Fulton Street, which is two blocks from the World Trade Center. We managed to get into a building which is basically a dorm for Pace University Business School. And the, and the kids were calling all of their friends and neighbors in so they could use the Internet to contact their parents so everyone knew they were safe. Again, so many people couldn't reach anyone by phone. I think the Internet saved a lot of hours oh. of horror yesterday. The way of life in New York yesterday was email. That was it. Uh, it had to be done by email. Uh, again, my wife's school, she's got five, six hundred students. Couldn't get through on switchboards, cell phones are down. Everybody was communicating so by the, email. One of the striking things for me was um, I have a sister who's a nun in, outside of Jerusalem on the West Bank. And for the last two years, you know, we've always been emailing her during times of trouble, during when there are riots or the, uh, the uprisings, thinking, are you safe? And it's, are you okay? And it was really chilling to get an email from the West Bank in New York City asking, are you okay? Mm. Usually it's the other way. The other way around. Yeah. We I call all of this spiritual. You mentioned my other role in life. And really, I think when people reach out to each other in this way, it is a kind of spiritual growth. 
Well, last night, and we've said it before, the number of firefighters, the number of police who were down in this virtual pitch black darkness with the smoke surrounding them until they could get the generators started and get the lights on, the number of them who said to me that they were on vacation, that they were miles away, that they came in by hitchhiking, by walking to get in and help out. And the number of them who said, just hours ago, I stood and watched some of my best friends walk in first, not knowing that they would be the first to walk in and the ones who wouldn't walk out. And they would come up to you and say, can I just tell you the name? Is it OK if I just tell you? his name and tell you how wonderful he was. And I got a call yesterday, which is my favorite call that came in yesterday from somebody who said, I just want to say one thing to you. Remember the reason that the United States picked the eagle as its national bird? It's because it's the one bird that isn't afraid of a storm. Hmm. Well, we're going to leave the air now, uh, and we're going to be joined by ABC News' Peter Jennings. Uh, Diane and I will stand by all the people that you've been hearing from through the morning. John Miller, who's been reporting so well on local police and the federal investigation, who, as he said so poignantly a few moments ago, has lost an awful lot of friends of his on the police department, all of them. It's been a very tough morning for the entire country, and we thank you for being with us. We're going to be joined by Peter Jennings, and ABC News will stay on the air throughout the day. No commercials, because this is a story we all pull together on. is an ABC News special report. Hello again, everybody. I'm at Peter Jennings at ABC News headquarters. And as Charlie Gibson just mentioned a short while ago on Good Morning America, ABC News coverage of this attack on the United States is simply going to continue. Uh, there is so much to talk about and joined all together as we have now been by a television and to some extent by the internet and email. Uh, for the last uh, 25 or so hours is one of the ways that as a country, as we know from previous disasters, that we have managed to get through this. Uh, all of us, whether we are covering the story, involved in the story, at some remove from the story, and wanting desperately to know. Uh, and there is a huge amount to talk about. Um, in response to, the, to one email I got from a woman this morning Sorry, madam, it was not a nightmare when you woke up this morning and believed that the twin trade towers in New York City would be there. They are not there. And I think virtually everybody in the country now knows that. And probably everybody in the country knows the basics of the story, the basics of this disaster so far. So we're going to try to operate for the ensuing hours on a variety of different levels. We will we will do our very best, as we have in the past, to keep telling you what is happening at any given moment. Um, and there's a lot happening in the country today, both in personal terms, governmental terms. The search and hopefully the rescue operation uh, continues uh, with a quite extraordinary fervor. Uh, the mayor of New York, uh, Rudolph Giuliani, said this morning they're able to, pre uh, to presume that 41 people have died so far. But we continue, as you all know, to worry about the fate of thousands of people. And the Congress has convened today, as they said they would. And so we go to the Congress first for a prayer in the Senate, being given by the Senate Chaplain, Dr. Lloyd Ogilvie. Almighty God, source of strength and hope, in the darkest hours of our nation's history. We praise you for your consistency and constancy of your presence with us to help us confront and battle the forces of evil manifested in the infamous, elusive, cowardly acts of terrorism. We turn to you with hearts filled with dismay anger and grief over the terrorist attack on the World Trade Buildings in New York City and the Pentagon here in Washington. We pray for the thousands of victims who lost their lives as a result of these violent acts against our nation. We intercede for their loved ones, comfort them, 
and give them courage. In particular, we pray for the loved ones of the firefighters and the police who died seeking to help others. This is the House Chaplain. Quiet our turbulent hearts. Praying at the same time in the House of Representatives. Remind us of how you have been with us in trouble and in tragedies of the past and have given us victory over tyranny. Bless the women and men of this Senate today as they join with President Bush in decisive action. Guide them as they seek justice against the perpetrator. To all those families splattered with blood and exhausted by tears, heal the wounded. Strengthen all civil servants, medical and religious leaders as they attempt to fill the gaping holes left in the fabric of this nation. Send forth your Holy Spirit upon all the members of Congress, the President, and all government leaders across this nation. Free them of fear, any prejudice whatsoever. Remove all doubt and confusion from their minds. So with clear insight, which comes from you and you alone, reveal all that is unholy and renew the desire of your people to lives of deepening faith, unbounding commitment, and lasting freedom here where liberty has made her home. We place our trust in you now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain. That's the Chaplain of the House, David Coughlin. You also heard Chairs Dr. Lloyd Ogilvy, who's the Chaplain of the Senate. We'll come back to the House of Representatives and to the Senate as the Chairman, uh, as the Speaker of the House, Dennis Hastert, gathers them together with a very, very public intent to show the rest of the world that the country is going about business as usual, even though, as the House Chaplain said, there are gaping holes in the fabric of the nation. Um, and we will continue all across the country today to try to uh, involve you in this discussion of what has happened to the nation and who may have been involved in doing it and of course to stay uh, early and often at the crime scenes themselves the two crime scenes are of course the site of the trade towers uh, that were destroyed in new york city and the pentagon let's go first downtown new york city to don daler who spent a long day and night already uh, trying to get a handle on the status of the search and rescue operation. How's it going, Don? Well, w when you witness the horror that we've seen over the past 24 hours, you, you tend to cling to any kind of words of encouragement that, that come out, any bit of news. One of that has been the response of people all over to come down here and help. One individual in particular was here on vacation, a surgical resident from New Jersey, who answered the mayor's call for help and ended up getting involved in this part of history. John Chauvin has found himself in the hole in the World Trade Center as part of the rescue of the two Port Authority policemen who were down in there. Describe what you found when, when you went into that hole. Uh, it was a surreal, uh, a surreal scene. Um, I just, by happenstance, kind of ended up, was brought in by the police chief for New York City and then by, uh, by the fire rescue folks and brought into this hole uh, where it was a steel girder out over the hole uh, with a little hole to the side and 10 feet down and another 10 feet down, there was a Port Authority officer trap. And uh, the firefighters from fire rescue or rescue one, the ESU uh, police officers, me, a paramedic, uh, spent all night. Uh, the firefighters, the rescue uh, guys did all the work, I just went went down and rendered some aid. We gave morphine, intravenous lines. It was touch and go. It was, uh, it was scary. You told me a moment ago that you were really hoping that you wouldn't have to amputate and you were relieved that you got him out safely all in one piece. Um, you know, as a physician, that's kind of a last ditch thing. And here, but here you're looking at fire around you, heat, smoke, steam. You have guys risking their lives, a patient well and trapped down a little tunnel that only one man can go at a time. 
and uh, you know you wonder where where do I draw the line? But uh, geez, those fire rescue guys, ESU, were persistent. We held to our plan, and uh, we didn't have to amputate. And here this, uh, you know wonderful rescue port authority officer uh, uh who, who you know is critical but i hope stable and hopefully will do well uh, we hope that things will work out and you said that while you were there with him keeping him conscious even though he was uh on morphine how did you spend the time? You said you talked to him, and what else? Yeah, uh, well, you talk to him. You ask him a little bit about his uh, life and uh, how he's doing. Uh, we said a prayer. He was scared. I was scared. You know, uh, starting an IV with the World Trade Center on top of you is scary. And, uh, man, it made us both feel better. Well, I know one Port Authority police officer is glad that you were around and visiting the city. And we do. We appreciate what you did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Peter. Just to grasp the magnitude, even though we've seen it many times, of the destruction there at the Trade Center. But you can see that since first light today, and it happened overnight, they've moved in some really heavy equipment because as they search for those people who may have survived under the rubble, and people do survive under the rubble, as we know, uh, two people were rescued overnight. Uh, they have got to get to some of the heaviest wreckage away from those locations where they may have heard signs of life and of course what's frustrating at a moment like this is with all of the noise of the heavy equipment it is hard to listen for signs of life but as we simply continue as a nation to stare at these scenes of lower Manhattan and it is similarly true at the Pentagon um, I think from everything we've heard from around the country overnight, people invariably continue to cling to hope uh, that people will be rescued. Mayor Giuliani said today that 259 uniformed personnel, by that he means firefighters uh, and policemen, are missing. Um, five firefighters uh, were found uh, in the last six hours, or last seven hours, I guess now, and that is the very kind of thing which gives the search and rescue operation some hope that uh, there are other people uh, still surviving somewhere in the wreckage. Now, at the Pentagon, uh, where the fires, for the most part, appear to have been put out, the Pentagon has said today that no more survivors are expected to be pulled uh, from the rubble uh, following the attack which was mounted on American Airlines Flight 77, yes, it and 58 people, 58 passengers and crew died on that flight alone. Uh, but the Pentagon has said specifically this morning that the areas of the Pentagon where the attack struck and burned sustained catastrophic damage, and anyone who might have survived the initial impacts and the collapse in the view of the Pentagon uh, could not have survived the fire that followed. And ABC's John McQuethy. Uh, told us last night from the Pentagon that the fire had simply moved along, particularly on the right-hand side of this, of this area of the Pentagon. That's a 200-foot wide gash we have been staring at for so many hours now in the Pentagon. And we have no accurate estimate of casualties there, but have been reporting for some hours, based on the local fire department officials, that maybe 800 people perished at the Pentagon as well as those people on American Flight 77 who died as a result of the impact. And John McCrethy, our Pentagon correspondent, will be here to join us very shortly. But as I said, there are several levels of, uh, of discussion, of examination, of investigation, which we will continue to focus on. Uh, ABC's Martha Raditz uh, is at the State Department this morning. You may recall yesterday there were some some reports that the Pentagon had in some fashion been attacked. That went away very quickly. That was simply not true. But for the U.S. government, the State Department is the connection to the rest of the world. And Martha, tell us first just what's happening in the building. People come to work this morning? They did come to work, Peter. They have secured this building. They went through the building late yesterday and again this morning. And the head of diplomatic security, Dave Carpenter, reported to Secretary Powell that he thought the building was safe at this point. Secretary Powell has been walking through the building, giving a few interviews. There was a full counter assault team out in front wherever Secretary Powell went. But they do feel the building's fairly secure. The reports yesterday 
that there was some kind of bomb in the State Department happened after we were evacuated. We heard an explosion outside. I didn't think it was nearby the State Department. I think probably what it was was a secondary blast from the Pentagon because that's just across the river from here. Uh, Martha, in terms of State Department operations, both here and at home, uh, my understanding is about 25 percent of American embassies overseas are still closed for security precautions, but there's a real emphasis to get the U.S. up and visibly running, correct? I, I think that's part of the reason you see everybody back here today. They really want to put the best face on this possible as possible. They want to say, we're back at work. That's why they're out at the Pentagon today as well, despite the fact that half of the building is closed. They've still got the Pentagon up and running. They've got the briefing room up and running. You're going to hear Secretary Powell brief the press in about a half an hour, 45 minutes from now. They want to say they're on top of this, and they are getting intelligence reports they are saying secretary powell will not say this on camera but officials will say off camera they think it's the osama bin laden organization that they have human intelligence and signal intelligence this is not just because of the sophistication of the attack they're hearing human intelligence and signal intelligence that lead to osama bin laden this is of course after the attack they got these reports uh, martha the secretary has already said that there is good evidence mounting against those responsible and he's also had some pretty strong remarks reflecting what the president said yesterday about what the United States might do if another nation is ever found to be complicit in this. I think you saw the warrior in Colin Powell this morning when he was talking on Good Morning America saying this is a war we should prepare for a long-term conflict and he's talking about on the diplomatic front as well as militarily they are indeed looking at whether or not they can target certain areas these training camps they talk about I just talked to one official and I said are you talking about training camps anywhere outside of Afghanistan he said we just don't know at this point okay Martha thanks very much we we'll back to you uh, throughout the day um, just to bring you up to date uh, as we as we look at where we at in terms of these two crime scenes and let us not forget there is one other aircraft uh, which crashed in in Pennsylvania last night. That continues to be a mystery as to how that aircraft actually went down, but that's United Flight 93, a 757, which was headed from Newark in New Jersey to San Francisco. And there are 38 passengers and seven crew on that flight who we believe to be dead. In total, 265, 266 passengers and crew on board these four aircraft yesterday um, have all died. And it's that one area where we already have a handle on precisely how many people died. We do not have it at the Pentagon, nor um, at the Trade Towers in, in Lower New York. ABC's Lisa Stark, who covers aviation for us, uh, has been on this all the time. Lisa, tell us if you're in Seattle this morning again. I am, Peter, yes. Uh, bring us up to date on your beat, would you? Well, Peter, the, the one bit of new information that we have this morning is more information about that phone call from the American Airlines flight, Flight 11. Uh, that was the uh, 767 from Boston's Logan Airport headed to Los, Los Angeles. It was the first plane uh, that crashed into one of the Twin Towers uh, in Manhattan. We had earlier reported that a flight attendant did manage to call the airline as the hijacking uh, was occurring. We had reported that she had said a number of flight attendants had been stabbed and that the uh, hijackers had stormed into the cockpit. We've now learned uh, from a, a source that the flight attendant also reported that the hijackers appeared to have mace on board the airplane and that they had maced a number of the passengers, uh, those in business class, we're told, as well as possibly those in first class. So I'm sure it was a chaotic scene on board that, that aircraft uh, as the uh, hijackers made their way up up to the cockpit, uh, creating chaos in the back of the plane before they went into the front of the plane. We've also learned this morning that uh, on the two planes that went into the World Trade Tower, both that American Airlines flight as well as a United 767, apparently, uh, according to government sources, the hijackers, it appears on the planes, uh, fooled with the transponders. Now, this is, a, this is a, a something on the plane that sends a signal out to air traffic controllers 
so they know the altitude, the airspeed, the designation of the airplane. We're told by government sources that on the uh, American Airlines flight, Flight 11, the transponder was turned off completely. So uh, what that would mean, uh, what we know of air traffic control, what that would mean is that controllers would only have a signal on their radar screen that there was a, a target out there, that there was a plane, but they would know nothing about it, not its airspeed, its altitude, its designation. On the other plane, the United Airlines plane, we're told someone fooled with the transponder. I don't believe it was turned off entirely, but again, the computer reads that as, as an error. It's not sure what's going on, and I'm told by government sources that it may actually stop tracking the plane. Again, controllers, what I know of air traffic control is that controllers would still see a signal, they'd still see a blip, but they wouldn't have additional information about the airplane. If, if that uh, proves to be true, and as you know, information changes uh, in the early stages of these things, but if that proves ultimately to be the case, it would mean that these hijackers were very sophisticated, knew exactly what they were going to do, cut off communications as quickly as they could, uh, and certainly didn't want anyone to know what was going on up there uh, at 30,000 feet as these planes were heading toward Manhattan. Many thanks, Lisa. We'll come back to you uh, often throughout the day. And you use the word uh, which I think has begun uh, uh, to be very obvious to people wherever they're watching, listening, or trying to investigate is, and this is this level of sophistication involved in the attacks themselves. And back with me, I'm delighted to say, is John Miller, uh, who has done probably, I think, more as much as anybody in this news division and others to try to keep a handle on these various organizations and groups. Can you just bring us up to date again on where you think the investigation is, what we may have found out, and the level of sophistication that appears apparent? A uh, busy night for investigators, several developments. Um, from Brian Ross, uh, one of our key investigative reporters, uh, FBI agents conducting uh, searches and uh, raids in Florida. Uh, looking for uh, an individual who they want to question in connection with this. The Florida connection um, is not something we have the details on what led them there. More apparent, the Boston connection. At Logan Airport, we are told that a commuter got in a traffic dispute with a carload uh, full of men, um, that uh, he thought a little of it of the time. At the time, uh, he boarded his flight, went to his destination, and then learned of the attack um, and that it was a flight from Boston. So he then called the Massachusetts State Police, reported it, and directed them to the car that the men were parking at the time they had this argument. Um, uh, the Massachusetts State Police uh, bomb-sniffing dog assigned to Logan Airport uh, went over the car along with an FBI bomb tech evidence, for, uh, evidence recovery team. And uh, what, they, uh, what they found were rental documents that led right. them to an identity of an individual. Do they know where the car was rented? Uh, apparently in Portland and then driven to Boston, a national rent-a-car vehicle. Uh, a videotape, which uh, our sources say is an instructional video on how to pilot a commercial aircraft. Um, the men apparently were running late for the flight, maybe the route of the dispute with the other guy, uh, perhaps over the parking space, but uh, their luggage did not make the flight. So now the FBI is processing their luggage, um, in which uh, sources say there are Arabic uh, language training manuals um, on flying. Uh, they've developed five names, um, and I'm trying to learn whether those names match up with the passenger names they were looking at. But um, interestingly, investigators tell us uh, two of them are brothers. One of them is supposed to be a pilot. So we are starting to see, in the very early stages of the investigation, hints that there is a level of professionalism and proficiency with aircraft uh, if these are the right people that they're looking at. Now, in, in the Florida connection, the name of a flight school emerges this morning. Uh, correct. And um, there's, uh, there's some fog there because uh, the man they're looking for uh, worked at a flight school. Um, a, man, a man who uh, is uh, living in that location works at the airport. We're not certain what those connections mean yet. Uh, uh, we don't know, do we know that one of the men for whom they have a warrant in Florida uh, actually did train at, I believe it's called the Embry Flight School in Florida? Do we know, can we go that far at this point? Um, I had heard that uh, reported by Brian Ross this morning, whose sources uh, on the federal side are usually impeccable. Um, ABC News has also learned that uh, at least two of the hijackers slash terrorists were on the FBI watch list. Um, 
uh, which is exactly what it says it is. It's a watch list, watch for these people, and it's still unclear. Our investigative unit tells us whether these individuals entered the United States illegally or whether they entered before their names were actually placed on the list. So we do not know at this point whether these are men who've been in the country. There's been some reports around, I think, uh, quoting um, uh, in part the governor of Maine, uh, Angus King, who was the first person I heard say that these men had rented the car at Portland and driven down to, to Boston. I was very close to the Canadian border, so there's some questions this morning about men getting into the country, but I gather it's not very hard at the moment. Uh, no, not very hard. Uh, oh, the information, not yeah. very hard. I was going to, I thought you were saying it's not very hard to get in from Canada. No, that's also true along much of the Canadian-American uh, I mean, border. It's, look, it's looked on uh, as a soft point, and... You know, having studied this very closely, uh, Chris Isham from the investigative unit and I had the opportunity uh, several weeks ago to debrief a member of Osama bin Laden's intelligence team. It was a very rare opportunity. And he told us some very interesting things, and this will become the subject of a story later. But what he said was there was a training school at bin Laden's camp and that, uh, that militants from France, from Italy, from London, from all over the world were there in a multi-month training school where they were drilled through surveillance, counter-surveillance, explosives, and so on. The interesting thing he said that day was that there was uh, several young men from Canada uh, and that bin Laden took them aside away from the rest of the class and held a three-hour private session with the Canadians. Uh, the significance to us at the time was certainly, well, that's the easiest, closest jumping off mm -hmm. point to run an operation in America. It's where the operation that was directed at uh, Los Angeles International Airport by Ahmed Rassam, uh, who the federal authorities say is connected to bin Laden, uh, jumped off from. It's where the device uh, was made. So there was, there was a little bit of history here. I cannot help today uh, thinking back on that and wondering if that wasn't uh, the beginnings of a cell that moved from Canada to Maine to Boston. I just want to make a quick correction here because the... Uh the information I gave you about the hijackers being on the, on the watch list, it's not the I FBI watch list, of course. It is the INS uh, watch list, the Immigration Naturalization Service watch list, and they're the ones who watch. And just to make one observation about the American-Canadian border, it's been called since time immemorial the longest undefended border in the world because the two nations are close, and it is fairly porous in places. Uh, though, And there's been, great, there's been some considerable pressure by American authorities on the Canadians to try to increase their surveillance capacity along the border. Uh, especially since the Rassam incident, which was the planned millennium bombing of Los Angeles Airport. Um, but, but the watch list, the INS watch list, um, uh, most often the names that are on the watch list either come from the FBI or the CIA. And it is a watch list. It's not a want list. Uh, it doesn't mean you're to be arrested. It means you're to be detained, that your identity is to be made certain if your name matches one on the watch list. Uh, ironically, if we go back through the history of these events that we've talked about for two days that we all know so well, uh, Sheikh Abdel Rahman, the blind Sheikh who was the inspirational leader convicted of, of inspiring the World Trade Center bombers, um, was on a watch list when he arrived at Newark Airport and there was no one available to interview him or debrief him, so they let him in. So uh, it, isn't a, it isn't a stop and arrest list, it's a watch list. So let's go on now and try to just get some general appraisal of where things are. But uh, there is a, an enormous question about whether or not the airports around the country will open. Air, air traffic all across uh, the country. Um, and for a great many international and American planes stranded in Canada at Canadian airports overnight, uh, there is this question as to whether or not the Federal Aviation Administration will open the airports at noon as we speculated yesterday. Lisa Stark, are you still there? I am, Peter. Has the FAA made a decision? Well, what we're now hearing, the all morning the FAA has been insisting that airports will open at noon, except they were saying those in the D.C. and New York area, the Washington, D.C. and New York area. Now we're hearing that the FAA has decided, no, wait, 
We're not opening the airports at noon. We're not sure when we're going to open the airports. Everything is still on hold. We don't know why the delay, if it's just taking longer to get the security measures in place they want, or if there's some other reason. But apparently now the word from the Federal Aviation Administration is that things will not begin, at least start even, to get back to normal around noon Eastern time. We'll have to keep you updated. One of the things you said last night, uh, as I recall, was that there was pressure on the FAA by the aviation industry to reinstitute fairly quickly the air marshal program, in other words, to get security on all of these aircraft. People are well, obviously particularly nervous today. Is that part of the delay, do we think? I don't know. I do know from uh, the airlines I've been speaking with this morning is that they have been waiting all morning for what they call it the FAA security directive that would have informed the airlines exactly what measures they needed to take to get the planes back in the air, to get the airports open again. And for some reason, that directive was not forthcoming. They had been waiting for it. They had been expecting it. So there is some delay in finalizing whatever security measures the FAA wants in place before the airports reopen. Okay, thanks very much, Lisa. We're waiting, as you said, for the Secretary of Transportation, Norman Edda, to come and give us a national briefing because uh, it's not merely air travel, it is air travel slash commerce which is being uh, held up and uh, you can imagine the imperatives that people have on various planes uh, to get places that conduct their personal and or private business. But one of the things, all of these air transport systems, namely FedEx and others, uh, United Parcel, they all have aircraft constantly in the air moving goods um, all over the country all over the world of course and all that has been held up until the federal aviation administration or the government in general makes a decision about whether or not uh, they will fly as of noon today looking at lower manhattan again we have with us marvin jackson a commodities trader who was on the 36th floor of the world trade center yesterday Mr. Jackson, thank you for coming in and having a chat with us. Um, your, story, your story is important. What happened? Well, I guess it was a little before 9. I was in another employee's office when I heard an explosion. And then the building started to shake. And I thought, oh, here I go again. Because I was there in 1993 as well when the bomb went off. So I went around, started back to my section of the office, and I saw a lot of smoke coming out of the elevators. So I walked around to make sure that everybody was leaving because you know, we heard someone telling everyone to leave, to leave. So people were beginning to pile, you know, leave out. And later I went down the stairways and was other people going down. So we just walked down the stairways until uh, about, oh, I don't know how far we saw firemen started coming up. And also they were bringing some injured people down and some people who were having medical problems. So eventually we, made it out into the con to the plaza, to the concourse of the building rally. And the sprinkler system was working, so, you know, they just kept us moving until we were out in the street. In, in the wake of the 1993 bombing, <clears throat> was there a plan in progress at your firm? What firm did you work for? I worked for the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Right. Well, was there a plan in place in your office to deal with an emergency? Were this ever to happen again? <clears throat> uh, I don't think so. I don't think I want to, you know, anticipate this ever happen again, you know, really. And were you, I remember going in the, in, in the Trade Towers after the 93 explosion when the building reopened again and feeling a real sense of anxiety and often wondering um, whether people who worked in the building ever quite got over it. Did you get that behind you? Well, I don't think people got over it, really. Some people were still a little nervous about it. and. But everyone seemed to be very calm as we were going down the steps. Uh, I guess because there was no smoke, you know, and people just just walked, you know. We we're in a single file in those instances because we wanted to let the firemen get up. And you know, everyone seemed to no one got excited, no one panicked. What did you do when you got out of the building? Well, I went out into the street and I looked back after I got uh, past Church Street to see what had happened, and I saw that. Both of the buildings were on fire. And with that, I just, you know, moved as far north as I could away from there. And it was, I was about four or five blocks away when all of a sudden I, the street shook. And I felt, I heard like an explosion. I thought, oh my God, I said, the bomb just went off. And I turned mm -hmm. around and looked back and I saw all of this sucked and smoke and 
and then I went to start a run then. Which tower were you in, one or two? That was, I was in one, in and North Tower. when I saw that, that was when uh, Tower 2 collapsed. The South Tower, the, South the Tower. first to go on the North Tower after that. Did, to the best of your knowledge, did all the people in your organization manage to get out of the building? To the best of my knowledge, everyone is out. Do, do you have a sense, I know this is a difficult question, do you have a sense of how crowded or not crowded the general area was at this time of day, just before 9 o'clock? It was very crowded. It was, it was a lot of people. So it was a normal day as far as you were it concerned? It was a normal day. There were a lot of people just coming to work. A lot of people never even got into the building. And, you know, they just got off the elevators. But it was a lot of people, yeah. Mm -hmm. What would you remember most about yesterday as a day, aside from the fact, thank goodness, you survived? Well, I think well, right now I was thinking about these firemen. I, all those firemen who went up, mm -hmm. And especially when I saw the buildings, the first, you know, Tower One coming down, the first thing that came to my mind is, oh my God, all these farmers are probably still in that building. Thank you, Mr. Jackson, for sharing that story with us. Sites of these attacks, the Pentagon would be the obvious one, but maybe even make a trip to New York, we're told. Not today, certainly, but maybe in the coming days, Peter. I don't think anybody on the, uh, on the search and rescue site in New York City would want to uh, the president, much they want them sympathetic, they, they don't want any politicians down there at the moment interfering with this search for the people who may have survived. You said one thing that I think we want to try to relate to aviation. The president's spokesperson, you and others heard this morning, believes that this coordinated attack on the United States is now over. Well, that's exactly right. They say they're confident that the, the um, terrorists carried out the, the plan in full and that they think the risks to public safety have been reduced. However, I'm also told that one of the tasks before the president today is to try to help figure out when the public transportation system, especially aviation, can be up and running in full. They have a number of worries about that. And I'm told that there's already behind the scenes some second guessing, finger pointing going on about how this could have happened and when everybody's going to feel ready to, to get the skies working in full again. Okay, thanks very much, Claire. Claire Shipman of the White House. And indeed, there is something of a struggle, a debate going on as to when aviation across the country is going to be freed up or at least start up again because with uh, 36, 37,000 flights in the United States every day, nothing's going to seem very free for the next several days. You can imagine what happens just after, you know what happens just after a major weather crisis. So let's go back to Lisa Stark and, and try to stay current in this debate because it goes back and forth a bit, doesn't it? We're getting conflicting information, Peter, but now it appears that the air traffic control system, the FAA intends to bring the air traffic control system back up at noon Eastern time. The confusion apparently is that it will be then up to the individual airports and individual airlines to determine when they will actually go back into business. One airline, for example, Delta, has already indicated it will have no flights before 6 p.m. Eastern time tonight. So although the air traffic control system, we're now told, will be up and running around noon. Uh, airlines and airports will open as they see fit and on a staggered basis. And also we're being told that airports in the New York and D.C. area may not open at all today, but that is a fluid situation as well. So this will be changing as, as the day goes on. Let me ask you, do we know why Delta says it'll have no flights until early this evening? I don't know if they're just trying to make sure they can get everything coordinated. Uh, it's going to take a massive effort to figure out where planes are. When the ground stop was put into effect yesterday, there were as many as 2,000 planes in the air. Some of them went on to their original plan destinations. Some did not. So it's going to take the airlines quite a while to sort out exactly where, how to get the planes where they need to be. Uh, I'm not sure why Delta maybe just wanted to give themselves some breathing space to see what the security measures were and to get their marching orders in place before they got the planes back in the sky. Am I right between 35 and 40,000 flights uh, in the U.S. today? Absolutely. I don't think you'll see that many today, no. obviously, but on a normal day, the air traffic control system handles about 35,000 to 40,000 flights every day. So that's, that's a lot to get back, uh, back up and running, obviously. And, and thanks, Lisa, and therefore we should not be surprised that there is this confusion at the time. By the way, the European Union, uh, this is such a glo this, this, this attack has such global dimensions to it, as we keep saying over and again, but the European Union has just now called for a Europe-wide day of mourning for the victims of these attacks on the United States, and they would like it to occur on Friday. And that is a really 
good and healthy reminder for all of us who live in the United States that people in the other parts of the world, we, you all, many of you and certainly many of us, have heard from people all over the world as to how deeply moved they are uh, by this attack on the country, but also, of course, on so many hapless individuals. Uh, we have with us uh, up here in the newsroom today Steve Newman, um, who I know is one of those uh, and characteristic of those who rescued someone yesterday and managed to take him across the river to Liberty State Park in New Jersey. Mr. Newman, are you there? Yes, I am. Um, just please, if you wouldn't mind, you look a lot fresher today than I bet you did yesterday. Uh, that's, that's for sure. Uh, just tell us what happened and if you can insert your own story as part of the overall picture of what was happening. Sure. Well, I was in a livery cab about two blocks south of the World Trade Centers when it was clear there was a fire in one of the towers, but all everybody that was in the streets, of course, there was all, uh, all the traffic had been stopped. Nobody really understood what was going on other than that there was a fire. Um, it was, you know, shortly thereafter that the plane flew above and everyone heard it and saw it go right into the South Tower, where pretty much a lot of fear and terror um, started overcoming and seas of people started flowing south down West Street. Uh, that's the point that I got out of, a, out of the car and headed over towards the water, heading west. And um, as I was doing that and got to the west side of the street, I saw an individual coming down that was clearly, uh, he was completely burned from head to toe and all of his skin had come off his forearms and his face and his hair was all gone and uh, looked a little disoriented so he was seemed to be on his cell phone either talking to somebody or trying to reach somebody and um, I asked him what happened he uh, what was amazing about his story was that he was in the lobby of World Trade Center one when the plane the first plane hit and when the debris started coming down he went back to go into the building to protect himself and was in the revolving doors mm. going back in off West Street when he looked up and a fireball came flying out, I guess from the elevator shafts, he, that's what he seemed to believe, and blew out all the windows and threw him back onto the street and obviously, you know, in a fire flash seared all his skin. But apparently nothing, uh, you know, all his clothes, mm. none of his clothes were burned. Um, so that was pretty amazing and he was shaking and it was clear that he needed to get to a hospital and realizing what was going on I said the only way you're getting to a hospital is to get o over to the other side of that river now, how did you how did you know at that point that because there was quite a movement from this tip of the lower west side of Manhattan across to Liberty State Park in New Jersey. How did you know to get across to New Jersey and not go somewhere else in New York City? Well, I worked down in the World Financial Center, which mm. is where I was heading to, and I know it's about a 10-minute walk to a subway. Uh, you'd have to walk right past those World Trade Centers, and I didn't know where any hospitals were south of there either. So to me, and I see mm. those ferries out my window every day, and I said, if you get to New Jersey, there won't be traffic, there won't be police, because all the traffic was stopped where I was. That seemed to me to be the only way to get this guy to a hospital, and it was clear that he was going to be going in a shock soon, and so it just, uh, that we, we just saw, was the we, most logical thing that appeared to me, that we had to get him over to, to a, one of those ferries. We saw a lot of ferry traffic on, on, on the Hudson River, as it now spills down there in, mm -hmm. into New York Harbor itself, and was there just simply a lot of movement of people going over and getting on ferries? Did ferries show up to help people? Well, that was somewhat interesting because I felt like I was a salmon swimming upstream going against all the traffic which was going south, actually, um, but, uh, and what was also very surreal is seeing all these people coming down crying but no victims I, I the only victim I ever saw was this one individual in the entire time I walked him really? all around the boat basin sat at the, at the ferry there were must have been a several hundred maybe a thousand people waiting to get on the ferries we cleared them out and were able to get this into get uh, um, Ken was his name get him onto the ferry and across the river um, so there were a lot of people there but most people were heading south away from that whole area. 
um, and we were obviously heading against the, against the current there. So well, Ken has a lot to thank you for today, Mr. Newman, and I assume you feel pretty good about yourself, at least in one instance here. Well, uh, you know, it was, uh, I guess I would say I was lucky too, because when we crossed the river and got to the other side, a police officer met us, and shortly thereafter, the towers, one of the, the South Tower came down, and you could see where all those hundreds of people were waiting, just what was like in a volcano. Uh, it comes down a mountain, mm. all that smoke billowing over and covering all the World Financial Center and coming into the water and covering all those people. That was well, where we were at. So, yeah. uh, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Newman. I really appreciate you taking the time. As I said, you probably look and feel better in some respects today than you did yesterday. Now, we're going to check in with the president. We're going to check in with the president in just a minute, and uh, at least briefly. I, I suspect it will not be the, the last time today, but just to, as we're waiting for the president, and we look at this crime scene in New York City, um, this is the cabinet room. The president's having a cabinet meeting. The Secretary of State was left. Here he is now. Team, and we've received the latest uh, intelligence updates. The deliberate and deadly attacks which were carried out yesterday against our country were more than acts of terror. They were acts of war. This will require our country to unite in steadfast determination and resolve. Freedom and democracy are under attack. The American people need to know we're facing a different enemy than we have ever faced. This enemy hides in shadows and has no regard for human life. This is an enemy who preys on innocent and unsuspecting people, then runs for cover. But it won't be able to run for cover forever. This is an enemy that tries to hide, but it won't be able to hide forever. This is an enemy that thinks its harbors are safe but they won't be safe forever. This enemy attacked not just our people, but all freedom-loving people everywhere in the world. The United States of America will use all our resources to conquer this enemy. We will rally the world. We will be patient, we'll be focused, and we'll be steadfast in our determination. This battle will take time and resolve but make no mistake about it, we will win. The federal government and all our agencies are conducting business, but it is not business as usual. We are operating on heightened security alert. America is going forward, and as we do so, we must remain keenly aware of the threats to our country. Those in authority should take appropriate precautions to protect our citizens. But we will not allow this enemy to win the war by changing our way of life or restricting our freedoms. This morning, I am sending to Congress a request for emergency funding authority so that we are prepared to spend whatever it takes to rescue victims, to help the citizens of New York City and Washington, D.C. respond to this tragedy and to protect our national security. I want to thank the members of Congress for their unity and support. America is united. The freedom-loving nations of the world stand by our side. This will be a monumental struggle of good versus evil, but good will prevail. Thank you very much. Are you seeing a formal declaration? Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 The President certainly does not want to answer questions at the moment, nor want to be committed to anything beyond his uh, prepared remarks. Uh, there you see the Secretary of Defense is there. This is this uh, small, there's uh, the Attorney General. Uh, right beside uh, the Secretary of Defense. A very trying day, unquestionably, for the cabinet, listening to the president, and I think in time, trying to figure out 
what, uh, what he actually means in legal and political and military terms, uh, that this uh, was more than an act of terror yesterday, which of course it was, but now becomes an act of war. Um, and as the day goes on, we will have uh, politicians undoubtedly uh, wishing to consider this very dramatic phrase by the president. The Secretary of Powell made this earlier today, uh, made this same statement earlier today, and I'm almost certain that Mr. Powell did not make this statement without uh, understanding, agreeing, or appreciating the fact that this was going to be the tone from the White House. And beyond that, the president says the things I think probably everybody knows. This is a different enemy than the United States is accustomed to, at least in the distant past. It fights in the shadows. It very often has no regard for human life. And the president goes on to say, as a leader must say, that they cannot hide forever. They may think their harbors are safe, he said. By that, I think he meant to say maybe they believe they have safe harbor somewhere, um, but that we will conquer. And the thing that will, I think, impress uh, most uh, people in the establishment, if you will, um, and certainly in the various intelligence communities, is when he said that the U.S. will be patient and will be focused because this will indeed take time. In the meantime, he's going to ask for immediate money from the Congress for New York and for the, and for the District of Columbia, which is particularly the, the need for assistance, financial assistance that is needed in New York and uh, outside Washington at the Pentagon. And, and then he will begin to ask for more money um, to protect the national security. And that will be, I want to bring in Terry Moran, our White House correspondent here, because Terry, that uh, that question of asking for more money to protect the national security will um, reignite this great debate as to whether the U.S. has enough money to fight this war or whether, on the other hand, it is using the money as well as it might to fight the war currently. Well, Peter, there's no question that everything has changed concerning the issue that consumed Washington just a week ago, just a couple of days ago, and that's the budget. Uh, when asked this morning whether or not this emergency request for spending authority uh, would alter the terms of the budget debate as it was. The uh, press secretary, Ari Fleischer, said this is the definition of a severe national emergency. And if you recall, that was one of the reasons the president said it would be justified to dip into that enormous Social Security surplus. So there's no question the money is there. Uh, they have used the Social Security surplus before, and uh, it looks like they'll be using it again. As I say, this is a, an issue that 48 hours ago was the issue in Washington and now seems rather trivial. Think on us, think on for a moment with us this business of an act of war. Um, neither one of us would have been surprised to see in the, in the public comments of uh, th hundreds of thousands of Americans yesterday regarded this as an act of war. It was compared to the attack on Pearl Harbor even though it was, it was different in many respects. We saw editorialists all across the country making references to this is an act of war. That means something very specific when the President of the United States says it. Oh, it sure does. It is invoking in formal terms the War Powers Act which allows him to exercise military authority and and attack sites overseas uh, with the authority of the president. It also, Peter, represents an escalation over the past 24 hours now. In the beginning of this event, they were very careful not to go to that level and saying that this was an act of war. Clearly overnight and this morning, the president and his top security officials have decided that is the appropriate word and therefore the commensurate response to it uh, will not probably be pinpoint sites against terrorists, pinpoint attacks against terrorist sites, but something more significant. Uh, one other thing I noticed in what the president said when he said that this is an enemy who hides in the shadows, that's a direct echo of what I was told he told Vice President Cheney yesterday in one of his early conversations with Vice President Cheney, and they were both reacting in horror to these events. The president said grimly, it's always the coward who attacks from the shadows. Precisely, and thank you, Terry. And I want to go to Capitol Hill to talk to our congressional correspondent, Linda Douglas, because, Terry, uh, Linda, are you there? Linda Douglas? Peter, I, can you hear me? Can I, yes, I'd like to hear, uh, we're looking at the Pentagon now. Um, uh, w when the president recalls it as an act of war, he does, as Terry correctly says, at least potentially trigger something called the War Powers Act, uh, which moves authority in quite significant ways from the Congress to the president. How will that be received there? Very well. Uh, one thing that has been very clear here today, and I've really never seen anything quite like this, is how united this 
bitterly divided partisan Congress is behind the president right now and how absolutely they share every sentiment that he just expressed. Now, they're debating right now in the Senate, Peter, a resolution, uh, part of which says that the United States is entitled by law to respond to this action. That is fraught with all kinds of possibilities and consequences. And as part of this resolution, the Congress, in a bipartisan way, has already committed to spending more money to fight terrorism. And as uh, you just uh, have seen the president say, he's sending over this emergency request for more money right now just to uh, deal with all of the, the damage in New York and in Washington. And it's being received by both parties here in Congress as what is being described to me as a blank check. Forget all this debate about money. They want to spend what it takes. So the dynamic has really changed here. One more thing. Can I hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it before you go on beyond one more thing. A, a blank check for the president in order to assist New York and what's happening at the Pentagon or a blank check to fight this war against terrorism? This is an emergency request for funds to deal with the emergency at hand. And that is in uh, with the damage in uh, New York and all of many consequences and here in Washington now we haven't seen the language of this request mm. but that's how it's been described to us but you believe that the uh, you believe that in both parties in the Congress and in both chambers in the Congress there is an inclination at the moment to give the president a blank check to change alter upgrade continue escalate the war against terrorism if it is possible to do so well, I wouldn't say that it's a blank check as far as the future of military expenditures, but they clearly are going to make a, a position today when they finish this long, long debate to commit themselves to spending much, much more money uh, to fight terrorism. Some are calling for a terrorism czar. Now, does that mean that they're going to uh, now say that the president should have his missile shield? That's not clear at all. But what is clear is that this Congress, both parties, are committed to spending much more money for the military. Okay, Linda Douglas, thank you very much on Capitol Hill. We'll be back there before the day is over. That's a very important change of tone and, and at least for this particular moment, a change of attitude uh, in, in the Congress at the moment because there's been a real fight in the Congress between Democrats and Republicans and inter those parties too on occasion about how the money at the Pentagon should be spended. The Secretary of Defense, who spent all day in the Pentagon yesterday, has said repeatedly in the last several days that the emphasis on military spending has got to change because there are, as Mr. Rumsfeld put it the last few days, uh, bases, among other things, open all over the United States which are no longer necessary. And the military does things uh, which this particular kind of contemporary 21st century warfare does not provide. Now, it's 11 o'clock Eastern time. It is 8 o'clock in the Western United States at the moment. And so we will just bring you up to date very quickly with what is happening. I would suspect that there are at least 20 to 40 people somewhere in the United States and abroad still alive right. who were involved in this. All of the previous incidents of this kind have had an infrastructure on the ground, have had people who infiltrated into the actual operations that were targeted. These people have always survived. Now, obviously, the hijackers are dead. There will also be a chain of cells or movements which may be under a group like bin Laden or associated with the government, people at intermediate levels who are probably abroad. But at some point, we are going to find, almost certainly, that some senior leader of a terrorist movement, and perhaps a government, were involved in some way. And it is at that point that the issue of using the word war becomes so sensitive. Well, let's just talk hypothetically for a moment about Mr. Bin Laden, because so much in the first 24, 25 hours of this begins to focus on his network. I take your point about, about having a, a, a chain of support both in the States and, and overseas. But what's the, what's the meaning of declaring war against bin Laden? It seems to me the United States has in some ways been at war with bin Laden and been unable, unable, been unable to destroy him for a fairly considerable amount of time. Well, in each major previous incident, where Americans have died as a result of terrorism, we had a very good idea of the government involved or the perpetrators. That was true of the Marine Corps barracks. It's true of Al Kober. It is true of Pan Am 103. When we use the war, word war this time, I think what we really mean is we have to act decisively enough to either kill bin Laden or have access to him and try him. 
That means escalating to a far more serious and persistent level of action. And it also means knowing in the process whether the leaders of a government like Afghanistan, if bin Laden is responsible, either knew this was going to happen or are going to try to protect him once bin Laden is identified as guilty. This is a very different level of action, militarily and politically, from one we have ever taken before in response to terrorism. Let me just ask you one last question, Tony, because I'll come back to you on a, uh, subsequently, of course. Uh, bin Laden, it's often pointed out, is, is not a man in and of himself who runs everything. He really is an organization, a very often disconnected cells and minor organizations, a person who has access to money and funds operations in a variety of places. This much we all know, am I correct? That's absolutely correct, Peter. And, and so if you go for Osama bin Laden, the man, and listening to him this morning himself and talking to a sympathetic Pakistani newspaper, I think he actually says, you kill, you kill Osama bin Laden, the man, and let me see if I can exactly find the quote, um, da -da -dum. Uh, these attacks, uh, that even if he was eliminated, such attacks were simply not going to stop. Peter, I think that's almost certain. The only way any hostile movement or nation can really attack the United States is through asymmetric warfare. It is through acts of terrorism, through covert operations. It is not by meeting us on direct terms. If we do find the perpetrators of who did this, and if we identify and either kill or imprison them, it doesn't mean America will be safe or this will be over. Everywhere in the world we are directly involved. We run the risk that extremists are going to follow on these attacks with other attacks. We have the whole problem of our ties to Israel in the middle of the Second Intifada. We have problems with ties to Korea, our containment of Iraq. This won't be over, regardless of how successful we are in dealing with this incident that is why we are going to have to improve our homeland defense, our response, and our retaliatory capabilities, and why Americans have to understand that, yes, this can happen again. Thank you, Tony. Tony Cordesman, who we value immensely on this particular subject, this and all subjects having to do with uh, strange um, movements in other parts of the world to which uh, a great many people don't pay nearly the attention which I think Mr. Cordesman and now the government would think uh, is required. But as the president said a while ago, this was a group which is a different enemy and attacked with no regard for human life. So let us get back to the issue of human life. ABC Cynthia McFadden, who has, is here in New York City, has been at St. Vincent's Hospital in downtown Manhattan um, for a very long period of time now. St. Vincent's, Cynthia got has been at the center of things from the very beginning. Can you bring us up to date on what's happening there at the moment? Well, Peter, the heartbreak of the story here at St. Vincent's is those empty stretchers you see because emergency personnel believe that this is a reflection of the pace and the success, or should I say the lack of success that the re rescue effort is facing. Uh, they have been, of course, on standby, expecting to re receive patients uh, all night. There have been very few uh, victims coming in here, most of them rescuers, uh, most of the uh, patients they have seen so far today minor. I can report that from Bellevue Hospital across town, another trauma center, they have received no new patients since 8.30 this morning. This is very bad news. Okay, and so people just simply there do wait. Well, they do, Peter, and of course, I've talked to the head of the, tr the trauma division here, the head of the surgery division here, and all of them say uh, if only they could put their skills to, to work, that, the, that their stress at this point, that, that is, those people who have reported here for duty, is that they seem to be able to do nothing to help. They're, they are fully staffed. Uh, 500 doctors have ro rotated through this hospital over the last 24 hours. Uh, they're ready for... They're ready for patients if, if some can be brought to them. Now, you have moved around a bit in New York City. At one point last night, you were over at, <coughs> excuse me, what's called Chelsea Piers in the west side, where they'd set up, I think, 50 temporary operating rooms. Have, are those still in Correct. existence? Has the emphasis they now are moved still to hospitals? In well, th um, they are still in existence, Peter, but as we best understand it, sources inside the rescue effort say that they are now debating the utility of that center. Uh, the original idea, as you suggest, was they were going to take all the victims there and figure out triage, send them to hospitals in the tri-state area. But at this point, there are so few people coming out 
that they're not certain that keeping a staff over there, certainly not a full staff over there, is worthwhile. Uh, I did go there earlier this morning. Uh, they're still set up and running, but how long that's going to continue, we don't know. But there certainly um, are people the, in St. Vincent's now who have already been given assistance, right? Peter, very important point. Um, about 360 plus patients have come to St. Vincent's. I can tell you that 62 of them are in critical condition today, uh, but doctors who made rounds this morning said that of those critical patients, they are stable. That does not mean that they are not critical, but they are stable. Uh, they have uh, five deaths uh, at the St. Vincent's Center, one, uh, four here and one at St. Vincent's in Staten Island. Uh, the, the death toll is, of course, low at this point, but they expect many more deaths in the course of the next 24 hours. Thanks very much, Cynthia McCudd. We need to really talk, I think, at some point uh, fairly soon to the mayor's office or some representative of the mayor because um, there's no person in New York City who has a better handle on the curve or where we are on this curve from disaster to possible rescue. There's no question about the restoration of spirit uh, in the country over a period of time. The president has spoken to it. All sorts of other national politicians have. Mayor Giuliani has spoken to the character and endurance and resilience of New Yorkers, as did the governor of New York, uh, Mr. Pataki, when he was here <coughs> last night. <coughs> but it's the mayor, excuse me, it is the mayor himself who is the only person, I think, in absolute complete touch all the time with all of the agencies which are working at this disaster slash crime zone at the moment. John McCrethy, I'm glad to say, has, uh, has managed to get back to his position at the Pentagon tonight. John, oh, oh, are you back in your Pentagon office? Yes, sir. I'm in the booth. Well, tell me what it was like to get back in the building. Uh, it is spooky. There are many chunks of the Pentagon that are cordoned off with police tape, and they are dark. Uh, there are guards at each of those uh, hallways to prevent people from going in there, either reporters or eager staff members uh, who work here in the Pentagon and who want to come back to work. Uh, what they are doing is taking many of the staff people and double and tripling them uh, into offices that are still functional. Uh, thousands of people have returned to work at the Pentagon, even though roughly half the building is cordoned off and cannot be used. Uh, Peter, we have uh, a new estimate of the number of people that are missing in the Pentagon, and it is about 200, we are told, by government officials. They don't want to be official about this because they're still trying to figure out, uh, are people traveling? Uh, have they just not been able to contact their supervisors? Uh, if that is the case, it would be uh, amazing, considering the uh, amount of damage in the Pentagon. When you say the, the estimate of missing, does this mean missing? This does not take into account that number, whatever it may be, of those who believe the Pentagon has been killed? It is uh, the number of people who um, have not been able to be found by their families, uh, who have not been able to be found by the military, or who are believed to be dead. Let me rephrase that, my, my question just so I totally understand it, because we talked last night at some length about the possibility that 800 people died in this attack on the Pentagon. That are, was... you, are you now inferring, or is the Pentagon now inferring, that the number of people who are missing and some of whom may have died is 200? The estimate uh, that was put out last night was by the Arlington County Police Chief. He said it could be as high as 800 based on his estimates of people that were in that office space. What I am telling you now, uh, and ABC News has just learned this, is that the current estimate of those dead and missing is about 200. That's what I wanted to hear you say, dead and missing, so that we could sort them out. Well, this, given as horrible as it is, given the, the attack on the Pentagon today, uh, to be perfectly honest, Jack, comes as something of a surprise, and maybe that's just because it's, we spent a lot of time talking about higher casualty it rates. Is, uh, it's extraordinary for a couple of reasons, and let me give you several possible explanations, Peter. Where the aircraft hit happened to be right down the line of where the Pentagon is being renovated, number one, on one side of the line, and right. where they were just emptying office spaces on the other side of the line. So many of those offices were in transition. It may have been a quirk of fate 
that the aircraft struck at exactly that place. That's one possible explanation. Another is the, the Pentagon has spent several million dollars over the last several years putting mylar on all the exterior windows of the Pentagon in case there were ever, was ever a bomb blast. As we look at the damage uh, uh, in the area of the blast, you can clearly see that many windows are blown out, but they are blown out as a single piece of, of shredded glass that is stuck uh, together with this mylar substance. That may have ended up saving many lives. Well, thank you, John. Jack McCrethy at the Pentagon, and, and we'll come back to you uh, on a fairly regular basis. But that, it's impossible to say that the news of 200 people dead or missing is good news. But the change in the number from the anticipated 800 and perhaps more to 200 dead and missing, what does one call it, a relief? Um, there's no particular adjective for it, but the estimate from the Pentagon has changed. And the original estimate, as, as John McCrethy points out, did not come from the Pentagon itself. They were very cautious all day long, as have been the authorities in New York City. It came from the, uh, I believe it was the acting, it came from the Arlington County Fire Department uh, outside the Pentagon. Uh, based on what they were seeing from there, and they thought 800 people, perhaps more, and that is what it is from the Pentagon this morning. The Pentagon believes that 200 people are dead or missing or unaccounted for, and it may be, as McCrethy emphasizes, that they just simply are traveling somewhere else and have not been in touch with their supervisors. Now, a little earlier today, because our coverage, of course, has been continuous and ran all through Good Morning America this morning, uh, Diane Sawyer had a chance to talk with Colin Powell, the Secretary of State, who was in uh, Colombia uh, as this was all happening and uh, returned home from Colombia yesterday to be uh, at the State Department early this morning and to make himself available to talk to us for a brief while. Here's an excerpt from that. American people uh, have a clear understanding that this is a war. That's the way they see it. You can't see it any other way, whether legally that is correct or not. You do too? And we've, yes, I do. And we've got to respond as if it is a war. And we've got to respond uh, in the sense that it isn't going to be solved with a single counterattack against one individual. It's going to be a long-term conflict, and it's going to be fought on many fronts, the military front, the intelligence front, the law enforcement front, the diplomatic front. And it's a war not just against the United States, it's a war against civilization. It's a war against all nations that believe in democracy. But democracy can't be defeated. But now it's going to require all nations who believe in democracy to come out and condemn this kind of activity, to work together to go after those who perpetrate such activity. And it requires that kind of coordinated, complete response on behalf of the civilized communities of the world. Secretary of State Colin Powell, who came back to Washington yesterday talking to Diane Sawyer in Good Morning America this morning and to... Uh, uh, to, through him and through the State Department today will come all of these, not only the messages of sympathy which have come from nations um, in, every, in, in every part of the world. It is, as we've said before, quite stunning to see how engaged much of the rest of the world is in terms of its connection uh, with the United States. And there's a very rare television address, for example, in Taiwan uh, today where the Taiwanese president uh, offering deep sympathy for the United States, believe there might be a connection to attack there and ask people there to stay calm, saying the island uh, of Taiwan must stick together when facing a changing international situation. Um, once there had been an attack here, there were fears in Malaysia, uh, which is the largest Muslim nation in the world, and there was a bomb threat in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, thousands of people were evacuated from the world's tallest buildings there, the Petronas Twin Towers in Kuala Lumpur. Um, second threat cleared uh, buildings and offices at the IBM offices there in the British Standard Chartered Bank in Malaysia's biggest city. Um, in Japan, the, the uh, Japanese Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Kozumi, went on television to, to calm, or as he put it, to try to calm his country down and to ask them, in his words, to exercise the utmost vigilance. And we saw several times in the last 24 hours the British Prime Minister Tony Blair um, either leading or speaking uh, to his security and government officials and at one point closing down all the airspace over London and speaking very, uh, very um, uh, eloquently at one point about uh, how people in Britain felt about this attack on the United States. And as I said a little while ago, the European Union has called for a, um, a day, a European-wide day of mourning on Friday. 
<laughs> the European Central Bank, by the way, has, as you've said many times, has had quite an effect on the international monetary markets. The, the last time we looked, uh, Britain's uh, uh, Financial Times index was up. Uh, the Germany, uh, in, the German index was down. Um, the, the French index was up. And, and markets in Taiwan, Malaysia, Thailand, and among other places, Turkey and Cyprus, did not open today. And as you know, the markets are not open here in the New York. The New York Stock Exchange, the American Stock Exchange, are fairly close um, to uh, the Twin Trade Towers. And, and they are going to stay closed uh, throughout the day, to the best of our knowledge. They have not made a decision as exactly when they are going to open. And, and, and while we're talking about money, Here's one of those wonderful little human stories, of which there are hundreds and thousands and we reach out and try to get them. There's a guy named Louis Feniger, <coughs> uh, who today asked forgiveness and offered refunds to his customers um, after briefly raising gasoline prices to five bucks a gallon at his small station in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Um, we were in a panic, he said, and rumors were flying all over TV, and our suppliers called and said they were unsure when they could get us gasoline. <coughs> and then, I beg your pardon. It's four to five dollars a gallon, he jacked off his prices. Uh, that's his story. And, and as you know from yesterday, prices spiked uh, briefly, and there was the tendency to think that people were taking advantage in a short period of time. And a couple of the big companies, uh, ExxonMobil and BP, for example, came out very quickly and said there'd be no supply problem. Here's a wonderful story of a man, Louis Feninger, in Oklahoma City, asking forgiveness from his customers and offering refunds because he briefly raised the price of gasoline yesterday. Well, this is just simply a scale of the world's tallest buildings. The World Trade Center built in the 1960s is, was actually one of the simplest and one of the stablest. And in the wake of what happened yesterday, but long before that, there's been something of a, a competition to build a huge, eccentric, far more daring towers than the simple, structurally um, very sound. Remember, it was the heat which destroyed the structure yesterday at the World Trade Center. They actually withstood uh, the attack when those huge airplanes built into them. But the Jin Mao building in Shanghai, I have been to the top, it's an extraordinarily eerie experience. And the Petronas Towers in Kuala Lumpur, um, and not to mention the Canadian National Tower in Toronto and the Sears Tower in Chicago, are these expressions of pride in many ways uh, by their cities or their countries or their owners. Uh, and, but they are, of course, sticking there. In, in this particular war that the United States is involved in with terrorists as advertisements of what America stands for. And so long before the attack occurred yesterday, um, it was indeed believed that they were vulnerable. And they were attacked, of course, in 1993, and a 1,000 people were injured uh, at the time. So I want to listen briefly. I've been saying here we'd like to be in touch with Mayor Giuliani. Um, We've caught him on the run earlier this morning, and he'll give you, in a, in a piece of sound here, I think some sense of where he thinks things are at at the moment. The best estimate that we can make, relying on the Port Authority and just every, everyone else that has experience with this, is that there'll be a, f a few thousand people left in each building. Mr. Mayor, you talked about... And then the our, our, our recovery relief efforts and our work with the medical examiner are premised on those kinds of numbers. Well, 1,000 people in each building um, is the mayor's estimate at the moment. I don't know if we, can, uh, if we can take a picture of either the House of Representatives or the Senate at the moment. We cannot, but <clears throat> they have already this morning introduced a joint resolution in the House and the Senate condemning these terrorist attacks at the World Trade Center at, at the Pentagon. And they have resolved, this is the kind of language that the country, I think, will expect at the moment and, and, and sympathize with. Uh, they have condemned, obviously, in, in the strongest possible terms. Uh, the House and the Senate have extended their deepest condolences to the victims uh, of what they describe as heinous and cowardly acts, as well as to the families, friends, and loved ones. And that's an awful lot of people in the country. Uh, the House and the Senate are certain the people of the U.S. will stand united as it begins 
as the country begins the process of rebuilding in the aftermath of this, condemns, as I think everybody in the country does, the heroic acts. People throw the words heroic around quite a lot, but the heroic acts of the fire departments and the police departments and the other rescue uh, workers who've been at this for more than 25 hours now. And it declares that these premeditated attacks struck not only at the people of the United States, but as we've just been talking about the World Trade Center, the symbols and structures, and thank those foreign leaders and individuals who have expressed solidarity, committed to support increased resources in the war to eradicate terrorism, and supported the determination of the president. As Linda Douglas said a short while ago from Capitol Hill, there is very, very strong support in both parties at the moment, in public, certainly, in both houses, um, for what the president has said so far. Let's go to the Senate floor for just a minute and get, pick up some sense of, of sentiment there. In a wide-ranging investigation to find those who committed these barbarous acts. Around this city and around New York, dedicated public servants are back at their desks in federal office buildings doing the people's business. Not change with respect to our freedom and our democracy. But there's certain things that must change. There's certain things that must change. I think the senator from Delaware hit the hit nail on the head when he talked that our actions toward terrorists must change. What happened yesterday was not a hijacking of a domestic airline's flight. What happened yesterday was an enemy missile loaded with explosives, 11,000 gallons of jet fuel that exploded like a missile in to targets here in the United States of America. It was an act of war. It was an enemy missile that was directed at our country. And we, we must respond accordingly to this act of war by those who perpetrated it. We are at war. We are at war with terrorists and to those nations who harbor them, who finance them, and who are in any way encourage and support them. I think it's important that we say so here in the United States Senate at some point, that this is war with the forces of evil that have attacked this country. This is not, and I can't stress this more strongly than I hope I will, this is not a time to bring people to justice. It is a time to wage war and win a war against those who committed this act, those who harbor those who committed this act, and those who support and encourage those who committed this act. Here in the United States Senate, there are things that we can do, sensible things that we can do to support our president and to support the American people. First, as I mentioned before, we can support them right now with the resources they need to fight and try to find survivors and repair the damage that was caused here in this country. Second, we need to bring up the defense authorization bill right now, the United States Senate, and the defense appropriation bill right now. We need to make sure that we have the necessary tools in place to be able to defend our country. We need to look at the intelligence and counterintelligence operations of this country and determine soon whether we should enhance that capability. It is obviously insufficient. And we here in the United States Senate must do something about it, and we must do something about it now. It's important for us to come together at a time of national crisis and emergency when our country is threatened to pass the necessary tools for our government to fight the war that it will be engaged in in the coming weeks, months, and maybe longer. Senator Santorum, the uh, Republican senator from Pennsylvania. It was in Pennsylvania, of course, that one of these uh, one of these slates had been taken over by hijackers, by the terrorists. United Flight 93 actually went down and crashed. And, and you hear there from from a senator from each party, Senator Biden and Senator Santorum, what we surmise is a clearly representative thinking of the almost unanimous feeling of both parties at the moment. Now, there's going to be some reconsideration 
of this as time goes on. Senator Santorum very much, I think, reflecting some of the public mood at the moment. He said this is a time of, to wage war, not a time to bring people to justice. Well, if you just take that one phrase uh, out of context, which we don't necessarily, which we shouldn't necessarily do, uh, this is an issue of uh, American ideals, uh, the American ideas of justice and the American ideas of dealing with people who attack the United States. The principal aim of this country has always been to bring people to justice. But the mood uh, in the capital today is clearly much, much more militant than it has ever been. And when you hear people asking for increased resources in the immediate sense to help New York and to help what's uh, those people who've been involved in what's happened at the Pentagon, uh, that's one thing. Then you hear these other requests to have more money made available uh, to fight the war against terrorism. The United States already spends about $10 billion a year in one way or another through a variety of government agencies uh, in the war against terrorism. But there's clearly been a huge intelligence failure. Uh, and everybody in the country knows this as a result of being able to see directly in front of us for much of the time yesterday what happened. Clearly a huge intelligence failure, which will be the subject for the most intense examination uh, by the political establishment, not to mention all the frustration it's caused for millions of Americans and for that matter for millions of people in other parts of the world. I want to stay connected to other parts of the world even as we watch. I mean, why are these trucks lined up? They are lined up at the lower end of New York City's island of Manhattan now to begin to take away the rubble. You cannot dig down from uh, through all of the rubble that these 110 story trade towers represent. You cannot dig down in many cases and and look for people who may have survived uh, this tumultuous experience, to put it, to, to put it mildly, um, until you get some of the rubble removed from the area. But as that continues, with hundreds of people just in many cases stand, this is so reminiscent of what has happened in other disasters made, uh, created by nature. And this is a reminder to, to many of us who've covered earthquakes before people stand around, and there are often calls for, give us silence for a moment so we can listen to see whether anything can be heard. These dog teams, the government has sent uh, emergency dog teams uh, both to the Pentagon and to New York City uh, because they are so instrumental in trying to find people who are buried in rubble. And even after all these many hours, it's hard to get the parameters of the disaster scene, the crime scene, actually straight in your mind at the moment, but there are hundreds, probably thousands of people, thousands of people without any, without any doubt, now involved in the paramount issue of the moment, which is to see if there are people inside who survive. We reported last night, I'm sure you heard in, in any number of places last night, that the, that the cell phone has made a difference. It made it, the cell phone and the air phone made a difference for people who were on the aircraft. We talked to a woman yesterday, somewhat to our surprise, who'd managed to be in touch with her son, who was on United Flight 93 uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, the stewardess on one of the flights, I think it was American Flight 11, uh, hijacked from Boston to Los Angeles, who was able to tell American Airlines headquarters what were happening. And in the rubble, there are people who have managed to call and help rescuers identify where they are. There was a woman or a man, I've forgotten precisely which last night, who managed to call 911 in Pennsylvania and to identify uh, four rescuers that he, along with a couple of policemen, was in a particular location. Now, a couple of policemen were brought out of the rubble tonight, and some people, as Mayor Giuliani said earlier to us today, have actually been rescued today, and it may be that that was the case in which somebody was able to be located because of the use of the cell phone. But this is a huge, huge area now of, of the heaviest possible equipment to deal with the heaviest possible um, uh, rubble which a collapsed building represents. But just look at the policemen and the firemen just standing there, so many of them in shock because, this is only moments ago, because 200 members of the New York fire department have lost their lives in this rescue mission. And we have volunteer fire departments in, in much of America, so I think in small and large communities we all appreciate how tight-knit 
the firefighting community is. And in these situations, there never seems to be any thought in their minds about what they're going to do. They've got to go in because that's what they're trained to do. And, but it is an extraordinarily tight-knit community. And so the pain that is felt in the, in the New York Fire Department, and this will be true of, clearly true of the community in the Pentagon today and yesterday as well, uh, is profound in such a way. I think that a great many of us in the country simply cannot imagine what it is like. It will be a long, long time before their lives uh, stabilize. And if you go to fire departments all over the country, there's a wall of honor in fire departments everywhere. There's always a wall of honor in a fire department uh, on which are put the pictures and the names of men who have given their lives in other circumstances in service of their community. But we're also trying to get a country back together again emotionally in terms of its transportation in terms of its general economics abc's betsy stark uh, has been with us here on on several occasions to try to take various measurements to see how the country is doing at the moment let me just ask you several pointed questions betsy stark about where we are today the, the insurance industry this morning is saying this could be the largest man-made disaster in probably the largest a single disaster ever with a price tag of ten billion dollars at the moment post catastrophe estimates are always a bit unreliable i know but when you check with that industry today what are they telling you well i mean as you say peter there's uh, there's there's nothing else uh, no other catastrophe that compares no other uh, even natural disasters uh, that I'm aware of that compare in, in scope to uh, the size of claims that can be expected. And, uh, you know, this is the sort of thing the insurance industry prepares for in the sense that uh, the insurance industry takes out insurance. There are reinsurance companies uh, that will be paying out e enormous uh, claims uh, in order to cover the size of, uh, of, of the damage done. And uh, we won't really know uh, what accurate figures are about that damage for a while. Now, you, I know you've been talking to the New York and the American Stock Exchanges. Other exchanges are open around the world, and perhaps you can bring us up to date on some of the numbers of what they're doing. But more importantly, what the effect this has had on international financial markets. Well, it's very interesting, Peter, to see what's happening in global markets today. Uh, uh, last night, uh, Asia had its first opportunity to react to the events, and the reaction in the markets was very emotional. It was a negative reaction. There were sharp sell-offs. Uh, we, on the Japan Nikkei, uh, Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index, Singapore's index down between 5 and 10 percent, similar to what we saw yesterday in Europe and Latin America. You would expect this kind of emotional reaction to this sort of thing. So, uh, but the good news is stabilizing in Europe today. Okay, thanks very much, Betsy. We're going to interrupt you and come back to this because we're going to go to Logan Airport uh, in Boston, um, where we are still somewhat troubled by the notion of the head of security up there who said they had the, among the best security in the country. But we're going to have a news conference from the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office. They'll identify themselves. As soon as you receive notice of the hijacking, this is a joint command post with State Department, ATF, Customs, the Massachusetts State Police, OSI, Boston Police Department, Department of Transportation, U.S. Secret Service, and the U.S. Marshals represented. We are also involved in mass ports command posts at Logan Airport. We'll continue to man these command posts and continue our joint investigations around the clock until all investigations have been completed. We are coordinating our investigation with FBI headquarters and with other federal agencies. A website and a toll-free tip line has been established. For this case, we're using the Internet Fraud Complaint Center website, which is www dot ifccfbi dot gov because it's an existing site designed to receive information from the public. The toll-free number is 1-866-483-5137 and we've had these two these two lines up for the last day and we have been getting some good information and some good tips. At this time the White House is coordinating all public information at the national level. 
As this is an ongoing case, I'll not be discussing the case or taking any questions, but I can assure you that absolutely everything will be done to identify and bring the perpetrators to justice. Thank you. Sorry, you we, we have one more speaker, question. Massachusetts U.S. Attorney Jim Farmer. Farmer is the U.S. Attorney in Massachusetts. Thank you, Director Buckingham. I'm really here to second the comments of Mr. Prouty. Uh, I'm here first to doubly ensure the public that the prosecutive resources of the Department of Justice and specifically the United States Attorney in Mass uh, Office in Massachusetts are working round the clock in the closest possible coordination with all federal, state, and local in law enforcement investigative agencies. I will be making no statement and taking no questions as well. It is and will be remaining our highest priority to conduct a successful criminal investigation of these critical events. Um, I would ask your indulgence and your understanding that at this time we are simply unable to make any further comment. Well, to be perfectly frank, there isn't there much. Other questions not pertaining no. to the investigation. I'd like to ask the, the officials from Massport if you can explain how uh, the suspected terrorists had badge, had runway ramp uniforms and badges on their possession. Again, I think that's uh, something we would defer to the investigating authorities, and you've heard their comment relative to anything regarding this investigation. We just simply cannot get into those questions. And airplane security, if in fact suspected terrorists were able to buy one way tickets with cash only arriving late and fitting a Mid Eastern description without raising any flags or concerns from airport personnel, airline personnel, or anyone else associated with Massport. Again, this is uh, an ongoing investigation, and that question pertains directly to that investigation. Mm -hmm. That in fact, for the individuals bought one-way tickets, paid with cash, going to the West Coast, were described as Mid-Eastern and arrived late, therefore fitting n numerous profiles of suspected terrorists or drug runners. I cannot confirm that. I'm not altogether certain how much we're going to get out of this uh, this uh, news conference uh, of the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office, and I don't want to just. Uh, automatically cut it off. I think it's pretty clear there from both the FBI and the and the U.S. Attorney in Massachusetts. They don't want to answer any questions pertaining to the investigation. And that is, of course, perfectly understandable from their point of view because they're not altogether certain at this point how far they've got in their investigation. And we have been talking to the various uh, law enforcement agencies, not only there, but in Miami, Washington, New York, everywhere and I think I'll ask John Miller to come back and join me for a little while again but let me just try to reset for you a little bit in terms of where we think we are in the investigation we we have learned ABC News has learned that at least two of the hijackers who were on the immigration naturalization service watch list this is a list posted at airports um, anywhere there's an INS uh, entry port uh, and it's unclear whether these two of these characters were in the United States illegally or whether they had actually entered before their names were placed on the watch list. But there is clearly a group of individuals, um, both in, in, in several parts or at least two parts of the United States today, in whom the FBI and other agencies are deeply interested. Two FBI agents, for example, have gone um, to a house in Venice, Florida, which they believe to be the home of a man named Muhammad Atta. It's impossible to identify a country from a name like that. Uh, Muhammad Atta uh, could be a man from any number of countries, but is this a suspect uh, that we have been sort of watching throughout the night? And they have executed a search warrant for him. Uh, the FBI also went to a second address in Coral Springs in Florida, believing this was the address on uh, of this man named Muhammad Atta's license. Um, there, there's a, there's a, a lot of information out of the 
Miami office of the FBI that just suggests that place has been brewing with activity um, since last night. Uh, the number one and the number two in the FBI command there met throughout the night. Uh, task force uh, was put together very quickly in Miami, uh, which involved not only the FBI and the local police and, and the state police, but uh, various members of the Immigration and Naturalization Service. And in Boston, even though the FBI and the Attorney General up there are, are reluctant to talk about this, again, for understandable reasons from their point of view, we believe that the Boston FBI agents are investigating five men to believe to be hijackers killed in the explosion, and we will come back and try to follow that in a moment. But the mayor of New York, Rudolph Giuliani, is about to give his first uh, news conference of the day. And, you know, our firefighters and police officers are going to get pretty exhausted after a period of time. So the, um, the outpouring of volunteers has been tremendous, and we're very, very thankful for that. And the city, the people of the city, their spirit is tremendous. And I, t I, I said that yesterday, and I'll say it again. This city is the greatest city in the world. It has the greatest people, and a bunch of cowardly terrorists can't make us fearful. We're stronger than they are. We're better than they are. And people of the city proved it yesterday. They're going to prove it today. And they're going to be a great example of what Americans are like. Thank you. Thank well, you. I'm not sure how much information we got out of the mayor. I think yes. we may have joined him in progress there. And we'll check to somebody who's listening closely. But there's a tremendous uh, uh, symbolism yeah. there for, we're, we're from the mayor. We're going to continue with our briefing. Yeah, we'll, we'll listen to this briefing and see what else we know. With tremendous symbolism for the mayor Again, there, wearing Ask, his hat from the New York Police Department and his shirt from the Fire uh, Department of New York. The mayor of New York, Giuliani, has uh, always identified very strongly with the police in this city and the Fire Department as well. He has been criticized by many segments of the community in the city because, uh, when the police have, have been involved in actions which have deemed to be illegal or many, many angered communities, very often minority communities in some ways. But there is no question right that at a moment like this, uh, uh, the mayor and wishes and to be seen, as do, uh, right as do New Yorkers in general, I think, in with the efforts in the last 25 hours of the police department and the fire department. And there is the Pentagon again. I, I want to go back to Betsy Stark, if I'm, I beg your pardon. First of all, um, we have on the phone Joyce Carnes. Are you there, Ms. Yes, Carnes? I am. Can I just ask, first of all, where you are? I'm in Munhall, Pennsylvania. You're in Pennsylvania, in Munhall, Pennsylvania. Near and, Pittsburgh. And I know where Munhall is, yes. In fact, you've, you've been in the news even before yesterday. Now, you've You've been talking, I gather, to your brother, who is in the rubble um, of the Trade Towers, but he's a rescue worker and he's not trapped. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, would you tell us, nonetheless, not nonetheless, would you tell us what you and he have been talking about? Um, well, he was in the Marine Corps for about 18 years, and, and he was at work in Wilton, Connecticut, and he felt a need to go do something and help somebody. and. Um, I received a phone call at 7.49 last night. He, would, he told me he was in the rubble and it, he had found two of the Port Authority officers and that um, they were trapped 40 feet down and he needed some help. He couldn't see anybody to help him get them out. He gave me some directions and um, told me to call the NYPD rescue because he couldn't get through on the phone line. And I called 911 from Pittsburgh, and um, Allegheny County ended up faxing NYPD and a lot of other people um, the information, and they got back to me and got the directions of how to find him and these two um, Port Authority people. And do you know what happened? Um, actually, these two gentlemen, a Sergeant McLaughlin and a, a Gemetto, they were in the lobby of the World Trade Center when it collapsed. And um, they evidently were um, under a lot of rubble in an air pocket. And um, my brother and a uh, former Sergeant Thomas went in and um, found who was alive, if there was any, anyone alive, and tried to send for rescue. 
Well, I'd just like, if I may, to try to follow the sequence of event here. Your brother called you from the rubble because he was with two Port Authority workers who were 40 feet down in the rubble, and he couldn't attract the attention of anybody above him to help him. So he called you. You tried to get in touch with the New York Police Department. Have you had any idea what ultimately happened? Actually, um, I called 911, and Allegheny County got in touch with the police department through fax. And then um, I talked to them, and um, a half hour after that, I, a fire worker called me to verify the direction of where to locate them. And do you believe they were thus rescued? Yes, they were rescued. Oh, that's terrific news. And how's your brother? He's doing good. I last heard from him at 9.30, and he was going back in. And is he currently a policeman or a firefighter or a rescue worker as a professional? No, he um, is a CPA for Duluth and Zetus. Oh, for goodness sakes. And, but he was in the military, the Marine Corps, for 18 years, and he is an ex-police officer from Whitaker in Tampa Bay, Florida. You must be very proud of him at the moment. Yes, I am. Well, thank you, Ms. Carnes. I really appreciate you calling and sharing that story with us. Thank uh, you. It, was just, it just happens to come, that call, as we were talking about um, the connections that people have made in terms of this connection. And, and as we just look at this, there's just one other thing. We have not resolved an answer to this, but, but uh, Jackie Judd, our correspondent um, in Washington, has sent me an email just a short while ago, and she really speaks to what's been puzzling enormous numbers of us. We see all of this video and these live pictures of where the towers used to stand, but the question is, where is all the rubble? It seems so flattened. How could so much steel and concrete just vaporize? Did it all turn to dust? It's one of the questions we will try to answer in the next little while. And we'll be back to continue ABC's news coverage of these crimes in just a moment.